Okay, good morning and welcome to the 11 a.m. portion of our closed session of the City Council. Um, if there are members of the public who would like to comment on items on closed session, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. In this part of the meeting, the Council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the public line will be closed and inaccessible. Uh, please mute your television or streaming device once you've called in and listen through your, your phone. Please also know that there's a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely today, and I want to thank the public for staying at home to view today's council meeting. With that, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Byers? Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Golder? Here. Watkins? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings? Here. With that, um, are there any members of the public who would like to comment on items on our closed session? Now is the time to call in using the number on your screen. Once you've called in, you'll want to press star 9 on your phone to raise your hand. And once you've been asked to unmute, you will be given two minutes to comment on this item. No members of the public who are calling in on this item. I'm going to now close the webinar to the public, and I'd like to ask if there are staff members who are not um, calling in or participating in closed session that you call back in um, in the next 15 minutes or so when we should be done with uh, closed session. Okay, I think we're good to go. <laughs> Matthews and Vice Mayor Myers joins us. We'll go ahead and get started. And we've got a couple um, items prior to our presentations. here so um, before we begin our regular council meeting we need to have the annual meeting of the board of directors of the industrial development authority IDA and the Santa Cruz public investment oh sorry Santa Cruz public improvement financing corporation city council members serve as board members on these boards which were created for the purposes of providing the city an instrument to issue bonds annually while the bonds are in existence the board members are legally required to hold a meeting of the IDA and the SCPIFC. These meetings are procedural and for the purposes of approving minutes and electing new board members. And so with that, we will um, go ahead and call the first, call the meeting of October 13, 2020, the Board of Directors of the Industrial Development Authority to order. And I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Directors Byers? Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Golder? Here. Watkins? Here. Vice Chair Myers? Here. And Chair Cummings? Here. Before we get started, um, for those people who are receiving proclamations, we're going to, we have a couple minutes and a couple items to take care of before that. So. Um, we'll call you on uh, right before we have those presentations. Okay, so the first item of business is a motion to elect new officers as set forth in Section 3.02 of the Industrial Development Authority bylaws as follows. The Executive Director uh, will be the City Manager, Martine Bernal. Chief Finance Officer will be Director of Finance, uh, Kim Krause. President, Mayor Cummings. Vice President, 
Vice Mayor Myers and Secretary or Treasurer, City Clerk Administration, Administrator Bonnie Bush. And uh, with that, I'm looking for a motion um, for to elect the new officers. Councilmember Matthews. All eyes are upon me. I move the recommended motion. <laughs> so I have a motion made by Councilmember Matthews. Councilmember Golder. I second. Okay. So we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Golder. If there's no further comments, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll vote. Thank you, Mayor. Director Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Director Golder? Oh, sorry, it says my internet's unstable. All my kids are in school. Um, um, uh, was it a, a yes? Is there an I or a here? I'm sorry, I felt like a crazy person. I couldn't hear what you were asking me even. <laughs> For the election of the officer, so. Oh, it's I. I. <laughs> uh, Watkins? I. Vice Chair Myers? I. And Chair Cummings? I. The passage unanimously. So the second item of business um, on our agenda today is the mi the minutes of the October 8, 2019 Industrial Development Authority. And so we're looking for a motion to approve the minutes as submitted. Council Member Matthews. Move the, the recommendation, approval of the minutes. Uh, Council Member Golder. Uh, second. Okay. So we have a motion made by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Golder to approve the minutes as submitted. I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll vote on this item. Director Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Chair Myers? Aye. And Chair Cummings. Aye. So that passes unanimously. Okay, that is the last item of business um, for that meeting. So we'll go ahead and adjourn that meeting and we'll move on to our next meeting before our general session, which is the annual meeting of the Board of Directors of the Santa Cruz Public Improvement Financing Corporation. Uh, I'd like to ask the clerk to um, please. Uh, call the roll vote for our October 13th, 2020 annual meeting with the Board of Directors of the Santa Cruz Public Improvement and Financing Corporation. Director Byers? Director Byers? Aye. Oh. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice President Myers? I got her. Oh, Vice President Myers, aye. Aye. <laughs> and President Cummings? Here. So the first item of business for this meeting is um, we need a motion to the election of officers. Uh, the motion would be to elect new officers as set forth in section 3.02 of the Santa Cruz Public Improvement Financing Corporation bylaws as follows. The Executive Director will be City Manager Bernal, Chief Financial Officer, Director of Finance Kraus, President will be Mayor Cummings, Vice President, Vice Mayor Myers, Secretary Treasurer will be City Clerk Administrator Bush. So now I'm looking for a motion um, to elect the new officers. Councilmember Matthews. So moved. I'll second it again. Okay, <laughs> so we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Golder. I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll vote on this item. Director Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice President Myers? Aye. And President Cummings. Aye. So that passes unanimously. Um, with that, the next order 
Item of business is the minutes of the October 8th, 2019 Santa Cruz Public Improvement Finance Corporation. Um, and I also realize I need to open this up to public comment. So if there's any members of the public who would like to comment on the minutes from the October 8th, 2019 Santa Cruz Public Improvement Finance Corporation meeting, now is the time to call in. You'll need to press star nine on your phone if you'd like to speak to us on this item, and you will be given two minutes to speak. Seeing no members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, I'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. And so I'm looking now for a motion on the on item number four, which is the minutes of the October 8, 2019 Santa Cruz Public Improvement Finance Corporation. Council Member Brown. I'll move approval of the minutes. Okay. Council Member Golder. Second. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Brown, second by Councilmember Golder to move the minutes of the October 8th, 2019 meeting. And so I'd like to ask the clerk to call the roll vote on this item. Director Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice President Myers? Aye. And President Cummings. Aye. So that passes unanimously. And with that, um, that concludes the meeting of the Board of Directors of the Santa Cruz Public Improvement Finance Corporation. Thank you all for joining us for those me that meeting. And with that, we will move on to our, to begin our regular business. And so I'd like to Start by saying good morning and welcome to our 11.40 a.m. session of the October 13th, 2020 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I have a few announcements and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Tele Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely and I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, Please call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you've called in and listen through the phone. Please note that there's a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen to, through your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it's time for public comment, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it's your time to speak during public comment, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes, and you may hang up once you've commented on your item of interest. With that, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Here. Here. Brown? Here. Here. Boulder? Here. Um, Watkins? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings. Here. I'd like to acknowledge that the land upon which we gather is the unceded territory of the Owasso speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamutsan tribal band comprises the descendants of the indigenous people taken to Mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast, is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. So, the first item on our agenda, we have three. Um, proclamations and then I have one announcement and I'd like to start with the first uh, proclamation which is declaring the week of October 3rd 2020 as water professional appreciation week and so I'd like to invite um, our water director and I think we have one of our um, commissioners on as well and so if our commissioner could join us um, that would be great um, but what I'll do is I'll start by reading a few of the um, whereas is and then I'll turn it over to our commissioner and our water director for further comment so whereas the City of Santa Cruz Water Department relies on surface water from the North Coast and the San Lorenzo watershed for 95% of the water supply for nearly 100,000 residents of the city, Live Oak, and other adjacent unincorporated areas, and whereas on August 16, 2020, a spectacular dry lightning storm ignited a series of wildfires in Northern California, in Northern Santa Cruz County, known as the CZU Lightning Fire Complex, 
And whereas the CZU Lightning Complex grew rapidly and threatened key water infrastructure along the North Coast and in the San Lorenzo watershed, and whereas many City of Santa Cruz Water Department staff members were directly impacted by the CZU Lightning Complex fire through evacuations and the loss of their homes, and whereas the City of Santa Cruz Water Department staff worked nonstop to get ready for the worst, working 24-7 to create defensible space around key facilities that would help firefighters protect them in the event that the fire reached them, as well as plan for potential catastrophe should the fire hit one or more key transmission and or treatment facilities. And whereas the City of Santa Cruz Water Department staff tireless work will continue as they plan and prepare for, an, for anticipated future fires and their ongoing impacts to water supply and water quality. And whereas during the week of October 3rd, to 11, 2020, we celebrate Water Professionals Appreciation Week to recognize the essential roles of water professionals and water providers in their critical work. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim October 3rd to 11, 2020 as Water Professionals Appreciation Week in the City of Santa Cruz and encourage all citizens to join me in expressing heartfelt appreciation for their ongoing dedication to providing safe drinking water and for their valiant efforts protecting the key water infrastructure for the city of Santa Cruz and neighboring areas in the face of extraordinary circumstances. And I would like to just say in addition to that, I know that the water department and all of our water department staff are gonna be working very diligently this summer as we um, you know, continue to be faced with uh, threats from debris flows. And so I just wanna thank everyone for all the hard work they do to ensure that we have safe drinking water. With that, I'll turn it over to our water director in case you have any comments. And I know, again, that uh, one of our commissioners was on as well. And so if one of our commissioners would like to make comments as well, that would be an appropriate time. Go ahead, Doug. Thank you, Rosemary. Uh, thank you, Mayor Cummings, Vice Mayor Myers, uh, members of council and staff. And I, uh, on behalf of the Water Commission, I deeply appreciate the recognition and celebration of the extraordinary work of um, uh, Rosemary and her team. Uh, it was only two months ago, although it seems like yesterday with the 2020 time dilation effect that these fires took place and we had plenty of things to worry about during that time, but in the face of evacuations, um, loss of homes and property and the ongoing C-19 provisions, uh, staff, as you pointed out, worked tirelessly to protect our existing infrastructure uh, protect the safe operation of our existing systems and now pivot to uh, ongoing um, planning and preparations to try to mitigate or prevent uh, future impacts on our water system. You know, all of this to ensure a sufficient, clean and healthful water supply for, for all of us in town and all the other customers of the water system this year in a particular we're thirsty for things to celebrate it's refreshing to have something like this to be able to celebrate and i again on behalf of the commission would like to uh, applaud rosemary and her team for their outstanding work uh mayor and council thank you so much um i have a i'm blessed here with having a really great team and also a really great water commission and council and colleagues that the department had to work with. Um, we have had a lot of challenges this year. Um, I think our staff has demonstrated over and over again in the time I've been here, almost seven years, that they can rise to these challenges. And I just wish that it wouldn't be like coming one after another because it's pretty taxing. But um, I think it's, we're very lucky to have a great team and they work hard and we thank you so much for the appreciation that you've expressed here today. Thank you again for all your hard work and please continue to let us know how we can help support your efforts to ensure that we have clean drinking water for our residents. Thank you, will do. Thank you. Okay, the, um, moving on to our next proclamation. Um, this proclamation is to honor uh, October 12th as Indigenous Peoples Day in the city of Santa Cruz. And I wanted to invite uh, Valentin Lopez, chairman of the Amamutsun Tribal Band, to accept this proclamation and to also give Val an opportunity to speak to council today. And so, and I think that as many of you are aware, there's an item on our agenda today that um, is also um, kind of honoring the work that we've been doing with the Amamutsun Tribal Band and other members of our community to um, help 
reshape and, and reframe the story of our mission and will be, and also um, it is looking towards removing mission bells within the city of Santa Cruz, and so we'll be voting on that later. But, but before that, I'd like to read a proclamation. Um, and I'll start by saying, whereas Indigenous Peoples Day was first proposed in 1977 by a delegation of Native Nations to the United Nations sponsored International Conference on Discrimination Against Indigenous Population in the Americas, and whereas the City of Santa Cruz adopted Resolution Number NS21854 on September 27, 1994, proclaiming October 12th to be Indigenous Peoples Day rather than Columbus Day, becoming the third city in the United States to do so, and whereas on October 25th, 2011, the City of Santa Cruz adopted resolution number 28421 supporting the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and affirming the inherent rights of all Indigenous people to the dignity and diversity of their cultures, traditions, and histories and aspirations. And whereas the city of Santa Cruz acknowledges that it's built upon the homelands and villages of the Owasso-speaking Indigenous people of this region, and that the city as we know it would not exist were it not for Indigenous stewardship of these lands for millennia, and the unfree labor of indigenous people who built Mission Santa Cruz and other foundational infrastructures of the city. And whereas the city of Santa Cruz values the many contributions made to our community through indigenous people's traditional ecological knowledge, labor, spirituality, technology, science, philosophy, and arts, and the deep cultural contribution that substantially shaped the character of the city. And whereas on May 9th, 2017, the City of Santa Cruz adopted Resolution Number NS29237, recognizing the Amamutsin Tribal Band as an historic, continuous tribe of the region with ancestral ties to Mission Santa Cruz. And whereas on September 25th, 2020, California Governor Gavin Newsom signed a Native American ancestral lands policy calling for new partnerships with California tribes to facilitate tribal access, use, and commandment of natural lands and collaboration with tribes that are interested in acquiring their ancestral lands. Whereas the city of Santa Cruz acknowledges the legacy of colonial violence, exploitation, dispossession, and attempted destruction of tribal communities in our region during the American, Mexican, and Spanish periods that forcefully separated tribal communities from the Santa Cruz area, a traumatic process that continues to have many impacts on descendants and families. And whereas the city of Santa Cruz is committed to combating systemic racism and supporting healing, equity, accessibility, and the local implementation of indigenous people's rights as outlined by international standards. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim October 12, 2020 as Indigenous Peoples Day in the city of Santa Cruz and encourage all citizens to join me in reflecting upon the ongoing struggles of indigenous people on this land, as well as their great resilience and to honor, val honor, value, and celebrate their historic and continuing contributions to our region and beyond. And with that, I'd like to invite Val Lopez, chairman of the Amamutsin Tribal Band, to say a few words and in acceptance of this proclamation today. Thank you very much, Mayor Cummins, and I'd like to thank um, the, 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 the city managers and um, the other um, um, persons who work for the city of Santa Cruz and the guests today. Thank you very much for this proclamation. It's, it's very meaningful, and it's not surprising that this comes from the city of Santa Cruz. Um, we've been working on relationships with the city of Santa Cruz for a number of years, and we're um, very, um, we're very happy with um, with the direction that we that this relationship is going. Um, you know, I say that the city of Santa Cruz is, is recognizing that our ancestors were not hunters and gatherers, and that we very effectively managed and stewarded the lands so that they were sustainable and, and provided for all living things, the, the wildlife and et cetera. And we continue to work on that. We also continue to work on wellness. You know, um, it, was in the, it was in Santa Cruz that I first started talking about how perpetrators need to heal. And a lot of people today, they'll say, well, I'm not a perpetrator. I didn't do that. And we agree with you. We totally agree with you. What happened to us is not your fault. But you must recognize 
that you that you greatly benefited from that destructive history that we experienced. And so every morning when you put your feet on the ground, I'd like you to think that you're putting your feet on ground that was stolen from our ancestors. And work hard, just as Santa Cruz is doing now, work hard to, to change the way that indigenous, that our history is told, Turn, change the way that our land is being protected and, and taken care of. And, um, and, reckon, and, and also um, know that we will work with the city on, on, on helping um, you know, get to the path where we could have a good, solid, healthy relationship. That can only happen when we have two healthy partners, the city and the tribe. We look forward to that day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Val. Okay, so moving on to our next um, proclamation. We have one more proclamation, then I have um, another letter to read. Um, and this one will be presented to um, Ray Cantino from the Community Bridges in honor of um, December, or September 15th, 2022, October 15th, as National Hispanic Heritage Month. And so I'd like to read some of the, the whereases, and then I'd like to invite Ray Cantino to speak on behalf of the work that's, that Community Bridges has been doing in our community and to accept this proclamation. And so whereas Latinx represents a wide range of nationalities and backgrounds coming from Mexico, Central and South America, and Spain, and is the nation's largest ethnic minority, representing approximately 17% of the United States population. And whereas, like other Americans, Latinx have overcome great obstacles to persevere and flourish in every sector of our society. And whereas Latinx continue to enrich our nation's character, shape our common future, and affirm the narrative of American unity and progress. And whereas during National Hispanic Heritage Month, we celebrate Latinx culture, honor the invaluable ways they contribute to our common goals, and work towards a stronger, more inclusive, and more prosperous society for all. And whereas in addition, we reaffirm the city's commitment to the values of dignity, inclusivity, and respect for all, regardless of ethnic or national origin, gender, race, religion, sexual orientation, or immigration status, and stand united as a city where love and acceptance are stronger than hate and bigotry. Whereas since 1977, Community Bridges has been a catalyst for a brighter future for the entire community, including our Latinx community, in the Santa Cruz region by delivering fundamental resources for the people of Santa Cruz County, Whereas Community Bridges Beach Flats Community Center and Familia Center, now known as Nueva Vista Community Resources, has a compassionate staff and provides safe place for the Santa Cruz community to access resources that offer stability and hope for the future, including application assistance, community advocacy, parent education, food and nutrition services, after school homework meetups, and summer fun. And whereas Community Bridges Nueva Vista Community Resources Center seeks to meet the needs of the families and unleash their full potential through bilingual, bicultural support on both a long and short-term basis through drop-in advocacy support, helping our community access resources and set goals to address issues such as employment rights, landlord-tenant issues, consumer issues, and health care access for all residents. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim September 15th to October 15th, 2020, as National Hispanic Mer Heritage Month in the city of Santa Cruz, and call on our residents to join me in recognizing the lasting contributions that Latinx have made and continue to make to strengthen the fabric of American society and the ongoing support that Community Bridges continues to provide to our Latinx community. And with that, I'd like to invite Ray Cantino um, from Community Bridges to, to say a few words in acceptance of this pr proclamation. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, city council members, um, city manager, uh, Martin Bernal, as well as um, assistant um, to the city manager, uh, Ralph. Um, just wanted to uh, first accept this on behalf of everybody that works for Community Bridges. Uh, obviously, it's their, their work, their direct client work um, that really kind of um, should be highlighted in accepting this award. Um, I do want to just recognize how beautifully we started uh, today's meeting by acknowledging the land we, we are on, 
as well as the staff's uh, role and leadership in ensuring that uh, we changed, um, at least locally in Santa Cruz County, how we refer uh, to the Hispanic uh, Heritage Month uh, to be more inclusive of the actual uh, communities, both la using the word Latinx, which includes um, most indigenous folks as well and uh, is more representative of a cohesive uh, um, namesake or the, or the people that are actually living in Santa Cruz County. Um, by using that word Latinx uh, versus Hispanic, which is really more characterization of um, Spanish ancestry and is representative of Spanish colonization, which is how we started the meeting. So um, for us, it's just really important to continue to do the advocacy work. We know the um, different um, disadvantages and marginalizations and the negative impacts that, um, you know, unfortunately, um, your your position uh, in terms of uh, being Latinx uh, puts you in, and we know that a lot of that is uh, uh, societal racism, structural racism, and, uh, inequalities in our in our communities and our structures. And uh, we are here to try to level the playing field as much as possible, so we can avoid uh, some of those negative impacts uh, that we know through health data and other um, realities in our community. So. Uh, we are, you know, w wonderfully um, uh, thankful for everyone's acknowledgement of our work and uh, partnership uh, from the city council, um, everyone on this call uh, for everything we do together uh, to improve conditions for all people, um, and, but in this month in acknowledging our Latinx community. Great, and, and I just want to thank you again and all your staff for all the hard work you've been doing uh, throughout COVID. I know that you all have been really helping to ensure that people, um, you know, regardless of their income or their immigration status or what language is their first language, has access to meals and resources so that, you know, no one is suffering through this time. And I just want to acknowledge and thank you for all the hard work that you all have been doing. With that, um, I'll move on to our next um, item of business. Uh, we were recently contacted by our Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women. Um, they sent us an article that I'd like to share with council members in our community. Uh, it starts, dear mayor, members of the city council, since shelter in place order took effect in March to mitigate the spread of COVID-19, the number of reported domestic violence cases has increased significantly, significantly in Santa Cruz County. Extended time spent isolated with violent partners increases opportunities for violence and mandatory social isolation has fractured vital support networks that domestic violence survivors typically rely on to seek help or escape violence. The Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women needs your help to remind individuals feeling trapped that they are not alone. The CPVAW encourages our city leaders to make every effort to let community members know about this problem and to publicize the below resources for those in need of support. There's an, a link to Monarch Services website, which is 24-hour free confidential bilingual crisis hotline. And I'll read that hotline is the following. It's 1-888-900-4200. Again, that number is one 888 Nine zero zero four two three two, and National Domestic Violence Hotline, which is one eight hundred seven nine nine safe. That's one eight hundred seven nine nine seven two three three. As October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, we must acknowledge that this pandemic has reinforced upsetting truths. Social inequities related to health are magnified during a crisis, and sheltering in place does not inflict equivalent hardship on all people. Intimate partner violence can be physical, emotional, sexual, or psychological. People of all races, cultures, genders, sexual orientations, socioeconomic classes, and religions experience intimate partner violence. However, such violence has disproportionate impacts on communities of color and other marginalized groups. Economic instability, unsafe housing, neighborhood violence, and lack of child care and support services can worsen already tenuous situations. Learn more from New England Journal of Medicine, a pandemic within a pandemic. The CPVAW commissioners are calling on the city to act now. Please consider sharing these vital resources when you or the, the Santa Cruz Police Department speak publicly. Please make certain that these hotline numbers are highlighted on every city of Santa Cruz website as part of the COVID-19 response. 
Acknowledging domestic violence and its widespread consequences on our community is vital during this time, during this crisis. Sincerely, Ann Simonson Chair, Delphine Burns Vice Chair, Karen Madura Commissioner, Mervyn Mays Commissioner, Shannon McGuire Commissioner, and Beth Thurman Commissioner. And I'd just like to let council members know and the public know that we will also be bringing um, a proclamation proclaiming October as Domestic Violence Awareness Month at our next meeting. Okay. With that, um, I have a few announcements and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be placed up for public comment. Please note, public comment is heard only on items that council is taking action on and not updates or reports. The items that will be open for public comment on today's agenda are numbered 2, 4, and 12 through 27 on our agenda. With that, I'd like to ask the council members if there's any statements of disqualification today. Councilmember Matthews. I am disqualified on item number 25, which has to do with the Felix Street Department uh, referral back to the Planning Commission. I have a conflict of interest because um, uh, my family owns property within 500 feet of that, that development. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to ask the clerk administrator to announce any admission additions or deletions. There are none. Okay. I'd like to make an announcement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us that, on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will start on or start on or around 5:30 p.m. If you wish to make a comment during oral communications, please call in around 5:30. At this time, I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide a report on closed session. Thank you, Mayor Cummings, members of the city council. Uh, the city council met this morning at 11 a.m. via Zoom to uh, consider two items of pending litigation. On the first item, entitled Martin Herman versus uh, Martin Herman and Karen Her Herman versus Alexis Jenkins et al., uh, which is a lawsuit pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court, the council received a report from and gave direction to the city attorney's office. Uh, there was no reportable action on that item. On the second item, the council, uh, by a unanimous vote. Uh, voted to join the City of Chicago and the Public Rights Project in submitting a friend of the court brief in the matter of Apartment Association of Los Angeles County versus the City of Los Angeles, which is a lawsuit challenging uh, eviction protection measures adopted by um, the LA City Council in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, again, the council voted uh, to join in that amicus brief. and. Um, that is uh, the conclusion of my report. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions. Hey, are there any council members with questions for the city attorney? Okay, hearing none, um, I'd like to ask the city manager to report and provide any updates on city events, business items, or anything related to COVID-19 or the CZU lightning fire complex. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. I do have a brief uh, presentation. I'm gonna share my screen uh, with you. Okay, um, so this morning, or I guess it's afternoon already, I wanted to just provide you with an update on a couple of items. Uh, first on the COVID-10 uh, pandemic and where we are as a county, and then just a brief update on a couple of homelessness related items. Um, Martine, we don't see your screen share. Oh, Let's see. can you see it now? No. 
Oh, I see. I need to push the screen share button. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Can you see it now? Yes. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. So as I mentioned, uh, a couple of updates on the COVID-19, uh, not COVID-10, COVID-19 update in homelessness. Uh, first, with respect to COVID-19, um, the, uh, as you all know, the state has a, a blueprint for a safer economy uh, where they uh, keep track of the uh, status of various uh, counties and how they can reopen uh, various uh, parts of the economy. And it's called the Blueprint for a Safer Economy. And uh, I'll very quickly here show you uh, the way they, they do this. Uh, so basically, they've got uh, these uh, risk levels that they uh, monitor, and they look at positivity rates and, uh, and cases within a particular uh, uh, category in terms of number of cases per 100,000. Uh, and they, they have these uh, four different uh, categories, uh, the purple widespread, the red substantial, the orange moderate, and the yellow uh, minimal. And uh, at this point, uh, the uh, county of Santa Cruz is in the uh, substantial uh, category, which is the red. Uh, we have a positive, positivity rate of 5.9%, um, and so that is why we're in that category. Uh, based on what we've heard from the county and the health officer, uh, we expect to, uh, to stay in that category uh, for the next two weeks, and uh, they're optimistic that we will continue to stay in that tier for a uh, longer period and perhaps possibly move down to a lower tier. And so I'll just really quickly uh, just show you what uh, that means in terms of changes when you move from one tier to the other. And uh, here's this chart which compares the different tier levels. Uh, largely, the changes have to do with uh, how much uh, businesses or retail retailers or, or their sectors can open uh, indoors or outdoors in the, in the capacity. So as, as uh, I noted, we're in tier two, which is substantial, uh, which allows uh, some indoors, uh, for example, under retail, there is some indoors, but uh, with a uh, limited uh, uh, capacity at 50%. And as you move on to the uh, moderate tiers, you see that that capacity increases. Uh, and uh, there are some that do uh, open up. Uh, for example, the most significant one or noteworthy one is uh, uh, bars uh, and gin, I'm sorry, bars, which uh, if we do move to the moderate tier three, uh, you can see right now they're closed. They could be open uh, with uh, uh, modifications. The other category that uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of in Santa Cruz is, of course, restaurants. And you can see that right now it's open indoors with a maximum 25% capacity or 100 people. If we move on to the next uh, category, that capacity will increase 50% and, and 200 people. So that is uh, essentially how the, uh, the tier system works. Uh, and so we may, if we do move to the uh, next uh, category, uh, the, the tier, the orange tier, see increased capacity at the uh, various uh, businesses. Uh, same with uh, hotels, uh, another major category in the city. Uh, right now they're open with modifications. If we move to the orange, it'll be open, continue to be open with modifications, but the fitness centers will increase capacity and they'll allow indoor pools. Uh, so those are the main, and, and this chart is available uh, at the uh, California State uh, uh, website related to COVID-19 if uh, a residents or a council members would like to, to uh, reference that. Next, just a, a quick update on homelessness um, and a couple of categories I wanted to <coughs> review, and that is with respect to some of the immediate uh, items that we're working on uh, regarding the impact uh, of homelessness and, and managing that, and then a quick update on the longer term uh, work and efforts. So as the council is well aware, we, we have seen a surge in encampments uh, post the, the fires, uh, in part uh, 
because of the fires and in part also because we, due to the fires, we did have to clear out the, the major encampments in the Poganip. And so we've seen encampments flare up uh, around the city, particularly along the river um, and other parts of the city. Uh, and we are working to um, uh, address those uh, as uh, work is, continues on, on, on the river uh, and uh, to uh, refer people to, to shelters. One of the things that uh, we would like to do to uh, expedite that process or to make it uh, so that uh, we're able to better respond to encampments is uh, we've had a request into the county to, to try a, uh, a pilot program where we would have beds, what we call diversion beds, a limited number of beds that would uh, turn over such that they would be available kind of as needed uh, when police uh, or city staff is contacted and uh, they need to refer individuals to shelter uh, on a more immediate basis. And so we put in that request for work in the county to try to implement that. Because uh, the challenge that we have is that despite the fact that we've added, or the county has added quite a few um, uh, beds, or shelter beds, that uh, they tend to be full and they tend to not be available uh, immediately and there's a, a waiting process that makes it difficult to address the immediate situations that come up. And so we've asked the county to assist with uh, creating a bed that can turn over on a more regular basis so that uh, we can have that ability to assist individuals and to address the uh, situations that come up. The other uh, immediate item is uh, the relocation of the Ben Slams management encampment, which is uh, currently uh, in a floodplain and needs to be moved in order to uh, meet uh, FEMA requirements for reimbursement, uh, as well as uh, to just uh, avoid any potential uh, flooding that might occur uh, there. And so we are in communications with the, the, uh, the county on that and uh, expect to uh, bring uh, discussion with respect to that to the uh, two by two committee and then ultimately to the council as appropriate. Uh, and then with respect to the uh, overall strategy and policy uh, uh, focus on homelessness, the county is bringing, they had paused the, uh, their planning, their system planning process uh, as a result of the pandemic uh, that was uh, uh, done by focus strategies. And, and that really was a review of the homelessness uh, infrastructure, the homelessness system in our county. Uh, Focus Strategies has developed a series of models, or I'm sorry, recommendations to improve the system, to change the system, to be more responsive, uh, to uh, being able to assist individuals with getting out of homelessness. Uh, and so those recommendations uh, that they uh, prepared are now slated to return back to the county uh, and then to ultimately to the various jurisdictions in our county um, uh, after they are presented to the Board of Supervisors on November 10th. So that'll be at the, the Board of Supervisors meeting on November 10th. Uh, as part of that the process, there'll also be some discussions and decisions that have to be made around the governance model. And so that'll also come back after the November 10th as a policy decision that uh, will have to be made amongst the jurisdictions around uh, the governance, uh, around the allocation, uh, and siding of homelessness facilities and the provision of homelessness services. Uh, as uh, we don't really have a, a, an adequate model at this point, we're using an out of date model that really was intended to simply apply for grants, uh, but not really uh, any kind of uh, systematic decision making model. And then finally, as I noted before, we are looking to schedule within the next uh, couple of weeks the two by two committee and get that going again so that uh, they can particularly focus on some of the more immediate uh, questions and decisions that need to be made, particularly around the relocation of the bench lamp encampment. And so with that, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you may have uh, regarding these, these items. Thank you. Are there any council members who have questions for the city manager? Council member Byers. Thank you. Um, two questions. Where, where did uh, food not bombs react? relocate, because I know we moved them off Laurel and Front. That's correct. Um, so my understanding is that uh, they have moved to parking lot 23, which is the parking lot across the street on Front Street, uh, adjacent to the uh, 
the now uh, shuttered uh, Taco Bell. And so they're operating out of there. We did, uh, just so you know, we did uh, issue them a permit to operate there with uh, certain okay. conditions. Um, so they are operating in a uh, permitted uh, uh, location and uh, can continue to operate there, again, assuming that they are able to uh, meet those, those conditions. And my second one, I think maybe you mentioned your last sentence when you mentioned the two by two, uh, where we think there are a lot of people on the bench lands where they're going to go. Correct. So that is uh, that is uh, not has not been determined, um, and that is something that has to be decided. Uh, it does have to be relocated, as I noted, because of the of the flood potential. Right. Yeah. No. So the question that is a question that uh, needs to be uh, sorted out as to where that should occur uh, and uh, the timing for that has to happen fairly quickly right. uh, i think by at least the, the end of this month um, uh, although i think it could be yeah. a, bit, I, a bit but so we're bringing that to the two by two committee uh, at the staff level we are having discussions um, and uh, we will uh, present the the uh, the different options and considerations to the two by two committee and then as appropriate bring it, bring it forward to the respective legislative bodies to, to, to uh, finalize a decision there. Well, if we're involved in the two by two or whatever, I I hope that they're looking at motels. It's such a, seems to me such a straightforward way to get people off the bench lands is that we need a few good sized motels to put them in. It, it's working success, successfully in a lot of communities. Okay, thanks, Martine. Thanks okay, for thank the Thank you, that, that, that's a good suggestion. Okay, council members Golder, Brown, and then Watkins. Um, to Catherine's point, or council member Byers' point, I, I agree. I think looking at other locations and in um, the two by two committee, I'm, I'm sure you've discussed this, but if not, um, looking at sites that are not uh, perhaps in the city, but are underutilized county facilities like maybe i don't know if fire evacuees have you know fully left the fairgrounds how that that's set up right now if there's infrastructure there that's being underutilized or other county um facilities that aren't being used at the capacity that they could be used and maybe they could be repurposed and um reused for uh, the individuals that are currently residing in the benchlands camp Councilmember Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I guess I, I'm gonna just try to ask you, uh, Martine, to be a little more concrete about what you mean by conversations are happening about where people are gonna go. I'm, I'm just really concerned because I feel like uh, this happened pretty regularly when we come to the end of, you know, access to a site or funding, and then we say we're working on alternatives and then it just ends up um, by default going nowhere. And so I guess um, I, I, if you could try to help me understand, and I think the public wants to understand um, how those decisions will be made, how, what, what the timeline is like, it, does the two by two actually have uh, you know, this is also for members of the two by two committee, have the ability to make those kinds of decisions. If they make a recommendation, where does it go? I just wanna understand a little bit more. So to kind of assuage my concerns that conversation going nowhere. Um, so I'd like sure. to- know. Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to try to answer that question. I mean, ultimately, because it is a county operated facility and funded facility, ultimately uh, it is really up to them to decide uh, how to move forward. Um, I think you know, they have requested that the city consider uh, citing it in the city. Uh, and I think uh, what I've heard from council members that they'd like to consider it, uh, that it be cited also uh, outside the city. So that is a, a point of, of, of discussion. Or, uh, and, but ultimately, again, to answer your question, uh, it, it is really up to the, to the uh, uh, county to uh, decide whether to either relocate it uh, at a site that uh, they have identified or or some other site or to uh, close down the facility. 
uh, I think uh, I think the intent of the process is for us to provide them with uh, input uh, and, and then to get uh, our you know your direction as well as the board of supervisors uh, direction on, on how to move forward there's general agreement that uh, having additional shelter capacity is helpful in to the extent that we can uh, continue to have that and expand that that that's a helpful thing um, but the, the question is what where is the as you noted, uh, location is always a sensitive and, and difficult issue, um, but ultimately it is a policy decision uh, for uh, various jurisdictions to decide. Okay. Council Member Watkins. I, I guess my question is sort of similar to Councilmember Brown's in regards to kind of the process and timeline. Um, given that the winter months are upon us, sort of what is the ex sort of the anticipation of timeline um, for this to kind of be resolved? So the uh, the council, I'm sorry, the uh, the county uh, wants to resolve it uh, before the winter uh, season comes. They'd like to move it, um, and so uh, I think the thinking is that. Uh, uh, that the two by two committee will have discussions uh, and then if, if as appropriate uh, uh, then refer it back to the legislative bodies no earlier than the November 10th meeting uh, so would be in, in November when uh, it, would, it would come back uh, uh, as appropriate. And by that I mean if there's some um, agreement that doesn't require uh, uh, council action then, and then it, it wouldn't have to come because ultimately again it's really up to the, the the, uh, the county board of supervisors in, in the county who to decide it's it's uh, their facility they fund it uh, they're responsible for it um, and so they don't, need, they don't need our concurrence one way or the other from a decision making uh, perspective I guess I have a follow-up question to that mayor in regards though to the impact if it were to be um, you know um, you know, finalize, or if you were to sort of dis, dis, dismantle it, then then what is going to happen to the to the individuals that are residing there, and that will impact the city. So, I think um, although it may be a county funded program, we clearly have a, a stake in this. Um, so I hope you know. I, I mean, I hope it's just it, it's not sort of unresolved without you know following through with what the potential impacts are for our city. I'm sure you agree. Right, Nancy? Yes, I mean, I think the, uh, I mean, clearly the the more capacity we have to offer people shelter, uh, the uh, the more ability we have to manage the, the impacts. Uh, uh, although it is a, it is a, it is something that uh, does fluctuate somewhat. Um, we you know more recently, I think in large part because of the fires, we've had a surge, so the impact has just increased significantly, despite the fact that we had this capacity. So I think if it did close down people would be referred to existing facilities and uh, they could potentially could be uh, impacts. Uh, there are uh, hotels, uh, council member buyers suggested hotels, and that is uh, something that's available now, but uh, we could sort of explore an increasing capacity there as well. Um, so I think it's just a, a matter of really uh, determining whether uh, there is an interest in, in uh, continuing it and, and whether an agreement can, can be developed on a site that's appropriate. It could be that maybe it's uh, uh, something that uh, is uh, phased or where there's uh, particular timelines associated with them to come up with interim and then and then determine what happens next or, or some kind of process like that. So those are the kind of conversations that, that, that need to happen so that uh, it can be determined. But uh, I think you're right that uh, certainly it's likely that we would feel an impact if it were, if it were closed. Okay. okay. Thank you. Councilmember Byers. Sorry, one more. Uh, you know, it's interesting, uh, our team city manager, for 20 years we wanted the county to get involved in the homeless issue. And, if it, and they certainly are now. Of course, they get the money and they filter it out. So, but I'm confused now. If, see, we... For instance, not real, but for instance, the city identifies a motel, 84 rooms, 84 homeless in it. We Do we have to get permission from the county? Um, yes. I, I mean, we want to ask them for that money, maybe be $20 million or something to buy it. 
but is is there a tug of war between uh, I almost think you and Carlos should be talking daily on this issue to make it a a win-win for all of us but it seems it's so convoluted now for the city who gets the impact when anything happens the city is impacted right right and it's just sitting on the sidelines it's just you know why can't we have that done yesterday or i don't know maybe i'm too impatient but <laughs> anyway I, I think you get my question but right, um, right. Yeah, I think a couple of things. One is that uh, you know the, uh, the availability of funds is a more recent uh, experience, in, in part because of the uh, the, count, the I'm sorry, the state of California obviously acknowledging that it's a major problem throughout the state and and, and providing additional resources. Right. And then the pandemic, on top of that, has uh, created a need to do that. And uh, like I said, a lot of progress has been made. We now have. Where we used to have, you know, 50 year-round beds and about 100 during the winter, we now have about 500 beds that are year-round. So that's a pretty, you know, significant level of increase in the number of shelter beds available in our county just over a couple of years. Um, I think what's difficult is that despite the fact that there's been a lot of progress in that regard, that uh, we still see quite a bit of uh, street homelessness. Uh, people don't see a a, a, a a visible or a substantive difference uh, and that is very frustrating I think for everyone um, and uh, and so I think that some of, some of the things that I think need to be uh, worked on that are important are there while we have more beds there has to be more turnover of beds and, and more diversion I think everybody agrees with that and that's, those are, that's part of the the reforms that the focus strategy has recommended so that people can can be moved on to better situations and then additional beds provided on an ongoing basis so that you know there's there's this uh, 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 approach to getting people in and then getting them out and then having opportunities for uh, other folks to come in and go out and we just don't have that uh, structure in place yet uh, something that uh, I think is being worked on and that's why we're recommending a pilot program to just do uh, 10 beds, just a small number of beds to kind of get that going. But uh, as far as permanent facilities, uh, uh, those also, uh, I think, do take some time uh, to uh, develop because of the siting questions and also the funding. Uh, I do know that the focus strategies, when they looked at the, the provision of facilities, they, they are recommending having several facilities spread throughout the county recognizing that homelessness is not just a, a Santa Cruz specific uh, experience that you know homeless uh, population comes from throughout the county and having facilities throughout the county would be uh, preferable so I think that long term that is the uh, the I think the goal uh, but uh, the challenge right now is how to how to better how to best manage it given the circumstances that we're facing more immediately uh, I'd just like to, sorry for interrupting, but I'd like to remind the council that um, this topic is not identified on the agenda. It's meant to be a brief uh, update by the city manager, but uh, I, I, I recognize that this is a very important subject and uh, it is of great interest to council members and it would be uh, perfectly appropriate to agendize it for discussion um, at another meeting. Hey, Tony. <laughs> Yeah, and, and in closing, if, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach, reach out to me. I, again, I just wanted to give you an update on where we're at with this issue since it is a, an, an ongoing issue. Uh, so again, feel free to reach out to me and uh, let me know. And uh, we'll, we'll get the two by two committee also uh, scheduled so that uh, there is that uh, uh, process in place. Thank you. Okay, Councilman Byers, did you have any further comments this year? Hands no, raised. No, thanks. But okay. um, Mayor Cummings, I hope you might agendize this at some point. Okay. Okay. Um, moving on to the next item on our agenda, if there's no further comments or questions regarding the city manager report. The next item on our agenda is the meeting calendar. So I'd like to ask the clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. There are no updates. Yeah. I'd also
also like to just mention to council members that uh, we're trying to schedule a few study sessions, one related to housing, the other um, which is related to um, mental health crisis response. And so if mm -hmm. council members can keep an eye out for those emails so that we can get those study sessions scheduled, um, it'd be very much appreciated. Next item on our agenda, <clears throat> council membership and city groups, groups and outside agencies. And so this is a time for council members to report out on actions at external boards, committees, and joint power authorities. Uh, for future meetings, please come prepared to provide an update on any meetings or actions that have occurred since the last council meeting so that the council and public can be informed. Are there any council members who'd like to report out on any um, committees, commissions, or boards that they've been on? Councilmember Brown. Hi, thank you. I don't have a whole lot to report, but I did want to let folks know that uh, the Area Agency on Aging uh, Seniors Council, in which I am on the, um, the board for the Area Agency on Aging representing the city, is uh, having an event on uh, social isolation um, and uh, the effects of, you know, uh, on, of isolation on uh, seniors in our community and beyond. And that event is happening next Wednesday, October 21st at 10 a.m. There is a Zoom link that you can uh, access if you just go to the Seniors Council website um, and uh, look it up or ask me and I can give it to you. I can forward it to you. Um, but I think this is a really important issue. We've been working on it for a while. I know the MA did an exhibit in uh, uh, collaboration with uh, the Seniors Council and other groups. And so I just wanted to, to highlight this. I think it's really important right now that we um, stay on top of this and, and kind of think about what we can do. So that's October 21st at 10 a.m. by Zoom, via Zoom, thanks. Okay, thank you. No further update from Councilmember Brown. Councilmember Matthews, I see you have your hand raised. Yes, um, I will mention on the Downtown Management Corporation, um, which is um, an assessment district funded by property assessment. Um, the, um, of course, uh, contract for the um, hospitality program downtown, that's now transitioning to a national program called Block by Block, and the Downtown Association um, is coordinating that transition. Um, and also we are adding a new member um, to our board, and that uh, will be, um, the recommendation is Ian McCray, owner of two of So that has three property owners, three business owners, and three city owners. So um, that board will be uh, changing. And uh, on the, City County Task Force, which are the university growth. Um, there was a phone call recently with um, community groups in Berkeley that successfully challenged, um, uh, is in the process of challenging um, the use of Berkeley growth plan. Fascinating conversation. And um, that task force is in conversation with uh, community groups in university host communities throughout the state. Um, our, uh, advocates hired through the funds that both the city and county allocate, allocate is um, very energetic. <laughs> She's amazing and is working with the advisory group, um, which has uh, about a dozen members from the community um, to stay connected, even though um, the university is in a diminished occupancy right now. The LNDB process is moving forward. So uh, we're Continuing with that, on the um, um, I think those are the two most significant ones. Oh, in Metro, um, the um, focus is on um, rebuilding, um, moving towards rebuilding a new paratransit center, which will greatly improve the ability to serve uh, uh, transit customers with disabilities and special needs. And also the talks are going um, very well between our economic development department and metro planning staff. They're meeting weekly and moving forward with applications for housing money for 
for that project and site uh, modification. So, um, commendations to the staff of both agencies for that. Um, and I just mentioned also the Mid County Groundwater Agency in terms of having developed its um, uh, sustainability plan, groundwater sustainability plan that's been submitted to the state. Apparently, it can take up to two years to get processed. <laughs> but excellent work by that um, agency and our water commissioner, David Baskin, who is one of the city reps, um, was just elected to be vice president of that group for the coming year. Done. All right, thank you for those updates. <clears throat> um, are there any other council members who like to make have any updates that haven't been mentioned? I think I'll just briefly mention <clears throat> um, a few of the subcommittees I serve on. Obviously, the council budget subcommittee, we approved our budget um, at a special meeting last week, and so, um, so that committee um, will be considering, you know, what are the next steps moving forward as it relates to revenue generation and then other budget considerations. Um, although the Homeless 2x2 two two committee hasn't met um, recently, we did have a really great opportunity to have a field trip on Friday uh, where we were able to, we were joined by Supervisor Ryan Coonerty, uh, John Laird, Assemblyman Mark Stone, Congressman Panetta. We had our representatives from our water department, fire department, parks and rec, public works, PD, and we were able to um, visit a number of the sites throughout the city that have been heavily impacted by um, homelessness. So we were able to um, go by the one and nine intersection to demonstrate what's happening in that area. We were able to visit Poganip and to see some of the cleanup that's happening there and visit those sites. And then we were also able to um, visit the Benchland sites. And so our hope is that moving forward, we'll be able to work um, closely with our state and federal representatives to determine solutions and um, you know, identify areas for advocating on behalf of the city uh, for the needs that, um, that we have as it relates to trying to improve our situation with homelessness in the city. Um, AMBAG, uh, we had a presentation on the water quality memorandum agreement. Um, and with this and the Water Quality Protection Program Committee, uh, these are voluntary groups um, without any statutory authority, authority as groups. And the uh, memorandum of agreement is signed by eight agencies to coordinate, collaborate, and share information. Um, there is a need to extend this um, agreement with the various agencies, AMBAG being one of them. And so staff requested that we had a five-year extension of the memorandum um, agreement. And although there was a little, there was discussion throughout the group, um, this ended up passing um, the, for the extension of this agreement with uh, eight agencies. Um, in addition to that, with LAFCO, um, the only item that really came out of our last meeting was that we received an application from a landowner requesting extraterritorial, extraterritorial service agreement involving the city of Scotts Valley. Um, the commission adopted the draft resolution, which will allow the city to address health and safety concerns uh, and provide sewer service to a single parcel uh, with a failing septic system. And, oh, and then the one other group that met um, Councilmember Brown and I serve on the rental data um, subcom standing subcommittee. We were able to have a meeting with uh, property owners on 3D, the 3DI rental data program and the potential for implementing that within the city. And also just wanting to hear concerns with, from this group about rental data collection in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, it was a pretty productive conversation. And one of the things that we moving forward would like to do is have um, in addition to rental data collection, a conversation around housing and what's come out of the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee. And so I think that you all received an email from um, the city clerk, but we're trying to see if we can set that meeting up in the near future so that we can have a further discussion with CDI, receive updates on um, state legislation, and then also receive an update on progress as it relates to the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee report. And with that, I think that that concludes all the updates that I have. So if there are
there are no other updates from council members, I think the next we can we can move on to the next item on our agenda, which is consent. These are items numbers 12 through 21 on our agenda. For members who are from the public who are streaming in to this meeting, now is the time to call in if you'd like to comment on items numbers 12 through 21. Uh, you should have instructions on your screen for calling in. Um, please remember to mute your streaming device, press star nine to raise your hand, and listen for the cue saying that you've been unmuted. All items will be acted on in one motion unless an item is pulled by council member for further discussion. And at this time, I'd like to ask if there are any council members who would like to pull items uh, from the consent agenda. Council member Golder, council member Matthews. I'd like to pull item 15. Okay. Council member Matthews. Same. Okay. And I'd like to pull item number 14 uh, for comment. So um, at this time, oh, Council Member Matthews. Um, I wanted to make, are you pulling it for public discussion as well? I wanted to comment on that as well briefly, but. Sure, yeah, I know that there's um, a desire for, from staff and I was also gonna make a few comments on that item in particular. And so I think that that'd be fine to, to get comment on that item as well. Now or, or pull it from the consent agenda? My, if my understanding is correct, I think we can, and maybe the city attorney can uh, weigh in, but I think that what I'd like to do is if the staff can make a comment and then if there are further comments from council members, we wouldn't have to pull it necessarily from consent unless there was a reason to pull it because there wasn't agreement on that item. Is that correct? That's right. I'll just say very brief, briefly, nothing controversial. I just want to commend you and the staff and Val and all the others who've been involved in bringing it to this point because I think they have approached this in, in a very, very thoughtful way and been very inclusive in engaging a broad range of people. So um, from the tribe to our staff to community members, uh, it's just been, I think, a uh, respectful, um, serious process that um, is a good model, frankly. <laughs> Could have gone sideways, but it's been, it's been a good model. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate those comments. Yeah. Um, with that, I'd like to invite um, Parks and Rec Director Tony Elliott to maybe uh, provide just a, a, some brief background and context on this item, and then if there's any further comments on consent items, um, we can hear those from council open up for public comment and then take action and deliberation. All right, you know, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. Thanks for the opportunity. I've uh, got just a brief report here to provide a little bit of background. So uh, let me just toggle over and I'll uh, read from that. Um, so a little bit of the background on this um, as it relates to parks and recreation. So this summer uh, during the protests and the, a lot of the social unrest, the Mission Bell was removed from uh, Mission Plaza uh, Park, the city park by Holy Cross. Um, and the state park's mission, Santa Cruz, was also vandalized. And so what, what that did, it created a, a really a community conversation. It was kind of a catalyst for a community conversation. Um, and so we, we began to engage a number of stakeholders. I, I reached out uh, first to Mayor Cummings and uh, friends of Santa Cruz State Parks. Uh, we had talked earlier in the year about uh, Mission Plaza and the Mission Bell. Uh, but we engaged a, a, a pretty sizable group uh, from Holy Cross, uh, State Parks, the Museum of Art uh, and History, the MA, um, and a number of different stakeholders, Friends of Santa Cruz State Parks. And really the, the goal of the group was to start developing ideas around how to convey a more complete and accurate history of the Mission Hills Historic District or um, uh, the Mission Plaza Park area in particular. Um, and, and specifically by including the indigenous voice uh, and experience. Um, and this is not a new conversation, certainly. The, the MA and Museum of Natural History, uh, Mission Santa Cruz, all have really important roles in conveying um, the, the history of Santa Cruz, including um, indigenous peoples in, in Santa Cruz. So through programming, through education, field trips, exhibits, uh, they all do a lot of this um, uh, already, and then in 2019, I think the mayor will uh, talk about here in a moment, um, uh, Mayor Cummings and 
uh, Val Lopez um, work together up at UCSC to remove the mission bell on campus. And so what we're doing here and this community conversation that we have entered into is really a continuation of a lot of those steps, um, the education and some of these steps related to the mission bells that have started uh, historically and we're just uh, bringing forth uh, to hopefully continue at this point. So uh, the, this resolution um, that's before the council, um, there's two parts. The first is to endorse uh, the community's effort to update the narrative of Mission Plaza Park in the Mission Hill Area Historic District so that a more accurate description or depiction of the history of the indigenous people of the area is included. And then number two, um, the second aspect of the resolution would be to direct the Historic Preservation Commission uh, to place an item on a future meeting uh, to discuss the permanent removal of all mission bells from the city of Santa Cruz and bring uh, bring a recommendation on whether or not to remove the bell um, uh, for the city council to consider. And the last thing I'll say, I'll, uh, then I'll send it over to the mayor, but I just wanted to say that from the, really from the perspective of Parks and Rec, and I think on behalf of the committee, uh, this community uh, committee that's gotten together, the goal here is not to replace one aspect of our, of our history with another, um, but it's to acknowledge and include uh, the indigenous voice uh, and convey the history of Santa Cruz. Um, and as we've said in our, our, our mission statement of the committee, uh, convey the history of Santa Cruz in a holistic, respectful, and immersive manner. Uh, so we've kind of rallied around that, that idea. Um, but with that, I'll send it, uh, Mayor, I'll send it back over to you for more uh, context. Thanks, and, and yeah, I'll just say that this obviously has been before us for, well, it's, it's been brought up uh, ever since summer of 2019 when UCSC, and, and just for clarification, I, I wasn't involved in that process, but I did, I was invited to that uh, removal ceremony uh, where there was ex interest expressed um, by other council members that this was something that they were interested in doing as well. And a lot of that conversation um, was paused due to COVID-19 and just really, you know, as we were all trying to focus on um, COVID-19 response and really get our, ourselves wrapped around how we can our, get our community to function um, under COVID-19. And kind of as we were moving forward, and with a lot of the social unrest and kind of um, a cry from members of the public that we be that we acknowledge some of the um, the difficult parts of our history, you know, this came back up with the protest that happened at the at the uh, at the mission, and you know, I think everybody who was in that group really acknowledged that there was a there is a way that we can tell this story there better in a more inclusive way, and I think one of the things that was brought up was that these mission bells. Um, really don't have, you know, historic significance. I mean, a lot of the reasons why they were uh, constructed, as we've laid out in part of the agenda, was, you know, around tourism in California. And just given the um, the impact, the negative impact that that can have on our indigenous um, our indigenous people within our community, uh, we thought that it would be appropriate right now to address this concern and bring it forward. So. Um, those are all the comments I have to make, and I've been really uh, happy for the leadership of our parks director with helping to bring together so many amazing stakeholders um, to um, bring this forward in a way that's very inclusive and is a way that's demonstrating healing and a, a pathway forward. Um, Council Member Golder and then Council Member Brown. As long as we opened it up for discussion, I just wanted to add a couple of comments as well and say how grateful I am that this is happening moving forward. And having grown up here in town and what I was taught as a third and fourth grader um, is the same thing that we're still teaching in third and fourth grade now. And we really do teach it from a, um, I feel like a holistic perspective and what the experience was like um, for the indigenous people at that time. And when students from Santa Cruz City Schools visit our mission, it's very different than visiting other missions throughout the state that are run by um, churches. The narrative is really different and it's super apparent when students are assigned that um, mission report in fourth grade. I'm not the only parent that drives up or down the state to take their kid on your own field trip. So one of my kids had Carmel and the other had Santa Barbara and both of those are not like San Juan Batista or Santa Cruz where they're really run by the um, the church still. And so even as fourth graders, my kids could see the implicit bias that was, you know, being presented in those um, 
preservation efforts. And I do think it's important not to erase that history, but I do think it's important to portray it accurately. And um, so I think that this is not just for Santa Cruz, there's going to be kids that are coming on field trips with their own families from all over the state and can really get a different perspective if the mission in their local school district doesn't have that same sort of um, narrative. And then also for any international tourists that are interest in our, interested in our um, Spanish colonial past or even you know people that moved to Santa Cruz from other states and don't understand the complexity of what happened. I think it's really, really important. Um, and so thank you guys. Yeah. Uh, Councilmember Brown. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you to the folks who have brought this to us. Uh, a huge thank you to Valentin Lopez for um, really stepping up. And actually, this, this issue came to us earlier. I think it was in 2018 when I, uh, when my first two years on the council, and we began to talk about it. And then um, I was very happy to see that uh, UC Santa Cruz took this approach and was looking forward to um, this coming before us. So I'm really glad to um, be able to support this today and um, and really, really just want to, uh, you know, I, I think that it's worth reflecting on, you know, the, the historical injustice and oppression that those those bells represent to a lot of people and um, including myself. Um, we, uh, I teach a class where we talk about this and we, uh, my students this, uh, just this few weeks ago, um, we're kind of reading a, from a historical memory of, of folks who, um, whose, whose grandparents and, and beyond had um, experienced and, and, and they talk very intimately about what the, what the bells, what it was like to, um, to, be, to experience that, to be in the missions, to be kind of forced into this educational system um, and the conversion system. So I just think it's really, really um, wonderful that we are taking this approach and I'm glad to hear uh, Council Member Golder that our uh, local schools, K through 12, have a different approach to teaching about mission history. Uh, my students at San Jose State are from all over the state and they don't all have that experience. So I can, I can attest to the fact that it's, it's wonderful that, um, they, that people get it early here in Santa Cruz. Um, so I guess I'll just leave it there. I just really wanted to say thank you, um, Mr. Lopez, for all of the work that you do. Um, and um, thanks, uh, Director Elliott and Mayor Cummings and everybody else who's been involved. Um, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Okay, if there's no further comments from council members, we have, um, we'll go ahead and go into public comment. So if there's any members of the public who would like to speak to us on items numbers 12 through 21 with the exception of item number 15, which was pulled, now is the time to call in. Um, once you've called into the meeting, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will have up to two minutes to speak on items that are on our consent. And again, these are items numbers 12 through 21 with the exception of item number 15. Okay, first caller. Uh, hi, this is good, so I'll make this short. On item number 14, removing the mission bells is just part of the leftist cancel culture of history with historic artifact destruction, which is part of the leftist social justice agenda, fast forwarding the reality of past morals or events into the current day where they don't exist as if they do, which they don't. Uh, just two nights ago, the cancel culture violent leftist morons celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day tore down the Lincoln and Roosevelt statues outside and broke into and vandalized, looted the Oregon Museum of History in Portland. One the difference between them and who wants this is that they want council to do their council culture for them. Erasing evidence of the past will not change those events, nor does it make past events any less historic. That people feel the full narrative of events and truth from hundreds of years ago has somehow not been told after all that time is a mystery, isn't it? What part of history is missing exactly? Bye. Thank you. If there are any other members of the public who would like to speak to us on items numbers 12 through 21, with the exception of item number 15, now is the time to call in. Please press star 9 on your phone to raise your hand, and you will be given two minutes once you've been unmuted.
Okay, seeing no other members of the public who would like to speak to us on items on our consent agenda, I'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. And so I'm looking for a motion for items numbers 14 through 21 with the exception of 15 that's been pulled. Council Member Matthews. And you are muted. trying to unmute when I'm not speaking. Uh, move the consent agenda with the exception of item number 15. So motion by Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Watkins. Uh, I'll second that motion. Okay. So we have a motion to move consent um, with the exception of item number 15. Uh, motion was made by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Watkins. Is there any further discussion? Okay. Councilmember Matthews. Okay. Yeah, very briefly, I just want to note that item 21, which is a legal contract for the Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant facility, is our, our first venture with the design-build uh, approach, um, design-build approach that the um, um, public has approved as a city charter amendment and with a project of this magnitude it, um, tend to be very beneficial for um, uh, such a complex project and a good model for the future. Just want to point out the voters approved that and we are now putting it into use beneficially. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, at this time, if there's no further discussion, I'd like to call on the clerk to please call the roll vote. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Next item is item number 15, which was pulled by Council Member Golder. And I'll just say as well that I was actually going to pull this item as well as, in the, as one of the authors um, had been contacted by some representatives from the League of California Cities this meeting who had some concerns um, about this item. So I just wanted to mention that, but I uh, would like to turn it over to Council Member Golder since uh, she pulled this item as well. I just was wanting this to be on um, regular. We could maybe post one, but on a regular agenda so that we could discuss it, discuss it further, um, just because I don't really have any knowledge about the housing situation down there, and I'm not sure if other members of council do, but um, I just felt like it needed a, warranted more discussion. Um, and that's what, so I, I don't know if council member Matthews or any, or Cumming, Mayor Cummings, if you guys want to add to why you were thinking about pulling it. Well, I can just mention that, um, I was, as I mentioned before, I was contacted by some of our representatives from the League of California Cities who expressed some concern um, about the item being on and also given the cities that were um, moving the, um, the local control item forward and just some concern that they were having around, there's not so much clarification around what this group would do and whether that would be in conflict, um, conflict with the League of California Cities since we've been a good partner with them. and so. I was actually going to pull and um, maybe even table the item to have more discussion with our league partners before we move on with adopting the item. So that was what I was going to actually recommend after receiving a phone call from them today. I don't know if there's any other council members who'd like to weigh in on this as well. Council Member Matthews. Yes. And then um, Council Member Brown. Um, I also wanted to pull it. I I would be the first person to admit that there are issues of local control in reference to state legislation. I think we all know that, and the League itself has been a really strong advocate over the years for uh, protecting local control. Um, um, I did talk with our League representative about this, um, and as I think I mentioned in the beginning, my internet's going down <laughs> for the last 12 hours, so I haven't been able to get anyone <laughs> Answers, which is more than frustrating, but um, uh, I felt this was probably well-intentioned, but premature. I tried to get information on this group. They don't have a website. It's not clear who the leadership is. It's not clear what their agenda is. When I read the material on their Facebook page and what little I could find, it seemed um, 
um, a pretty um, strident, and uh, I, it was not clear to me what the motivation was. It seemed to me that a lot of it was intended to un undo the kinds of state direction that has actually been beneficial to the city in trying to begin to meet some of our housing needs. And I think it's particularly housing advocates that have had a problem with this, the broad brush of this. So I, I would also favor tabling this. Um, may turn out to be something we want to engage with, but it seems to me um, I, I would rather focus on uh, working through the league and its established mechanism, certainly being open to community groups, but um, I feel not, not ready at this time. Councilmember Brown. I'll just say that I um, heard from, from folks as well about some concerns, and I also heard from the organizers of this effort, and I know that there are, you know, I think it's worth mentioning there are many jurisdictions in the state that have um, adopted resolutions like this, and many others have it on their agendas upcoming. So it's not, uh, you know, completely isolated effort, um, but I do think that it, uh, it does uh, warrant some additional conversation so that uh, folks can feel comfortable about what is um, the intention of this. And, um, you know, I know that local jurisdictions have, it, you know, it's not just housing and zoning and land use, it's, you know, unfunded mandates for all, all matters <laughs> um, and, you know, concerns about the, the way the state approaches that. So, um, and I agree that many of those actions have been beneficial. So, I, again, not intended to, um, um, try to to block that, but I I do want to um, I I do want to I, I do hope that we can have that conversation and flesh it out a little bit more moving forward. Okay. Are there any further comments from council members on item number fifteen? Okay, hearing none, we'll turn it over to members of the public. So, if there are any members of the public who would like to speak to us on item number fifteen, now is the time to call in. Uh, once you've called into the meeting, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Once you've been unmuted, you will be given two minutes uh, to address the council on this item. Oh, hi, this is Garrett again. On item 15, it is with some amusement uh, that I find the progressive comrades of the city council are taking offense at the equally progressive leftist state legislature, who again is throwing in the towel on the housing situation that previously violated private property rights with rent control and is now overreaching again, dictating the normal locally controlled zoning authority of cities. Uh, uh -huh. uh, now you know what landlords feel like with leftist housing so-called solutions. Anyway, since cities absolutely cannot violate superior state laws, the county needs to be, uh, council needs to be quite specific about exactly which laws you will be protesting or lobbying and should have proven actual local public uh, you know, approval to proceed. Uh, what supporting the California Cities for Local Control group actually means is a bit of a mystery to me, as is the group itself, as are, are your various threats threatened actions mentioned in this resolution in response to vaguely described future state actions. However, I do also strongly oppose the one-way, always higher density push of zoning to allow only higher housing density. The single-family, uh, you know, low-density zoning is the best for families, and the family unit is the primary safety net, strength, and individual, individual growth vehicle of our nation. Some SFR choice should always be preserved. A related worry to me is the horror of what's known as Agenda 21, which is the ultimate globalist vision of no nations, no boundaries, one world authority, regional authorities, local authorities, governed by mostly unelected people and largely held unaccountable by the people. Now, one globalist baby step toward that is this one-way density push intended to empty the countryside and push all people into ever increasingly dense urban centers where the people are easily easier to do surveillance on, control, and land use zoning is a huge part of that. If you can stop Agenda 21 zoning, that would actually be a good thing, but I'm leery the California Cities for Local Control isn't the proper path as it lacks, it backs a locally unelected activist organization. Bye. Next caller. Hey, thank you for, for taking me in. Um, so I'm glad that you're already gonna table it. Uh, I just wanna point out that the same group, some of their 
previous Facebook posts and what they've been going on about is to uh, like they've they've protested uh, HOAs allowing renters. Uh, there was a state bill that allowed for HOAs to just plain allow for 25 percent of units to be rentals. Period. Uh, there was lots of anti-renter sentiment, and basically every housing bill has been opposed by this same group. Um, I, it would be really bad for Santa Cruz to associate itself with with this. I understand the need for you know trying to take in community input. Like SB 330 is actually giving you some of that and saying, hey, come up with objective standards, figure out what you want to do, but you do have a duty to build multifamily housing that's going to house a lot more people. Um, at many more incomes, because right now that the status quo is that it is going to continue to get wealthier and wealthier as a result of not not building, not advocating for. And some of the people that, that did reach out to you and other council members, because I've talked to other people in other jurisdictions, is that so those same groups have also protested smaller projects and are not meeting their housing element that Santa Cruz is. On some level, you need state law so that good cities like santa cruz like like are, are not the only ones filling their fair share of housing and i know that i come and i come and i speak and i say hey you know we really need to build this housing we need it here in santa cruz but cities like torrance manhattan beach and uh, beverly hills have not been meeting it to the same degree like they're protesting the fact that affordable housing will get streamlined you know thank you all thank you Good afternoon, Council Members and Mayor Cummings. Uh, one, thank you for pulling uh, this item off your agenda, consent agenda. This is Casey Byer from the Santa Cruz County Chamber of Commerce. A uh, little background for you. Uh, for over a decade ago, I lived down in what we call the South, South, South Bay cities of, of Los Angeles County, of which these cities on your discussion item are listed. And quite frankly, not one of those cities has any indication of the housing affordability problems that we have in this county and in this city. Uh, going forward with this uh, would require you to work with the local developers and the business community and others that are involved in housing and uh, infrastructure development. Simply put, but putting a, an item like this on the consent item and calling it local control does not create local control. It creates chaos and uh, disallows the local community to engage properly in any type of housing and infrastructure development projects. Thank you for listening to my opinion. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, if there's any other members of the public who would like to speak to us on item number 15, now is the time to call in using the number on your screen. Once you've called in, please press star nine to raise your hand, and you will be given two minutes to speak on this item. Okay, seeing no other member of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, I'll bring it back to Council for Action and Deliberation, uh, Council Member Matthews. Oh, and you're, you're muted. I'd like to move to table this for future discussion. Okay. Uh, uh, to table it, yeah. Okay. So a motion to table by Council Member Matthews, um, Vice Mayor Myers. I'll second that, and I uh, also just want to um, appreciate the um, comments from the members of the public, um, and uh, I do, I'm, I'm very glad that we're taking our time to really look through this carefully. I have I have some concerns doing my own research and making some calls um, this past few days. Uh, I think it's, this is something we really need to think through before we join it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, if there's no further comments from council members, I'd like to turn it over to the clerk to please uh, call the roll vote. Um, the motion before us is to table item number 15, which was made by council member Matthews, seconded by Vice Mayor Myers. Thank you, council member Byers. Aye. Matthews. Aye. Brown. Aye. Holder. Aye. Watkins. Aye. 
Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that passes unanimously. Okay, the next item on our agenda is item number 22, uh, public hearing for amendments to parking regulations for residential and non-residential property. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you would like to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff for the council members who brought the item forward, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and return to the council for deliberation and action. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to um, Senior Planner Sarah Noisy and Principal Planner Matthew Vanois uh, to provide the council with the presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Um, so this item is one that um, sort of brings together a number of different policies that have been um, <coughs> awaiting implementation in our various policy guidance document documents. Um, so there are some policies within the general plan, within the climate action strategy, and then also most recently um, in the housing blueprint subcommittee report related to parking. And so um, we've kind of taken a chance to um, bring all of those items together into one set of amendments to the ordinance. So um, I will go ahead and share my screen with all of you um, and we'll go through this. So I'm going to um, I'm going to give just a pretty high level overview, and then we'll have time for questions if there's further detail um, that any of the members of the council would like to discuss. Oops. Okay. So a um, little background. As I mentioned, there are several gui policy guidance documents that have um, mentioned over the years seeking to make some autonomies and create some more efficiency in our parking standards. We also periodically get feedback from stakeholders and developers, um, applicants at all. Um, ends of the spectrum from those doing, you know, a minor home remodel or addition all the way up to developers creating larger projects um, that just sort of have offered us some more context and feedback on how these, how our current regulations are actually functioning. Um, so we wanted to take this amendment and, and use it to provide more options in meeting those requirements and then also reduce the burden um, on development in places where it hasn't really been um, necessary or as effective as anticipated. So I'm gonna just run through all of our parking proposals. So I've categorized everything into, I believe it's nine separate categories. Um, there are lots of, in some categories, there are several amendments that sort of implement the idea. Um, and one of the attachments to your item today was um, a summary table that lists every code section and what that amendment um, is intended to achieve. So um, we've added some text to the code about um, electric vehicle parking and accessible parking because they're now in, uh, included in the um, California Building Standards Codes. And um, so we needed to update our zoning ordinance to match. We've also clarified and consolidated some of the existing standards um, relating to commercial parking and residential parking. We've added some cross references. So a number of the changes that you see in there are just kind of um, increasing, improving usability of our code. Uh, we've updated some of the commercial uses to reflect some more modern uses. So for example, um, we didn't have um, tutoring facilities in the parking uses chart and that's something that is now uh, comes up and they need a parking ratio. So we've added that to the chart. Um, we've also gone through and made sure there are references in appropriate locations to the um, Parking District 1 resolution, which is the downtown area, because parking downtown is really governed by that resolution, which is under the sole um, jurisdiction of the city council. And um, that resolution in certain places supersedes what's in the, the um, municipal code. So we wanted to make sure that um, applicants are aware of that when they start um, considering a project in that area. Um, number five, we wanted to create some consistency in the regulations for tandem parking. So tandem parking is when uh, multiple vehicles park one behind the other. And um, state law for uh, properties that have accessory dwelling units um, specifically calls out that properties can go up to three cars in a row. So that's two tandem spaces and one regular space. 
So um, we're recommending that we take that um, existing allowance for ADU properties and apply it to all, uh, make it available to all residential properties so that there's some consistency in our regulations. Um, we're also introducing a process that sort of consolidates a, a number of existing um, options and brings them all together in one section of the code. So currently using transportation demand management. So these are um, <coughs> programmatic things that a development might do to reduce the demand for parking on a property. Currently our zoning ordinance would allow um, a developer or an applicant to request up to a 30% reduction in their total required parking. Um, we're proposing to increase that to 35% um, under this new process. And we're proposing to add a few options and features for applicants. So first of all, um, this process will be accompanied by a worksheet that really lays out all of the various TDM options and, um, and assigns an amount of reduction that could be available for each of those. Um, so as you can see here, Several of these are already existing in our code. We already offer them and make them available to applicants um, to use when they're requesting to reduce their um, parking requirement on a project. We are proposing two new options. So number one, unbundled parking, which is um, when the purchase or lease of a residential unit is separate from the purchase or lease of a parking space or spaces. So essentially this allows a, um, a renter or a um, purchaser of a property, the option of whether or not they're going to buy or lease a parking space, one parking space, two parking spaces. Um, and it really reduces the cost of someone who might not own a car and um, might not have any use for a parking space that they are required to lease or that's bundled in with their lease when they're renting a property. Um, and then also we're adding an, op we're adding an option for um, an applicant to bring forward a new proposal. Um, you know, technology is shifting a lot and the way that we travel is shifting a lot. And so we just wanted to go ahead and write something into our code that would allow it to be uh, more responsive as, as these new options come up. So that, um, you know, if there's a new opportunity that a developer wants to use, we could take a look at that and, and consider it. And we would have an option already in our code that would allow us to consider it. This process does leave the option to require a study by um, a civil engineer or a transportation engineer to sort of demonstrate that the proposed TDM measures would actually work on the given site because, um, you know, as you can imagine, some, so like non-auto use programs, that's things like transit passes, um, that could be extremely effective in some neighborhoods and really not very effective at all in other neighborhoods that aren't currently served very well by transit. And so that we wouldn't want to give them both the same like 10% reduction or 5% reduction, whatever it is. So some of these are going to be very context specific. And so by creating this process, it gives us a tool and a way to, to take a look at those and consider them. Um, Number seven, we are proposing to remove the requirement for covered parking. So currently single family homes that do not include an ADU um, are required to provide one covered parking space as a part of their required parking. Um, this came out of the housing blueprint subcommittee report. This was a recommendation to remove this as a requirement. This will allow these spaces to be used as additional bedrooms. Um, and it also just reduces the um, construction costs of new housing if they're not required to include a garage. They may still choose to do that. I'm sure there's market for that, um, but it gives, it provides more options and it could make for some flexibility that um, would currently be kind of challenging on some sites. So also I'll just mention here, removing this requirement um, triggers or sort of removes the need for an existing process that's called a conditional driveway permit. So you'll see in the strikeout version of your ordinance, we're deleting that whole section because essentially that permit existed to um, as a separate process to allow someone to park on their property without a garage. So um, we're deleting that and we're deleting all references to that permit type in the proposed ordinance. Um, so number eight, we're 
reducing the overall residential parking requirements a little bit and simplifying the existing standards. So currently, um, there are different standards for rental housing and ownership housing. Community housing projects are, um, that's the term in our, our muni code for um, ownership housing projects or condo projects. So condo projects currently have um, a guest parking requirement. Rental projects do not. Um, we also currently have two different standards. For, we have a different standard for single family housing with the same number of bedrooms than we do for multifamily housing. Um, we don't really see uh, the logic or need for that. So we are proposing to move from this, which is our existing, um, these are our existing standards to this standard where we have one parking standard for residential uses, regardless of type. Um, and that standard is one space for a studio or efficiency unit, one space for one bedroom, and then two spaces for anything larger than two bedrooms. So this is pretty similar, we'll just step back for a moment, pretty similar to this chart. The difference is for those larger units, we're no longer gonna be requiring um, additional parking for units that are four bedrooms or more. Generally speaking, there are few of those units and as we move forward, even fewer of them are proposed in new development. So we feel that this proposed change is um, really quite incremental. Um, also, additionally, uh, we're, we're creating the same standard for guest parking for both um, resident, uh, sorry, ownership housing and rental housing. So um, for multifamily housing, it would all be the same standard uh, we would require a guest parking requirement of 10% and require that all fractions be rounded up. So that would mean that every time you have a multifamily project, you would get a minimum of one guest parking sp space, even with a duplex. So um, the way the current standard is written, it, if you use like a two bedroom and three bedroom multifamily project, it works out the way it's written because um, it's one space for every four units rather than per parking space. Um, it works out to be about 12 and a half percent. That's like, that's the math that we did. So we're recommending a pretty modest reduction to a 10% requirement and then having that also apply to rental housing. Um, and then there are a couple, uh, several kind of little cleanup things. There's this one um, uh, caption on one of the images that is, um, a little misleading at best and inaccurate at worst. And so we're proposing to just delete it. We've codified several of the standards for parking facilities that are currently only included in illustrations. We're codifying them into the text of the ordinance. Again, that's a usability issue. Um, we've reorganized a number of things just to kind of make them uh, follow a more logical pattern and be easier to find. Um, and then I am going to have to read in this one change to the ordinance. This was made at the Planning Commission and I, I missed getting it into the published version of the ordinance. So this is relating to parking lifts, which are mechanical structures that can lift cars and increase the parking capacity of existing structures or space. So um, it's in section um, 2412 290.2F, which um, on the strikeout version of the ordinance is on page 17. So we're going to add a clause to the first sentence. So the first sentence currently, the first sentence will now read, parking lifts or stacked parking within parking structures shall demonstrate how individual users can effectively access vehicles. And then we're going to add a second sentence that states parking lifts and stacked parking are not permitted except within enclosed parking structures. So this is sort of our first baby step into this new technology. Um, Parking lifts are very common in some places, in some jurisdictions where land values are very high. We have started to see them proposed here in Santa Cruz. They're not very common yet. And um, so we're just taking sort of one step and allowing them within enclosed structures. Um, at some point in the future, we may wish to get into a further discussion about allowing them in surface lots, and we're not ready to do that right now or recommend that. So this language is now part of the staff recommendation today. So we did conduct some community outreach on this item. We held a virtual community meeting for COVID uh, in July of this year. It was attended by about 25 residents. Um, and that conversation did generate some many interesting ideas for future work that the city might pursue on parking. Um, 
looking at geographically based standards. So rather than allowing um, individual projects to apply for a reduction, sort of just having different standards in different neighborhoods based on what we understand about existing transit access and the likelihood of, um, you know, people being able to walk to multiple trips within certain neighborhoods more so than in others. Um, there was also a lot of comment about the, the need for increased control of on-street parking. So um, obviously when we make changes to the requirements for off-street parking, which this whole proposal is about requirements for off-street parking, there could be some effect that is felt on the on-street parking resources. We've tried We've done our best to um, set up these ordinances and this proposal so that um, those effects are minimized and we're still able to maintain safe and effective parking in our on-street um, our on-street resources. So for example, um, I'll just back up to um, those TDM measures. Uh, some of them would require or only be allowed in places where there is a residential um, permit parking program in place and then those permits aren't available to the um, new residents of the new project in order to ensure that, you know, if you're unbundling parking, folks aren't just parking on the street, right? So we, we thought that through and we think we've come up with a way to sort of regulate, um, minimize the chance that that could happen. Um, and again, that's something the city um, sort of continually, continually working on and reevaluating is how we manage our on-street parking resources. And then there were also some ideas about how we manage our um, road cross sections and continuing the work that Public Works already does about pursuing um, more separation between modes of transportation. So really ensuring that bicyclists have safe um, places to ride, especially in places where new curb cuts are, are starting and folks are moving in and out, especially if there's, um, you know, if it's structured parking and, you know, taking, keeping track of the visibility and ensuring safety for all of the different users of the road that are moving on all different modes of transportation. So um, those were all really great ideas that came from the public on this topic. Um, we took this item to the Planning Commission in September. Um, the commission discussed sort of striking this balance of keeping safe parking and um, sufficient parking for all of our users, and then also the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which that's where a lot of the policy guidance began, was in um, this desire to change the modes of transit that are most appealing for more users. Um, and the comments that we got from the public at that meeting sort of were at both ends of that. Um, there were some that really urged the city to go much further than we have. And I, you know, we concede we're taking an incremental step on this right now. Um, and there were others that expressed concerns over their the existing lack of parking in certain neighborhoods that they already feel really impacted. It's already really hard for, you know, on trash day, especially or street sweeping day. Um, and so those are, you know, the issues that we're trying to balance here and um, accommodate in this proposal. So the next steps, there will be, you know, if, if this proposal is approved today by your council, there will be a second reading at the next meeting. Um, and then this is part of the LCP implementation program, so it would have to go to the Coastal Commission. And um, because of this, for this reason, and because, you know, coastal neighborhoods and the Coastal Commission has a very different view of um, the need for parking, and they have a different set of concerns and interests, we're recommending that this, this ordinance be formally bifurcated, which means that it's split in two and will be able to go into effect outside the coastal zone 30 days after the second reading and won't be in effect inside the coastal zone until the Coastal Commission takes action on it. But we bifurcate it to allow it to go into effect in the non-coastal portions of the city sooner. So just to go through our LCP and Coastal Act consistency, this is part of the analysis we have to do for any um, proposal or ordinance that amends part of our LCP, our local coastal program. Um, there are several policies that speak directly to um, a desire for parking reductions, specifically in projects that include alternative transportation. And so we feel there's really good support for um, the the reductions that were, or the changes we're recommending relating to um, creating new transportation demand management in new development. Um, 
as I've mentioned a few times, this proposal really is, is a, we consider it to be a very modest incremental change to our existing ordinance, which has um, been approved previously by the Coastal Commission. Our goal here really is to improve the efficiency of parking while maintaining adequate on-street parking resources. We, we believe we've struck that balance um, with what we're proposing. Um, and I do mention, we mentioned in the staff report, and I'll just give a little bit of context for this. Um, coastal zone parcels do tend to be smaller. And so um, we, specifically with this um, change made to the, about the number of bedrooms and the parking that's required for more bedrooms, we think those four bedroom and larger three bedroom and larger homes are less likely to be built in the coastal zone because the parcels are smaller. The, the parcels just simply can't accommodate that much um, building area. Um, and we actually, we had GIS, uh, our GIS department run the numbers and um, it's a little bit over a thousand square feet or it's about 1300 square foot difference between um, the non, the parcel, average parcel size and medium parcel size, I'm sorry, medium parcel size in the non-coastal area versus in the coastal zone. So coastal parcels are um, right around 5,600 square feet median and non-coastal parcels are um, 6,900 median right around out. Um, so, and I'll just, the Coastal Commission approval governs how the, when these, um, this proposal would go into effect inside the coastal zone. They're of course interested in ensuring that there is adequate street parking for visitors that are coming to the coast. We know that Santa Cruz has, you know, the best beaches in the state arguably, and we get a lot of visitors and um, they need street parking, you know, in order to be able to access the coast. And that is the, um, mission of the Coastal Commission, and that's the point of view they bring to all of their reviews. So we have been working with staff and discussing with them um, why we believe this is, you know, an appropriate action to take in all parts of the city. Um, and we'll have to wait for their commission to take formal action before it can take effect inside the coastal zone. So with that, our staff recommendation is that we introduce for publication an ordinance including the proposed amendments, including that one I read in, I have provided that to the city clerk, to the Santa Cruz Municipal Code relating to parking regulations as recommended by planning commission and planning staff, and then direct the staff to submit the proposed amendments to the California Coastal Commission for review following the second reading. And with that, um, we're available for any questions. We have some public work staff um, on the line as well to help answering questions. And Mayor, if I could um, make one clarification. Sarah, I believe, thank you for that presentation. I believe that you mentioned the um, guest parking is triggered at any multifamily. Um, the way that we have it worded is that it kicks in for five plus units. Oh, pardon me, I misspoke, yes. So I just want to make sure the council was clear on that. Five plus units. So it would not apply to a duplex, triplex, or fourplex. Those would be parked at the ratio mentioned. Thank you for noticing that. I apologize. Hey, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, looks like council member Golder, do you have a question? I do. Uh, first, I want to thank you guys for your work on this. I've been thinking about this for couple decades, I feel like now that garages seem slightly archaic as um, our housing problems um, arise, it seems that the easiest infill would be the conversion of garages to living space, bedrooms or ADUs. So I'm super excited about this. I did have one question. Um, a few weeks back, we would, I don't remember exactly when we were talking about like this mid like mid-density housing, so duplexes, triplexes, things like this. Am I to understand, so let's say there's a duplex or triplex and it's, let's say it's each unit is two bedrooms, so then there's six bedrooms in a triplex, let's say. So then do they need the two parking spaces or would that be six parking spaces? The per unit or per bedroom? I'm just confused a little on that. Sure. It's per bedroom, yeah. So each of those two bedroom units would be required to have two parking spaces. So, so they would need six parking spaces for a triplex with two bedroom units. Two bedroom. That's right. Thank you. Councilmember Brown. I 
think that uh, for the most part, uh, Council Member Golder's question covered my uh, question. I do, I guess I have one other question though, uh, and that's related to the community input that you received because I think those are um, pretty spot on in terms of the, um, the observations and concerns and questions that have been raised. And so I'm wondering um, if there's any attention to move forward with consideration of those geographic kind of distinctions among you know different neighborhoods because i think there are neighborhoods where this is going to have a much bigger impact um, potentially so um, i'm just wondering how you're intending to track that or follow up on that um, but i also do want to say while i have the floor i'll say thank you for all of your work on this uh, you know we as part of the housing blueprint subcommittee we talked about this quite a bit i'm glad to see the changes coming um, but I do want to try to mitigate the um, you know, people's fears about what might happen here. Um, and so if you could just, you know, anything about that would be helpful. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so first of all, um, all of these, all of the parking ratios, let's just provide in context for folks who maybe don't think about this all the time. Um, these apply as new development happens, right? So this is not going in and you know requiring anyone to remove any existing parking space if they're currently over parked. I'll also just mention, um, with the exception of very large commercial projects, pretty much most projects are welcome to provide as much parking as they think is necessary. So um, none of these would limit the amount of parking that we you know would allow a project to include. Um, and typically residential developers are, are quite sensitive to the way that that affects the um, attractiveness of their projects. And um, that wasn't your question. Your question was, how are we gonna get to um, geographic standards? So the work that we're doing on um, the multifamily zoning standards, I think we'll start to touch on that. Um, I don't know that it will get as fine grained as potentially um, you know, we could get and, and you know, as someone who drives and parks in the city, there can be a really big difference just from one block to the next. Um, so I don't know that we'll get quite to that level, but I think we will start that conversation. And um, this is something that we've sort of, you know, taken in hand and we've you know, mentioned and discussed with the um, Public Works Department as well. So it's gonna be a matter of, um, you know, prioritizing, right? And prioritizing um, the work plans for the various departments. Thank you. But it will be part of the conversation. Yes. Yeah. yeah that's great. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from council members, or maybe we can move on to public comment? Okay. If there's no further discussion, um, if members of the public would like to call in on this item, which is item number 22, amendments to parking regulations for residential and non-residential residential. residential Reg parking regula regulations for residential and non-residential property. Now's the time to call in. Uh, once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone. Um, and once you've been asked to unmute, you will be given two minutes to comment on this item. Hey all, thank you. This is Kyle Kelly. Uh, I just want to call in favor of removing parking requirements, especially unbundling parking. Um, It'll lead to much more affordable housing, uh, little, lowercase a, <laughs> affordable, uh, because people won't have to pay for that parking, but more especially as far as climate action is concerned, uh, basically remove the incentive where people just keep going on with car culture because it's there and because it's what we have. And, and we somehow have to start undoing it. And many people do want to go without cars. I myself am the same. And I'm hoping that maybe we can we can really go to a new future with less parking, more walking, more biking. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other members of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item? Now is the time to call in. Once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you'll be given two minutes. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Rick Longinati, and I'm not sure if uh, 
if Bonnie has my slideshow available. Yep, I, uh, we received your email, and I'll ask if, Bonnie, do you have the slides? And I know you have you requested additional time, so we'll honor that request. Thank you. Bonnie, do you happen to have his slides? I'm getting it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, while we're waiting for Bonnie, I just want to thank the staff for putting together a good presentation and, and, a, and an argument in favor of reducing parking requirements. Uh, I think it's uh, an important step forward towards uh, housing affordability and also uh, reduced car ownership. <clears throat> and I think that one important, most important thing before you today is the uh, legalization of uh, or the removal of the uh, covered uh, parking requirement. Uh, which will allow bedrooms to go into garages. I think that is really a sleeper. It could be a, a big boon for housing more people with you know, pretty low cost way to, to increase our housing supply. <clears throat> so you have your um, slides. Okay, so Bonnie, Ready. I'll tell you when to advance them because I'm, uh, I'm not able to do that. Um, so you could advance to the next slide, Bonnie. Um, the, Second slide here, it shows that uh, there were parking counts by students of Professor Adam Millard Ball from UCSC. They went around to different uh, apartment complexes and they found uh, a good third of these parking spots empty during the middle of the night, uh, which shows really that our parking requirements have produced a surplus of, of parking. Next slide, please. So what's wrong with uh, requiring more parking than we need? Next slide. Well, it has consequences. It uh, is an incentive to build luxury housing because we have high parking requirements. That's the only kind of housing that will get built, really. Uh, it's an incentive to more driving. Next slide. Um, we uh, burden renter households because uh, these same students of Millard Ball, they went through census data. They found that 55% of rental households own one car or less. And yet, uh, next slide, our two-bedroom apartments require two parking spaces. And that's, uh, that's the existing code requirements. They're not changing as a result of these recommendations. So what we're doing is we're requiring renters to pay for more parking than they, don't, than they use. Next slide, please. So my request would be to ask staff to bring back more extensive changes to the parking code, starting with the downtown. Uh, next slide. And why downtown? Because we already have protection from spillover parking. Uh, overnight parking you can't do in the neighborhoods unless you have a permit. Next slide. Um, there are many communities around the country that remove parking minimums altogether. Uh, and uh, this proposal that you have before you today doesn't remove them. It just reduces them very slightly, actually. Next slide, please. So good question would be, won't developers pocket the savings from lower parking requirements? And yes, indeed, they will, unless there's a way to pass the savings on to the resident. Uh, next slide. And that savings would be uh, unbundling, which uh, has been in the, you know, in the discussion for a very long time, require new development to separate the cost of parking from the cost of building or lease space, thereby making the cost of purchasing parking real to the purchaser. Next slide. So we've, we know from empirical studies that it lowers housing costs and it lowers vehicle ownership. Next slide. Um, here's an example of a building in Berkeley where there's unbundled parking. There's 237 adults living there with just 20 cars living there. Next slide, please. Um, we in Santa Cruz require, uh, we've required the Pacific Shores apartments to supply every resident with a bus pass. We could do that with downtown for any new development. Next slide. And uh, we could also ask private developers to exercise the local workforce preference to give local workers first, first choice. Uh, we can require that of any uh, project that has city money in it. Um, and Santa Barbara is a good example. And we've already done that with the Tannery Arts building, local artist preference. Next slide. Last slide is, is my request to, uh, since this is a very modest proposal today, but a, a, a step in the right direction, to ask staff to return with a more ambitious parking proposal for downtown. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, next caller.
Hello? Hello. Hi, sorry. Um, yes, um, my name is Candace Brown, and I live in East Morrissey. I'm also on the Transportation Public Works Commission. Um, my concern is on a couple fronts. Um, I can't find the uh, language on the tandem parking, so I'm sort of going off what uh, was said just now. But if that's done on every project throughout the city, um, I think that that should be thought through a little bit more carefully. Um, the only time that I've seen an exception where tandem parking was allowed was where there was an office um, facility, very small, where they could coordinate the parking in and out of those tandem spots. Um, you know, 56% of our housing is for renters. Um, they are not family members, and they may not be able to coordinate, as you might think, efficiently parking in tandem situations. So to do that ubiquitously across the city, I think you would need to put some language around it or be a little bit more thoughtful about just doing that unilaterally. Um, I'm also very concerned um, that you've just stated you're going to put into the record something for consideration without proper notice or uh, 72 notice for the public when it comes to mechanical devices. Um, as mentioned, these are typically found in very luxury environments and very urban settings, and they're usually managed with valet parking. Uh, what's being proposed on Ocean Street at 908 Ocean Street could have hundreds of units in racks, and they would be unattended, and it's not really clear how that would be as far as safety concerns. Um, and so I think that needs to not only be thought through very carefully, but be completely separate consideration because it's quite involved in its consideration. Also, if you strip out covered parking, then you're essentially saying these mechanical devices could be in a surface lot because you're removing covered parking. So um, a developer could read that to me, well, I don't even have to have my racks now in a covered parking area. I guess I've run out of time, but thank you for the consideration of this. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. While we're waiting on our next speaker to unmute their device, if anyone else would like to speak to us on item um, number 22, which is an amendment to parking regulations, now is the time to call in. Please press star nine once you've called in to raise your hand, and you'll be asked to be unmuted. And once you unmute your phone, you'll be given two minutes. So if the last four digits of your phone number are 1361, uh, you're being asked to unmute your phone. I'm going to move on to the next caller because this individual um, is look like they're unmuting their phone. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Kelsey Hill. I'm a candidate for Santa Fe City Council. I want to express my gratitude for staff for putting this together, um, and I'll keep it short. I just want to encourage council to move forward with the matter of unbundling parking. I know many families that are one-car households. I belong to one myself. And one of the most effective things we can do to simultaneously increase access to affordable housing while also acting on climate is reducing the requirements around parking for renters. As an environmentally forward city, I think unbundling is a great low-impact step toward a carbon-neutral uh, future for our community. So thanks for your time. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. So again, if the last four digits of your phone number are 1361, you're being requested to unmute your device.
Hello, am I unmuted? Yes, good afternoon. Wonderful. This is Jim Weller calling in. Uh, I'm calling in to say that I applaud these, uh, these changes. I think that these kinds of uh, changes in parking requirements will go a long way to uh, aiding in the feasibility of new affordable housing projects, uh, particularly multifamily projects. And um, from a personal perspective, since I'm now an accidental developer leading my church's uh, multifamily housing project in development, uh, this will help us a lot in creating uh, the financial capacity for affordability, which we uh, aim to achieve. So I just want to say thank you, and I hope the City Council approves this proposal. And thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, seeing no further uh, members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, I'm going to bring it, bring it back to Council for action deliberation. Council Member Byers. Oh, and Catherine, you're muted. Um, with um, not waiting for this, moving forward uh, and not waiting for the Coastal Commission uh, weighing in, or not weighing in, but yes, I guess looking. Uh, for those neighborhoods who would intersect with the Coastal Commission, that is maybe one side of the street is and one side isn't, do, I'm, I'm just, well, do you think there'll be any issue there or impact that one side of the street may have the burden where the other side won't have? Um, well, so first let me let me say we do anticipate that these uh, this proposal will eventually be approved by the Coastal Commission. Okay. Um, our current experience with them, though, is that um, sometimes that can take several months, even up to a year. Um, yes. So, and still, that is a, a limited period of time. We're not talking about these not taking effect inside the coastal zone. So, given the pace of development and the modest nature of these change, changes, uh, I I don't have that concern. Okay, that's all I need to hear. Thank you. Thank. That's all, Mayor. Okay. Councilmember Matthews. Thanks. Um, I'm supportive of this. I want to thank the staff uh, for this approach. As, as has been mentioned, basically incremental um, some cleanup, some consistency, but also incorporating some current thinking, doing away with the covered garage requirement and um, some of the other um, changes. There are going to be impacts, and uh, I am particularly interested in pursuing the geographical impact issue because. And when you just think about the different parts of town, in some places they're already unparkable <laughs> for the people who live there. And further changes um, can make them even more so. Um, whether it's um, areas that have a whole lot of student households close together or um, the older neighborhoods particularly where there are um, sometimes no parking facilities whatsoever. I mean, I think we're all familiar with this. So. Um, I, I very much favor the um, uh, quick look at the geographical impact and, and perhaps some flexibility in there. Um, my understanding on reducing the required parking for multifamily is that it could be up to 35% uh, reduction in the impact of having the head nod. <laughs> um, and a, a case would have to be made that that those reductions at any level are earned. Um, regarding bike parking, I think, um, and maybe this is in the detail you're talking about, um, I think it should be secure bike parking because, you know, we all know a lot of people that have bikes. Unsecure bike parking is of no interest to them because their bike disappears. Mm. Um, that's something to consider. Um, another issue having to do with the unbundling for multifamily is, I mean, I, I looked at that slide that was put up there. Oh, you can have parking for two and a quarter a month. Well, my gosh, I get a parking permit for my street for $30 a year. I, I could easily say, I'll pass on the parking <laughs> provided on site. I'm just going to get a $30 parking permit. Um, and, you know, <laughs> so, and I seem to recall in the past, and maybe the planners can remember this, 
specifically on the east side, approving, I think, the planned development where the residents of those developments, because the parking was reduced because of the um, say, environmental interest in doing that, um, the residents in those units were ineligible for neighborhood parking permits. So uh, again, I don't want to I don't want to try and massage this thing to death, but you can see how it, it, the game can be played. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I, if I'd like to respond, may I respond? Sure. Um, so let's just, so with the unbundled parking, I think it's actually worth taking a little bit of a look at it. So I'm gonna share my screen. This is page 17 to 18 of the clean ordinance. Um, so this blue highlighted text is the unbundled parking. And um, I just wanna point out that this They're is on. only, Oh, we can't, we can't see your screen. Oh, and share. There now? We go. Okay. Yep. Got to hit all the right buttons. Okay, not just half of them. So this highlighted, this blue highlighted section is the unbundling section of the code. So I just want to point out that this is um, limiting the areas where unbundling would be permitted to places where there are controls on the street parking within... 500 feet walking distance of an entrance to the site. So that means there are either meters on the street, there's colored curbs, or there's a residential permit parking program and residents of the new development are ineligible for purchasing those permits. So um, that in order for unbundling to really work and be effective, you're absolutely right. The cost of parking your car on site has to be the lowest cost of parking your car. Um, if it's really going to be effective at reducing, you know, potentially demand for vehicles and then also really mitigating um, off-site effects of folks parking. So we think that 500 feet is a, signif is a sufficiently discouraging distance to have to walk um, that folks would prefer to pay for parking on site. That's our recommendation. Cynthia, you're muted. <laughs> also, uh, Cynthia, I'm, um, Bonnie was reaching out. It sounds like there might be some issues with your sound, so I don't know if there's a window open or if you can speak closer, but it sounds oh, like. Okay. Is this better? I am on cell phone, so I'm trying to do it right. Mm -hmm. Is this better? Sounds good on my end. Cynthia, okay. do you have a window? Is there a window open? Or background noise? Gosh, shouldn't be. Okay. Huh. Well. I can try to mute other say. council members in case maybe there's feedback coming through other microphones. So. From someone else, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the overall direction makes sense. I want to thank the work that's gone into it. We do have a second reading, you know, upon closer examination of certain issues, we may see things that need further tweaking. Um, but overall, it's a good direction. I think there will be more impact. I would, I would also say regarding on the um, transit access, um, I think if you look at big trends, big national trends, the, um, the tie-in of reduction for parking related to transit, closeness to transit, makes sense if there's a really robust transit system. And we don't have that here. Uh, I sit on the Metro board and I know how hard we are trying to just maintain core services. Um, we do not have something like a, a trolley system or a Metro system that takes you anywhere in the world every 15 minutes. So let's try and be realistic when we do transit-oriented development Let's just put it in the Santa Cruz context. So that's my final comment on that one. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I just like to thank the staff for bringing this forward. I do. I am curious, though. You know, around the unbundling. Um, I know that there's been some concern that was brought up, and maybe you can speak to this a little bit better, a little bit more. But I think one of the concerns that I have is that. Um, you know, there's this unbundling of parking, but how do you ensure that by unbundling the parking that actually leads to a lower rent 
mm-hmm. because I can just see that people are going to, you know, charge whatever, you know, whatever the market will bear for that. And then in addition to that, if you want parking, you pay, you know, more than that. But let's say those units are like 30 years old. You know, is there any mechanism that can allow for, you know, ensuring that when you unbundle the parking from those units that you're actually, that there is a savings onto the resident rather than someone just saying, okay, well, now we're going to charge an additional higher cost for for parking. So I don't know what, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I have some thoughts. I'm going to um, invite the planning director to step in as he sees fit as well. So, um, I mean, I think that's a fair point. And I, I also think that um, renters have options. And if you are comparing to otherwise equal units and one of them is going to require you to pay for parking you don't need um, and the other one is not, that's a choice that you get to make as a renter. Um, and, uh, you know, the evidence that we have from other places is that the market largely takes care of that and folks aren't willing to pay as much for, a, you know, an apartment and an unbundled parking space than they as they are for um, just an apartment and the parking space that they need all in one number. So I think largely we're expecting the market to regulate that. I don't know that there's a great mechanism for, you know, requiring rent at a certain level, the cost of parking at a certain level, um, that starts to get a little bit sticky. Um, and, you know, as I, I think Mr. Longinati showed some, you know, recent effects of allowing that unbundling and the change that it made in the cost. Um, and, and those, bear out the research across the nation sort of bears that out that there is a, a difference in in price and that it's um largely managed by the market okay. and just to further add one thing uh this is matt benoit principal planner uh sarah was talking specifically about market rate projects and uh in regards to affordable pro- affordable restricted projects there, there would be ways to control the pricing of uh, unbundled parking. So I guess just to kind of build on that then, so for example, you know, like right now it seems like parking with apartments is, is all kind of bundled. And so for some folks, you know, you rent a unit and you kind of just work out the parking with the rest of the people who you share that unit with or you're assigned a parking spot. If now there's the potential to unbundle, I mean, could potentially someone who's currently renting and that has a parking spot could then their landlord say, okay, if you would like to have parking, you now need to pay an additional 200, you know, let's say dollars a month or what have you, or like how would that, I guess, I know this is kind of nitpicky, but I'm just thinking about people who are who yeah. currently have parking, who are, have an apartment, we pass this, and then they say, well, we'll charge you, you know, another X amount for that parking. And if you don't want that parking, then we won't charge you for it. So mm-hmm. I was wondering, like. Yeah, very good question. Thank you for that. So um, the property owner would have to apply for a permit from the city in order to have have that option. They would have to be applying for a permit, a, 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 parking, a parking plan for their project. Um, and they would be making this proposal. We want to unbundle the parking. Typically, they would do that because they're seeking a reduction in the number of parking spaces. So for existing projects, um, the benefit is like it's a little bit murky. You know, they're not, if they already have the parking and they already have the units, like they're not going to be reducing the number of parking spaces, but perhaps they're viewing this as a potential revenue stream and they just want to go ahead and unbundle the parking. So fair enough. Um, We would have to review that um, and then um you know it could the the requirements of that would have to exist in the neighborhood so there would have to be controls on the street parking there would have to be um you know something that would um limit the options of folks living in the unit to be able to park on the street if that if they opt not to pay for um the unbundled parking space um and then potentially that could happen. And it would be, you know, again, a matter of like, what's that unit worth to you if you now, you own a car or even two cars and now all of a sudden you can't park or you can't afford to park both of them on the property. Um, you know, again, I think landlords and, and tenants are gonna 
kind of have to figure out how to balance those different desires. Um, Lee, do you have any thoughts? You jumped in, like maybe you had some thoughts. Thanks, yes. Um, <clears throat> so Sarah was kind of getting the um, issue correctly when she was getting at um, this provision would actually allow for new development to have reduced parking by having unbundled parking if the certain criteria are being met. There is not a prohibition on unbundling parking right now. And so um, we have conditioned that in certain projects because of concerns of the neighborhood, for example, um, when there haven't been parking controls in close proximity. And that's one of the reasons why we put this um, limitation on um, uh, the parking controls within a 500 foot proximity is because, um, you know, if there's a free parking space right out on the street, then, um, you know, there's, it's not very likely that someone is gonna uh, pay to park um, on the property itself. But landlords can do this now. They, we don't have a, a condition that says, you know, you have to, you have to, um, assign these parking spaces to these individual units. We say, you have to have this number of parking spaces. And you, the landlords and the tenants work that out. And so, you know, they may be doing this right now, and there is not a permit that they would have to get from us for just doing that, um, unless we've, we've conditioned their project to not allow it. And then, um, it, if, if a redevelopment was occurring, that's when they would have to come in and through the permit process, um, they could seek a parking reduction to do that. And so that's part of that distinction there. Okay, that was helpful, thank you. And then I'll just state uh, before moving on, I, it's gonna be interesting to see how this all rolls out. I, I do have concerns that having spent a lot of time living in Beach Hill and in the beach flats where there's substantial parking issues, um, especially when you have you know, a lot of student residents and then you have certain times in the year when there are parking restrictions in place and then you just have, it's really, when it's really difficult to find parking. So I think that understanding the impacts on neighborhoods is really gonna be important as we're moving forward. Um, Council Member Brown. Yeah, once again, I think my question was pretty close to answered by uh, Mayor Cummings with Mayor Cummings' questions. Um, I, I just want to say say again that I I too have concerns about uh, the kind of unintended consequences potentially for, uh, in particular, for low income residents. Um, and so I I just want to make sure that we have a way to um, you know. To, to be tracking this, to be uh, you know taking it into consideration in as we move forward. I mean, Beach Hill and Beach Flats, absolutely, there are parts of the east side where I think this is really relevant, and the beach area um, along on the west side as well. Um, so I, I just I just want to because I think there are other tools we can use as well in tandem with this to try to get at those. Uh, potential challenges and um, you know and make it uh, you know more equitable uh, and uh, allow for that continued um, uh, well it's not really continued affordability but just to allow people who who uh, may need their cars and don't have the option of not um, having some access to parking near their homes um, if it's cost prohibitive for them then it's not really a choice anymore and I'm speaking in particular of tenants you know, the situation for tenants. So um, anyway, just to reiterate that concern and um, hope that we can hear back as this is implemented and um, see if there's other things we can do to help make it a smooth transition. Okay, are there any other comments by council members? Hearing none, I'd like to see if maybe a council member be, would be willing to make a motion uh, so we can continue moving forward with our meeting. Council member Matthews. And you're muted. Thank you. Um, I will go ahead and make the recommendation before us and uh, get the language specifically, introducing for publication the ordinance, including the proposed amendment, et cetera, and directing staff to submit the proposed amendment to the California Coastal Commission for review following the second reading. Okay. 
Uh, Vice Mayor Myers, I see your hand raised. I'll, I'll second that motion. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews to move the staff recommendation, uh, seconded by Vice Mayor Myers. There's no further questions or comments from council members. I'd like to call on the clerk to call the roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Um, Thank you to our planning staff for bringing this forward. And um, with that, I'd like to see if we can take maybe a five minute break uh, and reconvene at 2.20.
Okay, once council members are back, if you could just turn on your videos, uh, we can go ahead and get started again. Councilmember Matthews, I want to just check uh, while other council members are joining on. Uh, Bonnie, can you check and see if her audio is better? Maybe you can speak into your mic, Cynthia. Okay, this is a test. I'm connected by my cell phone. Is that any better? There's I mean, just some, there's just Cynthia, there's just almost like a, a background noise, like you're we you have a window open with a lot of traffic going by or something. I I just don't understand that at all. Because I'm in my study. I It's a mystery to me. Well, it, okay, yeah, I don't. Should I switch to um, computer audio and see if that's any better? It's usually not. Um, go ahead and okay, try now, to. Now, now I'm on the computer audio. Is that better? Can you talk? I am talking now. You're not getting it? I am now. Um, but it, there's still the background noise, but it doesn't matter. It's both audio sources have that same background noise, so I don't know. Hmm. I'll try and speak clearly and close to the source and troubleshoot this separately. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand it. Yeah, I think that's probably our best way to move forward at this time okay. so okay um it looks like we're just missing Catherine at the moment so council member Byers, um if you could turn your video back on The other thing that occurs to me is that, as I mentioned, my internet is down completely. Cruise IO is kaput. So that could be part of the problem today. Yeah. Councilmember Byers, hopefully we can all um, get started again in the next minute or so. So we'll give it like one more minute and I think we're just gonna have to keep going and hopefully council member buyers will join us again in a sec. Um, let's, I'll give her one more minute though to join. Why don't we go ahead and uh, and just get started with the presentation, and hopefully our colleagues can join us without missing too much. So the next, I'm sure item, the, yeah. Oh, 
Yes. Go Sorry for about it. that. So the next Sorry, item man. on our agenda is the 2020 Regional Early Action Plan, the REAP State Planning Grant application. Um, this item will be presented by Principal Planner Matt Von Waugh. Uh, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this, is an action, if this is an item you would like to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation by staff who brought the item forward, followed by questions from council. We will later take public comment and return to council for action and deliberation. And with that, I will turn it over to Principal Planner Matt Von Waugh. Sounds good. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council. Let me bring up the presentation here. All right, so today we're talking about the 2020 Regional Early Action Planning Grant Program. Um, and as a state application, it, I'll refer to it as REAP from now on, R-E-A-P. And just for some background on this, uh, the state has approved a series of grants uh, very recently, uh, all, all directed towards uh, supporting housing production in cities across California. And so recently we had the SB2 grant, which we're funding the Objective Standards Project with. Uh, and then just in May, we also took the LEAP grant, uh, which, was, which we're directing funds towards the housing element update primarily. And the LEAP grant is very similar to the REAP grant. The LEAP grant is the local early action planning grant. And then this is the regional early action planning grant. Uh, the only real difference there is that the, the regional uh, part of this really refers to uh, the, association, the association of, Bay Area, of uh, uh, Monterey Bay Area governments administering the grant versus the state itself. And again, the, the main requirement for these grants is really to show that they're supporting housing production in some way. And so the, the REAP grant itself is non-competitive and the city of Santa Cruz is eligible for uh, $300,000 for that funding. And like I said, it's administered by AMBAG and the application is due in a few weeks at the end of October here. And the grant project itself, uh, in regards to really uh, figuring out a way to support housing development in the city. We thought a lot about uh, the project being uh, expanding the downtown plan boundaries. And really the main reason for that is that we've seen lots of success uh, given the, the recent 2017 amendments to the downtown plan, increasing some of those development standards. And we've seen how much that has spurred housing development in the area. And we really feel like there's there's opportunities uh, adjacent to downtown that might also see that same kind of success if we expand those plan boundaries. Uh, and again, this is very early and we don't have defined boundaries by any means. We're really seeking to explore areas southwest and north of downtown, uh, but staff feels especially strongly about the opportunities uh, south of downtown and the south of Laurel area. And this would certainly have a, a public process to determine this boundary, uh, as well as a, a further council meeting to, to get additional uh, feedback and buy-in on that boundary. And then really once we have had that boundary in place, that's when we would bring on a consultant uh, to really do uh, all the other work involved in, in expanding that plan. So this again is very early and it's really just a, a grant application at this point. So there's gonna be a lot more opportunity for, for input and engagement in the future on this, on this project. And I'll also point out too that uh, a few other important, uh, important areas of uh, coordination are the parking district and whether that will expand uh, as well as the beach and south of Laurel plan, uh, those, those two, uh, could be impacted by the expansion of the downtown uh, and we would certainly be coordinating further on those and, and how those would work together with the, the with the downtown plan expansion and then of course the the grant too would also cover uh, the sequel clearance needed for any expansion of the downtown plan and so with that uh, staff recommends uh, uh, the authorizing the city manager or his designee uh, to submit an application to AMBAG for the replanning grant. And this concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. 
All right, thank you very much for that presentation. Are there any questions um, from council members on this presentation and the item before us? Council Member Brown. Yeah, thank you for the uh, presentation and support uh, moving forward with this grant opportunity. I heard about it and I think I asked about it at our last council meeting or the budget uh, session. And so I'm glad to see us moving forward. I do have a question though about, because it, you know, every at this point, it, I understand it's a grant proposal. It's, uh, you know, it, there is some flexibility in how the money is spent and all of that. Um, and it's pretty wide ranging, but I am just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the community input portion of this. I, you know, I raise this because I think that um, if those of us who are around long enough to remember 1998 and the, the beach area plan and South of Laurel plan uh, know that uh, there was significant community uh, outcry about that and a concern that there had, that people had not, that the council and leadership had not been listening to the public. So I just wanna try to understand um, what that, you know, public input, if there's a format or if you have a plan at this point or even conceptually, how that will go. I think that the concerns over gentrification in the downtown um, are, uh, you know, there will be just as important for folks uh, south of Laurel and uh, towards the beach area. So I, I just wanna um, try to get a sense of, you know, how we are going to include the public, how are we going to make them feel included in the decision-making around this and, um, you know, kind of, you know, it's, it, it's the potential extension of the, the downtown area, uh, I think makes sense in a lot of ways. Um, and you say that there are, way, there are possibilities for doing that at the north and south ends of the, of the downtown. But this agenda report we've received and we don't have the application that is an actual proposal, which I imagine if you're anything like me, those proposals end up happening, <laughs> being finished right before they're due. But uh, it would be helpful to um, see, uh, to hear more about that because I think, you know, saying that we may expand the downtown boundary, but then primarily focusing in on uh, the beach area south of Laurel uh, in the agenda report suggests that that's, that's where we're headed. So again, um, I, I just want to, I want the public to feel like they actually are going to have a say in this, I guess. And so I'm wondering if you could talk more about that. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you, Council Member Brown. Uh, you, you raise a lot of good points. There are sensitive areas very close to downtown as well that we want to be, uh, you know, thinking critically of as we go forward in this uh, expansion process. And uh, and really, with that, the the grant application itself is due soon, uh, but that typically takes up to six months to even see those funds. So there, it's conceptual at this point in terms of what our outreach would be, uh, but certainly in that time frame alone, there would be a community meeting process, uh, you know, several even depending on what we're hearing from the community, uh, as well as further council buy-in uh, prior to any decisions being made. Um, and, and that's at the very minimum. You know, we, we see this certainly as we're working closely with these communities and, uh, and having community meetings uh, to really fine tune, uh, not just what those boundaries are, but also the areas that we have to be more sensitive to and, and going into, the, and into that expansion, knowing that they might not have the same development standards as, as other areas of the plan. So there's, that can be, there's gonna be that level of fine tuning as well that we'll be working on prior to formally starting the process with the consultant. And then the consultant process would be fine, fine tuning those details even further with the community in terms of what those development standards are and adjacencies and things like that. Um, so we don't have a specific uh, a community outreach and engagement plan yet, but it's certainly something we're gonna be uh, working closely on going forward prior to even receiving the grant and and once we get the grant funding as well, uh, moving forward with that, both before the consultant and with the consultant. Thank you. So can I just ask a quick follow up? Uh, in terms of when do you anticipate, and maybe it was in here and I just missed it, um, anticipate hearing back about this grant? Um, I know it does take time, but is there a 
some sense when we'll know about the funding? Yeah, we've, we've already been coordinating closely with AMBAG on this, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure how quickly they'll move because they're administrating, uh, administering the grant from the state. So we're applying to AMBAG and then AMBAG will be working with the state. Um, for our LEAP grant, for instance, which we applied for back in June, uh, we have not heard back from the state yet on that funding. We've received updates that our application is being looked at, uh, but g given that time frame right now, it seems to be about six months out before we before we get approved from the state. So, based on that, it, it might be a similar time frame for this grant application as well. Thanks, Vice Mayor Myers. Uh, yeah, thank you for the uh, presentation. And um, yeah, I just have a couple of questions um, regarding, I guess, just sort of the decision process that planning um, has gone through just with rec with regards to sort of how to utilize these funds. So my understanding is that I believe in two or three years, I can't remember which, but we're, we're, we're um, were to begin our regional housing needs and housing um, uh, housing amendment update, right for the for the general plan in the next two two years, I think it is. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, twenty twenty three. So this the work that you do here obviously will play into that overall city analysis in terms of the various sort of districts that we're looking at for for producing housing in. and 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 am i correct in that that the analysis that would be done through this grant um would it be specific to a certain kind of housing or would you be looking at all types of housing so in other words um you know would this grant help us understand um you know very affordable, you know, low income to, you know, median income or workforce types of housing, or is it specific to, to you know, market rate housing? I'm just trying to get a sense of what, what the analysis can include. We, yeah, we don't have specific details on, on what that expansion would be like. We, we've just seen that, you know, the increase in development standards and, and uh, capacities for housing and, and office space in the current downtown area through that 2017 process have, yield, have yielded positive results. And this is just at the very beginning of that process where we think there are areas uh, near downtown that could yield some more successes. Um, so I, we haven't gotten into the details yet of what kind of housing that would be or what percentages of affordable we're looking at and things like that. Um, but, but we do see, you know, uh, a process of fine tuning those as we go forward and, and learning more about what the community wants and what we think can happen in that area and uh, working more closely through the engagement process. Yeah, it would seem, uh, that's good, great to hear. It would seem that um, with our arena goals um, still hopefully in reach within some of the affordability um, affordable um, projects we've, we're lining up, um, it seems like this might be a timely way to sort of tie a, a number of different efforts together um, and, and certainly having uh, the availability of a sizable grant to do all of that would seem to be very efficient and uh, helpful to, for the community to understand all the pieces coming together. So um, thank you, That's my, those were my questions. Okay. Are there any other questions from council members at this time? Hearing none, I'll open it up to members of the public. So are there any members of the public who would like to speak to us on item number 23, which is the 2020 Regional Early Action Planning State Planning Grant application? Now is the time to call in. Uh, once you've called in using the numbers on your screen, you'll want to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And once you've been acknowledged, you'll be asked to unmute your phone and you'll have two minutes to speak.
Okay, so this will, this will be the last call. If you've called in and you'd like to comment on item number 23 on our agenda, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will have two minutes to speak. Okay, seeing no members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, I'll bring it back to council for action deliberation. And I'll just say that I feel like a lot of the um, questions that I had were asked by my colleagues. And so it's really good to hear that um, you know, there will be an opportunity for the public to weigh in and to provide feedback as we're moving forward as it relates to the expansion of the downtown zone, if that's um, considered to be appropriate by the community. And so with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Vice Mayor Myers and then Council Member Brown, Council Member Matthews. Yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, move the item. Um, it's on the staff recommendation, which is uh, to move a resolution directing staff to submit an application to the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments for the State of California Regional Early Action Planning Grant Program to contribute funding towards the project to expand the boundaries of the city's downtown plan. Okay. So the motion by um, Vice Mayor Myers, Council Member Brown, I just want to acknowledge I saw your hand up next. So. Uh, I will second that and ask the maker of the motion if he would be willing to include in the direction uh, report back. The reason I was asking about timing for hearing about the grant was to try to get a sense of when would be an appropriate time for a progress report from the planning staff. And so I'm just, uh, you know, thinking that um, based on what I heard, um, you know, a report back in January of 2021 about uh, planning, uh, you know, kind of the, some, some more detail around the planning. So I guess a progress report on downtown expansion planning efforts and uh, community input opportunities uh, it, by the second meeting in January. My understanding is we're voting on a we're voting on the grant directing the grant the grant application today. But just Council Member um, Brown, can you read off? I, I'm sorry, I didn't. It sounded like you're asking. It, the intent of the um, amendment is to sort of get a broader perspective on that area of downtown. Is that not a lie? Well, the intent is to get a progress report on uh, the. The planning, it, yes, the, the planning, but I'm asking about that because the grant explicitly is about, um, you know, it, it, it sounds like, at least I don't know, having not been able to, to look at the, the contents of a proposal, um, but from what I read in the agenda report that the, um, you know, the intention is to use these funds for that planning process, and so they are linked together in that way. Um, so I, I just want to, I'd like to hear more given that what we have is high level conceptual as, um, as Matt uh, kind of suggested in his presentation so that we can hear what, how this is going um, at the council level and the public can get an update, you know, at some point before, you know, too much time goes by and things start to um, get solidified. So it's really just the, the my most my it would be in addition to um, direct staff to return to the council with a progress report on uh, downtown expansion planning efforts. I'd like to leave it there, but I can say under the grant, you know, the grant if you want it to be connected directly there. But I, I just think that just getting a report because work is is all already clearly happening. It's going to happen. So. It's a progress report on downtown expansion planning efforts uh, by the second meeting in January. Seems like a reasonable time frame. I guess I'll, um, I, I'd like to just make sure it kind of understand from a, I guess, I, I don't know, is uh, Director, um, ED, Economic Development Director Bonnie Lipscomb and maybe Lee. I'm just, I'm just trying to understand um, sort of their availability to do that work um, to, to provide that that uh, progress plan. Do you mind if I just um, hear from staff real quick on that? Thanks. Um, thank you, Councilmember Brown and Councilmember Myers. Um, 
In terms of how much progress we've made by that point in time, um, given the other, you know, the objective standards push that we have, as well as the start of um, uh, the preparation for the housing element, which um, will be happening, you know, we'll be receiving that grant, um, as Matt mentioned, in the next couple of months, hopefully. Um, I don't know how much uh, progress will be made at that point. We can certainly report back to you and, and tell you, you know, our thought process at that point. Um, but we will absolutely be back in front of the council um, before um, any decisions are made. In fact, the council will be the ones making the decisions in terms of um, uh, hearing the community feedback that we have um, received and um, then the uh, recommendation that um, we would be making in terms of um, where to um, expand the downtown, um, be it south, north, um, or both, um, and um, at that point in time, um, you know, we would we would have more information. But we can we can certainly report back and just give you our initial thoughts if if that's what you're if that's what you're thinking. Um, I just don't know that we will have at that point actually engaged the community quite yet. I guess that's partly my point um, is that. Often things come to us um, once, you know, kind of after the fact, the process has occurred, whatever the process is that staff undertakes, and we get a recommendation to move forward on something that um, we may not necessarily have been tracking. And so I just feel like, have, I, again, I'm not asking for you to do a whole lot of extra work, um, but just to provide a progress report on where things are at with that planning process in relation to the, fund, the grant funding. Yeah, so. it's, it's something it, we can certainly do it. I, I'm, I just want to be upfront. I, I don't know that we'll have actually made a, a whole lot of progress in terms of actually doing anything, but we can uh, certainly articulate our thinking and share, you know, the application and the status of that if that's something that the council is interested in. And Bonnie, I don't know if there's any perspective. I know downtown is both planning, but there's economic development as well, and some of some of the efforts downtown. I don't know if you have any issues with or time constraints or what have you. I'm not sure if Bonnie's on today. Just clicking through to see if she's I'm on. I'm wondering, I see uh, her. She's, she's on, yeah. Yeah, um, remember. Go ahead, I'm sorry, Mayor. Uh, I was, I saw Council Member Matthews raise her hand, but if the, I don't know if, if Bonnie's not available, if there's somebody else from Economic development, we might be able to speak to that. If not, maybe we can hear we Councilor Matthews' have, comment. Yeah, okay. certainly. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Councilor my Matthews. Was, yeah, my thought was that, that um, Jan January report back might be a pretty high expectation given the issues that the planning director mentioned, but, but just including most and regular reports back to Council on the status of the um, uh, process. And um, I think that's what's intended is key check-in at critical points. And I'll just mention, I mean, I, I think that what it sounded like to me is just getting some info, information back on where this process is at because yeah. you just want to understand in January, where's the grant? Like what's kind of the thinking for moving forward? And I don't think it's asking for anything, you know, super detailed with key dates and you know who stake stakeholders are but just understanding where everything is at um given that it's what early october and hopefully mm -hmm. you know time has gone by that maybe we are going to receive the grant and there's some planning moving forward but that's kind of how i'm understanding it as well yeah if i can respond yeah i'm, I'm happy with uh, maybe we'll just provide um to um to try to come back by the second meeting in January just to give, I mean, there's there's holidays in there. Who knows what's gonna happen with COVID this winter. I think maybe let's just maybe give them as much time as possible. And um, I, I'm fine with accepting the amendment. Thank you. If, if I could just say one more thing about it, you know, I, I, I totally understand the concern and I, you know, and it's also a little bit awkward to kind of just guess you know, to a shot in the dark guess about when a good time would be for a report back. But I just find that if we don't have some 
deadline that um, sometimes it doesn't happen and it's totally understandable because there's a lot going on but I just feel like when there's a d date then we sort of um, are better able to track it that's the only reason why if there's a date that would be preferable for uh, director Butler or um, I don't know um, director let's come here that I'm happy with a, another date but I just want to make sure that we get something mayor if I could um, Perhaps um, just uh, if you're interested in getting an update prior to us um, engaging the community about um, where um, we may want to expand, we could provide an update to you um, in advance of, of rolling out that outreach effort. And so that way, if it's if it's March when we're doing that, we could provide it to you in February. Or, but um, it it keeps us from coming back and, and not having a whole lot of uh, work <laughs> that's done um, in the interim. So if that would be acceptable, then, I mean, that I think would work for us. I don't know if, if Matt had anything else or any other thoughts to add. Yeah, no, that, that sounds good to me too. I would support that. So if so. The, uh, the seconder would be amenable, um, can, we, can we put the, um, Potentially put the time frame to um, to prior to any to the community outreach um, component of described. Um, let's just say prior to the community outreach component regarding the uh, downtown uh, planning efforts, and that way sure. we've got a little bit of a we've got a we've got a goal there. Sort of we want to hear before that starts is is really the intent. The maker is the seconder. Okay with that. Absolutely, yeah. I think prior to initiating uh, community, the community outreach component, it's, that makes sense. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Council Member Matthews. I just want to say how excited I am to see this part moving forward. I think this is the, the logical next step of what we've been doing um, over time. Uh, I mean, I'm going back to the first downtown plan and the earthquake recovery plan and then the downtown um, plan revision more recently, um, our, our housing blueprint. Um, looking at the expansion of downtown, in fact, uh, of the uh, downtown boundaries was to some extent envisioned by the Puma project for the, as, as council members remember, the uh, consolidation and possible expansion of some of our assessment districts downtown for providing um, services. And unfortunately, we all know <laughs> history intervened and that, that project did not move forward, but the potential has always been there. We are beginning to see the revised downtown plan come forward. And um, there has been for decades really the desire to create a more robust connection between our downtown and the beach area and beach flats as well. And, and particularly for those who are concerned about affordable housing, this to me presents one of the real opportunities. We've seen some of our most significant um, affordable housing over the years occur in our downtown area, just off the top of my head. Um, Sycamore, Nueva Vista, uh, Pacific Station, phases one and two, the library master plan, riverfront at the north end. I mean, and by looking at what can happen in some of the, um, let's just call them opportunity sites in a possibly expanded downtown, uh, it's just a tremendous forward-looking opportunity. And we also talked relatively recently about the future of the Warriors in Santa Cruz, which is another part of this. So, um, I just see it as a, um, a wonderful opportunity to look to our future now. I'm very happy to support the motion. Okay. All right, if there's no further questions or comments, um, the motion we have before us is to adopt the staff recommendations. Uh, the motion was made by Vice Mayor Myers, seconded by Council Member Brown. And in addition to the motion to um, receive an update from staff prior to initiating community outreach efforts for the downtown planning effort. And so there's no further question or discussion. I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll call vote on the item. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. 
Holder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. So next item on our agenda is item number 24, public hearing for subdivision and zoning ordinance cleanup amendments. Uh, it's A20-0005, A20-0006. Presenters for this item, Catherine Donovan, Senior Planner and Principal Planner, Matthew Van Waugh. Uh, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you would like to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. You'll need to press star 9 on your phone to raise your hand, and once you've been acknowledged, you will be un asked to unmute your phone, and you'll be given two minutes to comment. And so with that, I'd like to um, pass, the, pass it over to our um, planning department for a presentation. Good afternoon. Um, this is Catherine Donovan with the Planning Division, and I am speaking from my office wearing a mask. I, I hope that you can hear me. Yep, we can hear you. Great. Okay, so um, this is the, the cleanup item. Um, we do these cleanup items. We try to do them annually, although we missed last year. Um, and the reason that we do them is that there are always a number of um, issues with the with our ordinances um, to keep them updated. We we want to keep them consistent with state law. We want to make sure that there is internal consistency within <coughs> the ordinance, um, and we also uh, want to improve and streamline our application processes, um, clarify the language and concepts in the ordinance and remove any redundancies. And then sometimes we just want to improve the ordinance itself um, as, as best practices are developed and as um, uh, general planning thought and cultural norms uh, change over time, sometimes there's a need to make changes to the ordinance to be consistent with what's happening in the real world. Um, this, this cleanup item includes uh, a, a large number of relatively minor changes, and so I'm not going to go over each and every one of them. Um, I'll mention some of the specific items, and I'm happy to address any particular items that you may have questions about. Um, the ordinance updates the subdivision ordinance to comply with changes in state law and also to um, allow the allow the city Catherine can you Catherine can you sorry to interrupt can you share your presentation are you not seeing it we're, we're not seeing it no okay let's try this again thanks trouble getting my zoom to open Catherine let me know if you want me to share it okay let me just try this one more time okay can you see it now Yes, we can see the screen. Okay. Okay. So now we get to the nitty gritty. Um, specific am amendments include um, updates to the subdivision ordinance, and those are both to um, bring the ordinance into compliance with changes in state law and also um, to allow the city. Um, if, an, if, an, if there is litigation over a subdivision map and the applicant requests that a stay um, during that litigation, 
it would allow the city to grant that stay for up to five years. Um, we're also uh, proposing revisions to the design permit findings. We currently have 16 design permit findings, which the, the generally cities have about five, four or five. So having to go through each of those findings for every design permit can slow the process down. Many of those findings are um, redundant because they're covered in other sections of either the zoning ordinance or, or other um, city requirements. And so we're basically just removing redundant uh, findings from the requirements. We, the ordinance would also um, allow the process for a half bath in an accessory structure without requiring a public hearing um, and also to remove the design permit requirements for structures or additions that are 120 square feet or less and 15 feet in height or less. Uh, one of the updates would be to update the home occupation standards. Um, they would allow one non-resident employee. We're increasing the number of trips per day that would be allowed and we're clarifying that employees working from home um, are not, they do not have a uh, home occupation unless they are independent contractors. But if they are actually employees, like when I'm working from home, that's not a home occupation. Um, other changes include uh, updating our density bonus ordinance. There's a uh, clause in the uh, state law that says that you can't require reports that the um, applicant is not, would not already do. Our density bonus ordinance requires a pro forma in certain circumstances. And so we've just added pro forma or other uh, documentation um, just to cover us in that case. Um, we're also making some changes to our latest revisions to our ADU ordinance um, the changes from last year that were approved in January of this year um, that went through the state, the state changes were uh, in some places were somewhat ambiguous or contradictory and our, we made the best interpretation we could, um, but when we sent our approved ordinance um, to the State Housing and Community Development Department, HDD, um, they had some differences of opinion of, on how to interpret those code sections. So we've worked with HDD to revise our ordinance and those revisions are in this, in this cleanup item. Um, we also currently have something called a hardship exemption for undergrounding utilities. There's a requirement that when you do development, that you underground your utilities. However, if there's, um, there's this hardship e exemption, but what we found is that the hardship exemption is so um, broad that it is um, undermining our, our, the, the requirement itself. And so what we're proposing is to replace that exemption with an in lieu fee, and that would allow, that fee would go into a fund and then um, the Public Works Department could use that fund to um, underground a whole neighborhood at a time, which, which they do um, occasionally do. We, would, we are also proposing to revise the standards for duplexes on corner lots in R1 districts, R15 districts. So that this is something that is currently allowed, but the um, standards we feel are, are, um, are don't always make a lot of sense, and so we've revo revised some of those standards. Um, and we are also um, proposing to expand the um, cannabis retailer hours. They're currently limited to 9 p.m and to go to 10 p.m. And this is something that we um, asked direction from council last year, and this was the direction council gave. And unfortunately, with 
everything that's happened in the past year. We were not able to bring this to you until this time. Um, and also, um, this was in the ordinance when we took it to the Planning Commission, but we realized that um, it would make sense to make an additional change to allow existing retailers to expand their hours automatically to 10 p.m. without the need to modify their use permits. And we checked carefully to make sure that um, all of those retailer use permits went, uh, currently allow the, the retailers to be open at um, 9 p.m. so that we wouldn't be um, expanding significantly, and, and that is the case. Oh, excuse me. Um, when I was reviewing this, the ordinance last night, getting ready to for, for this public hearing, I realized that um, there was an internal inconsistency that we had not caught, and this has to do with the, the parking ordinance that you just heard earlier today. Um, and that ordinance proposes some changes some, that would require an administrative use permit, and the language of the ordinance was that the administrative use permit would be um, at an administrative level and not require a public hearing. And that was included in one section of the ordinance, but there are actually two additional areas of the zoning ordinance that discuss when you need a public hearing for um, use permits. And so this, the proposed additions would um, make corrections to those additional uh, sections. One of them is section 2404090, and we, you can see in red what we're proposing to add, that it would just, um, the administrative use permit would not require a public hearing if it was a temporary use um, for variations to parking design requirements and the number of parking spaces and in half, bath, half baths and accessory structures. Um, so that is one of the changes. The other is in the section on administrative use permits where it states that an administrative use permit um, is required to have a public hearing except, again, if it's temporary for variations in parking design requirements and the number of spaces and for half baths and accessory structures. And I know and I, I just I just wanted to reiterate to Catherine uh, sure. that those that those changes uh, were are consistent with uh, the Planning Commission recommendation. Uh, Planning Commission supported that change in the one section that we presented to them, uh, and it was just merely uh, an additional cleanup that the, the same language needed to be added to these two other sections. Uh, so that that's the only change we're really making here. Thanks. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. All right, great. Thank you for that presentation, Catherine. Are there any council members who have questions at this moment in time? Okay. Uh, hearing none, I guess what we can do is uh, we can turn it over to members of the public. So if there are any members of the public who'd like to speak to us on item number 24, which is subdivision and zoning ordinance cleanup amendments, A20-0005 and A20-0006, now's the time to call in on, your, on this item. If you can call one of the numbers that you see on your screen, once you've dialed in, please press star nine on your phone, and you will have up to two minutes to comment on this item.
Okay, seeing no members of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item, I'd like to bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Um, and before we move forward, I just want to thank the staff for, um, you know, going through and finding all the tiny areas where we needed to just make adjustments and so that we're consistent uh, across the board. And I'm sure that it was a little tedious, but I uh, really appreciate the work that went into bringing these changes forward today. Okay. Council Member Matthews. Um, I'll go ahead and move the recommendation and want to second your appreciation for staff. I know one of the most frustrating things to applicants on any planning process is where the ordinances are unclear or in conflict, in conflict with one another. So uh, this may not be a sexy item, but it's um, definitely worth doing. Okay. So a motion by Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Watkins. Um, I will second that motion and echo uh, the comments of appreciation to our staff. Okay. So the motion by Council Member Matthews, seconded by Council Member Watkins, to move the uh, staff recommendations. It does look like there was one member of the public who raised their hand to comment on this item, so I'm going to open public comment um, in case it took a minute for them to call in. So um, I'll give it looks like there's only one member of the public, so I'll give them two minutes and that member of the public is gone. So. Maybe they were raising their hand on the next item, but it doesn't look like there's anyone who'd like to comment on this item. So with that, I will close public comment and then ask the clerk to please call the roll call vote on this item. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Byers. Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. So the next item on our agenda um, is item number 25 which is an item that's coming back to us regarding Felix Street. And I think uh, Council Member Matthews, um, I'll let you, I know you have some comments that you'd like to make before we begin this item. I think you're muted. We can't hear you. It doesn't, I'm not sure why we can't. I don't see your microphone muted, but we can't hear you. Council Member Matthews uh, has indicated that she's going to have to step away from the meeting uh, due to a conflict of interest on this item. Okay, so uh, the next item on our agenda is item number 21, public hearing for 101 Felix Street, consideration of resolution denying proposed general plan amendment. Uh, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, uh, followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and return to the council for deliberation and action. And I just want to note that um, given the amount of comment that we previously heard on this item, uh, public comment is being uh, ex will not exceed 30 minutes for this item. And there are a number of people who've called in asking for additional time, um, but we will hear the presentation from staff followed by questions from council, 30 minutes of public comment, and then action and deliberation on this item. <clears throat> so with that, I will turn it over to um, Ryan Bain, senior planner, for staff presentation on item number 25. Um, thank you, Mary Cummings. I just want to make sure that you guys can hear me. Yep, we can hear you. Great, I'll share my screen here. Okay, and you guys can see that? Yeah, it looks like it's presenter view, but um, but it, oh. it's coming through fine, so. Okay, not sure. 
change that or I'll leave it for now. It's fairly quick. You have, uh, Ryan, you should change it if you have notes. Oh, let's see. Uh, sharing your own. I think just stop share. Stop share. Okay. And then share screen. Yes, and share. Oh, there we go. That should be is that a little bit better uh, now? Yes. Okay. Great. Thanks. So, um, if you recall, um, at the August 25th uh, City Council meeting, the the council held a public hearing to preliminarily consider a proposed general plan amendment, local coastal plan amendment, um, and to, let me move this forward here if I can. Oops. There. Um, yeah, and local coastal plan and rezone 101 Felix to accommodate um, 80 new apartment units uh, in an existing 240 unit Cypress Point apartment complex. Um, the purpose of the hearing um, in August was for the council to consider the project from a policy perspective, um, specifically whether or not a, a general plan amendment and zone change are appropriate at this location in order to give direction to staff uh, and the applicant as to whether they should continue with the process of the application. Um, the council considered the information um, provided in the staff report, listened to testimony from the public, and after discussion by each of the council members passed a motion uh, to have staff bring back a resolution denying the general plan amendment and rezoning. Um, pursuant to state and local laws, council approval of a general plan amendment or rezoning clearly requires planning commission, uh, a planning commission recommendation prior to the council action. Um, at that time in August, um, staff believed that the council could deny a general plan amendment or rezoning without planning commission recommendation since no change to the general plan or zoning um, would occur. Um, however, following that meeting, um, a municipal code section was identified that requires that all general plan and rezoning requests go to a public hearing before the planning commission, uh, before the city council can take a final action, as you can see here in section 2406.030. Um, so as a result, um, to comply with this municipal code section, staff is recommending that the application be referred to the planning commission uh, for a public hearing at the next available uh, hearing um, based on noticing requirements. Um, uh, we're looking at November 5th as the uh, plausible planning commission uh, meeting. So um, that's our recommendation and I'm available for any questions. All right, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, are there any council members who have questions for planning staff at this time? Yeah. Council member Golder. Councilmember Golda, did you have questions? I saw your hand raised. I, I did. I was just wanting to clarify. So this is more of a procedural vote. We're not reopening this can of worms at this time. Correct. Thank you. Um, I saw another council member's hand raised. I do have a question kind of just regarding um, know how projects come before council in general because I just want to get some clarification my understanding and please correct me if I'm wrong but if there was a project that was to be come, that was to come before council in terms of an application for a new development um, my understanding is that that would need to go through CEQA and then the application after going through the, the CEQA process would then go to Planning Commission and then after it got went through the Planning Commission it would then come to council for approval of that application. Is that a correct um, kind of sequence of events that would happen for a development? Correct, yes. You're right, yes. So I guess the question and the concern I have is that if this application hasn't gone through the CEQA process, then um, we technically can't send it to the Planning Commission unless it goes through that process first. And so, yeah, so is that is that a correct interpretation, I guess, of what this would normally have to go through in terms of process. Ryan, I, I can weigh in on that. Um, sure, you know, be because the council's not uh, taking action to approve the project, uh, simply referring it to the pl planning commission is not an action that would trigger trigger a CEQA review. 
before you could take an action that actually constitutes uh, a commitment to approve the project, then you would have to do a CEQA analysis, but not um, merely to provide preliminary feedback or to um, refer it to the Planning Commission for potential future action. Like, and I guess a follow-up to that, though, is that we also don't have to take any action to send it to the Planning Commission if the applicant wanted to go through all the steps and then, after receiving CEQA approval, go to the Planning Commission for approval of the application. I'm just trying to understand because it seems like what we've done is we've done something out of sequence in terms of how a project would normally come before the city council. And so now I'm just really confused with, yeah. you know, what, what we are required to do versus, because it seems like what we can do today is just express um, our intent to, our intention to disapprove the application, um, which would you know, not, it wouldn't prevent the applicant from moving forward in any way, shape, or another, but that we, you know, we don't technically have to send this to the Planning Commission. By, by not sending this to the Planning Commission, it still wouldn't prevent the applicant from moving forward. I think what um, has put us in this sort of predicament is that the matter that came before you in August was intended to gauge the council's sentiment and uh, not necessarily to, to take a final action. So the council has given direction um, that it needs to undo uh, to restore the status quo prior to the last council meeting. If the council merely, um, you know, directs staff to proceed with the normal planning process for this project and communicate to the Planning Commission, um, the council's current sentiment as expressed by the minutes of the August, I think, 27th meeting, then you can you can do that by motion. Okay. Thank you. Uh, council Member Byers and then Council Member Brown. I think I, I might have, Tony, just missed that last point. Uh, we. Okay, we were not given a project. We were asked to weigh in on the general plan amendment, which right. we did. Right, but the, but the problem was, and what we overlooked the, the last time around, is that before the city council can take action on a general plan amendment, uh, it must be referred to the planning commission for a recommendation, so okay. the council can't take action to deny the general plan amendment without following that step as specified by your uh, zoning code. At some time, this is kind of a different question. There's been times where maybe it was only on appeal that the council can just bring something to their agenda. Overlook commissions and overlook planning commission and that we just want to take it on. Could this apply in this case? I mean, I, I think there is precedent for, uh, let's say, a project applicant to come before the city council uh, to float a concept and to get council feedback before the formal process is completed. And, and that's essentially what was, uh, is what should have occurred uh, in this case. Right. No, I'm thinking of something that we say, we just, the council, uh, how you do it, I guess do a motion or something, made to, to skip a co skip the commission's weigh-in, just immediately take it to the council, whatever findings we had to make in order to do that. But I think it was just to move things along and, um, I, I, I'm not. Yeah, there's a word for it when we just, I'm not, it on I'm not recalling a specific case okay. of that, although uh, that, that sounds um, like something that, that has occurred. Well, it just uh, seems but, that but we already... With respect okay. to uh, the, the application that's in this phase of the process with respect to a proposed uh, general plan amendment. Okay. Well, it seems a perfect case <laughs> that this might work. But for the, but for the fact that your code requires the planning commission to weigh in. Right. Well, that's what that that's the point. I wonder if we have higher jurisdiction that we can do that. But maybe I'll uh, 
maybe you'll now, your, your code also specifies council member fires that if the planning commission were to make a recommendation and if the council on a on a zoning uh on a rezoning application or on a general plan amendment and the council um uh, is interested in taking a substantially different action than it's required to refer it back to the planning commission sure. yeah no that that i understand that that. as well yeah yeah that 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 i understand Uh, Council Member Brown. That's all. Okay, thank you. I just want to clarify here uh, because, and I have some comments I'll make later. Just want to clarify that, um, as I understand it, the original staff report for August 25th uh, was asking us to um, express or express a willingness or a non willingness to um, consider the amendments, the general plan and zoning amendments that would be required for this project to move forward. Um, and so I, so my understanding is that um, what you're asking us to consider today is something a little bit different, and that is to go to the Planning Commission um, specifically about the project without going through the whole application process that you were trying to ask us to signal to the developer whether or not it would be worth moving ahead and now what i see is um a proposal to move it to the planning commission uh, and it it's likely I, I think it's likely that they won't um hear they will not make a decision on this project without seeing uh the the project application and environmental review. So I'm just having a hard time understanding why it is that um, we are being asked to do this now when we weren't asked to do this on August 25th. I don't believe it, you know, I get the confusion around the resolution, but we were, but there was a lot of confusion that evening. And so I'm, I'm just trying to understand how it, we, and we're, we're here now kind of after the council voted to express its, um, un, you know, it, its unwillingness to consider it, um, we're now being asked to um, kick the can down the road, it feels, um, and kind of just wait. Yeah, I'm not sure why we need to um, wait. So again, just help me understand how it is that um, we can, I mean, and, and Tony, maybe this is a question for you, explicit, so that was kind of a comment, but here's my question we do that today can we just do what um at least i am making the motion intended to do at the time on august 25th can we do that today express our um willingness or unwillingness to uh move ahead um i i, I think the council may uh take a vote today to refer it to the planning commission with the council's i suppose recommendation for denial So you're saying we we have I, I don't know you're telling us that legally we have to refer this to the planning commission today because i, I guess only only um you only have to refer it to the planning commission um i suppose if you take no action today then the application would still be in process and the applicant may continue to pursue the application so i suppose formal action to refer it back to the planning commission is not uh, necessary. I, I just think it makes for a cleaner record given the direction that was uh, provided by the council at the last meeting. So Mayor, maybe if, if I could jump in. Um, I think what we were trying to do at the last meeting was um, in many respects to address what Councilmember Byers was um, uh, commenting on, which was, you know, if if the council has really big concerns about the project and isn't going to be supportive of it, then let's hear that sooner rather than later. Um, where we made a mistake is we believed that um, the council had the ability to just outright deny the application, and we subsequently uh, learned that we had to go back to the planning commission um, in in order for the council to formally deny the application. 
to speak um, directly, I think, to your question, Councilmember Brown, I think that the uh, council has really two options right here. Um, the, the recommendation was uh, that you have before you is to send it back to the Planning Commission so that it could then be brought back to you for uh, a formal denial consideration because the council can't formally deny an application until that uh, Planning Commission recommendation occurs. As uh, the city attorney, Kandati, um, mentioned, you aren't compelled to send it back to the Planning Commission right now. You could say, you've heard what we said, and you can proceed should you wish to do so. Um, so that would be another option. The, the uh, council can just say, you heard our vote. Um, it's up to you whether or not you now want to proceed with the uh, CEQA analysis and um, bring a full package back in front of the Planning Commission at a later date. Um, so does that help clarify a little bit? Okay, and, and apologies for the, the confusion related to this. We were, we were trying to be helpful in, in coming earlier and um, recognize that we did um, create uh, a great deal of confusion as a result. Okay. Um, are there any further questions from council members at this time? Okay, hearing none, um, we will open um, a public comment on this item, which will end um, around four, We'll give an extra few minutes too. So 410 is when we will be closing public comment on this item. As I mentioned before, we heard extensive public comment on this item, and this is coming back um, to kind of clarify um, and adjust some issues that have now come up given the motion and direction that we provided with staff at the last meeting and how that some of that conflicts with um, city policy. So with that, if you are interested in commenting on item number 25 on our agenda, now is the time to call in. Once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone. And once you've been queued that, to unmute your phone, um, please uh, know that you'll have uh, two minutes to comment on this item, with the exception of Brian Raphael from Cypress Point Apartments. Okay, first caller. Last four digits of your phone number are 0925. Um, you may unmute your device. Hi, thank you. Um, my name's Alyssa Barnes, and I am a resident of Neary Street. I live about a block from the Cypress Street apartment. My main point today is just that I feel this whole confusion sends a really wrong me message to the public, because we did work very hard to have our voices heard and to uh, um, state that we are not in favor of this project. So I would like to ask that you do deny this motion, uh, although I do hear that there's very little that can be done. I do feel that this is a case where the big money is bulldozing through their plans um, and that we've been around the block on this. Uh, we've argued our points. We've let people know that this is a really poorly designed plan that would be a strain on an already too uh, densely populated neighborhood. So my request is, can we allow the vote to not spot rezone stand um, in, in, in future things? And I know the protocols and everything, but just it makes me as a public community person feel that there's no way to make my voice heard without endless, you know, uh, laboring. And I just would like the city council to deny the motion and to keep the spot rezoning um, vote as a solid vote. So thank you. Those are my comments. Okay, thank you.
Good evening. Good afternoon. I am a resident of Cypress Point. I agree 100% with Alyssa's points, and I just feel that it's it should be a moot point. It was already voted down prior, and I don't understand, like Alyssa says, why this has to continually be brought up. And I, I agree. I think that they, the developers are just trying to bulldoze this through. I really, really, really do not want this to occur. And if it does, uh, it will force me to have to leave. Uh, and I really like living here. I'm a taxpayer just like all of us. So, again, I, I please respectfully ask for this whole project to be uh, canceled and that the previous vote stands. Thank you. So next caller, if the last four digits of your number are 9921, you're being asked to unmute your device. Hi, yes. Um, I requested over a week ago to have extra time for the Sierra Club of Santa Cruz. Is that possible? Um, the only email I received was, I think it was yesterday. No, I emailed it to Bonnie and you, Mayor Cummings. This is Kersha Durham. Okay, I just found that, um, actually, um. I'll try to summarize our 12-page letter in two minutes, if you like, but just tell me yes or no. Yeah, I did not receive the request for additional time. I'm looking back through my emails right now, and I'm sorry, I didn't receive it. How strange. Okay, I mailed it to Bonnie Bush and you. Okay, our chapter has 6,000 members. Um, we sent you a 12-page letter. It includes a biological assessment of Neary Lagoon, and in short, the Sierra Club supports high-density infill in appropriately zoned areas. However, the rezoning of this parcel would present significant issues. Three of them are the location of this parcel is not within or adjacent to the areas where high density infill should be focused, according to our general plan. Second, the parcel is located in close proximity to fragile wetlands and a riparian habitat. Third, spot rezoning should never be used as a development tool. We view rezoning one parcel as undermining the careful democratic process of our general plan, of our local coastal program, and of the open space management plan. Given all these conflicts to the guiding principles of the Santa Cruz general plan, we urge you to oppose the proposed rezoning in order to protect Neary Lagoon and uphold our community's vision and values of truly sustainable development. Spot rezoning undercuts community planning. Just rezoning one parcel in a neighborhood undermines effective planning. It reduces the careful process in which all parties are working together for the benefit of the community, not just the benefit of one particular entity seeking to rezone. It, this proposed zoning designation conflicts with the general plan. There are several points. We've outlined them on there about and how also spot rezoning um, a quote here, spot rezoning has all the hallmark characteristics of institutional mischief and is often found in cities where the city council and the planning commission are controlled by the real estate board. Also it goes on to name all the natural resources that would be affected. 
And may I just, in sum, in conclusion, I heard the lawyer, Tony Cotati, right there, say that you could override the Planning Commission. So I hope that you will actually take that, as Catherine Byers, Sandy Brown asked about, and Justin Cummings, and you override the Planning Commission. There have been several hearings on this. You have heard from the public. We feel heard. Please listen to all the people speaking and override the Planning Commission. Deny this project now. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Good afternoon. I I'm good afternoon. Hi, I'm Sandra Ivany and perfect timing to come right after Kirsha and the Sierra Club. Every point that she made, including the institutional mischief, has definitely got our attention. We have definitely, uh, many, many people in this neighborhood have learned a lot about how government works, and we're very dismayed to see this happen. I'm not going to even, I'm just going to add a few more things to the Sierra Club, the parking, the safety, the overcrowding, the social justice issues, targeting an already dense neighborhood of renters, the bad management, the potential flooding along with the, the being in the flood zone with the climate change. Okay, I'm going to move on to this piece of it. We in Neary Lagoon were, were very, uh, in uh, Save Neary Lagoon, were very concerned about what the resolution meant. Was it a vote? Was it a, um, just a sign off? Was it a majority? What would happen in a tie? We had many questions about this. We're not attorneys. I uh, addressed my questions to um, Ryan Bain, who forwarded them on to the attorney. And here we got last week, I think it was last Thursday, uh, I could be mistaken about the date, six weeks after that October 20, that August 25th meeting, we got the note from, uh, from we got, I got the email directed to me personally, which of course I've shared with everyone since I'm speaking for everyone when I write to the, uh, to the planning department and or the attorney, um, and uh, the, so the attorney gets back to me saying, "Oops, we we made a mistake. We left this part out. You know, I just really wanted an answer about what a resolution was. Who votes on it? Is it a vote? Is it a sign off? We already got a majority. We already voted. We had a lot of questions about that. And then to come back and hear from the attorney, the, and to hear this this jargon." Um, Planning Commission denied, I'm quoting from what the third point was on this that you already saw on the screen before. Can I just read this, what the attorney wrote, which is completely inscrutable? Would that be all right? No, go ahead, and then I'll have to Thank you. It's, you can maybe even put it up on the screen because it was showing before. Um, we have no idea what this means. Uh, you know, planning commission, quote, planning commission denial of any proposed amendment shall terminate the proceedings in the matter unless an appeal is filed or the application was initiated by the city council, in which case the planning commission action shall be a recommendation, end quote. And I was just asking about the, the um, finalizing the, the vote that we took, and then I got that. Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay, next speaker. Your last four digits are 2294. You're on the line. Good afternoon. Um, dear esteemed council members, first off, I don't you know, I'm a for, for affordable housing and spot rezoning is one of the worst solutions ever. Please uphold and deny the rezone vote of August 25th. Um, please maintain the characters, character of our neighborhoods and uphold the hard work of 40 general plan staff individuals, over eight city commissions and over a dozen consultants. These individual people and commissions laid out a plan for the future growth and development of the city. Please respect and honor their hard work and stand behind the general plan and keep Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz. This project not only violates the 2030 general plan, but also wishes to exercise invalid authorities such that a spot zone creates or can, an outside developer wishes to dismantle and step on the city of Santa Cruz's general plan. You might ask, why is spot rezoning so bad? Well. It could be an invalid exercise in authority. So an outside authority, such as East Bay developer, come in with money and say, this is what we want to do. And the planning commission city says, okay, we're going to do it. No more general plan, no more Santa Cruz. It's discriminatory against other home and landowners. It is not planned, it's sloppy, 
not well thought out, not forward looking and primitive. It splits communities. People from the outside of the community have too much power and alter the feel, vibrancy, and lifestyle. General plan wants to keep Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz. Usually done in rezoning is at odds with the city's master plan, such as an outside influence developer wanting to do something that is not planned for. And it may be ruled arbitrary, capricious, and it makes unjustified exceptions. Please make good decisions, review the city of Santa Cruz 2030 general plan and honor and respect the work of many individuals to create a document to keep Santa Cruz the way it is. Just stand by the general plan. Don't let somebody come in and say, this is what we wanna do. This is how we want our city to look. Even, with, even if it's with a dangling carrot of affordable housing, we can't build ourselves out of, a, you know, out of the situation we're in just by building more buildings. Thank yeah. you. Okay, the next speaker is Brian Raphael, uh, Cypress Point Apartments, who requested um, additional time, so you'll have up to four minutes. Thank you, Mayor Cummings. Can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. Great, good afternoon. Thank you for the time. I'm Brian Raphael from Braddock and Logan, the owner of Cypress Point Apartments. Uh, we've owned it since 2005. Um, just uh, as a little way here, there's a lot of uh, a request for an amendment to the general plan is, is being mischaracterized, I think, as spot zoning. Spot zoning singles out a uh, parcel of land for use that's totally different from the surrounding area. Our request is to change the general plan designation from low medium density to medium density, not high density, medium density. The current low medium designation only allows for 178 apartment homes versus the 240 apartment homes that exist today. So no change from current use and amending uh, the general plan to allow the existing density of what is there today is not spot zoning, far from it. Uh, this, is, this amendment really would undo uh, a common practice in the 1980s that lower densities through general plans which is one of the root causes of the housing shortage uh, and it's helped perpetuate social inequalities. Uh, we're not bulldozing anything, I, I just heard that. No tenants will be displaced, not removing any existing units. The proposed 80 units are in five new residential buildings, mostly in parking lots and the pool area, far from the lagoon. Interestingly enough though, there was a, a study here on today's agenda, I think it was item number 22, unrelated to our request that highlights our parking lot as significantly underutilized. This is consistent with what we've, uh, our own parking accounts, what was projected, what was uh, shown in the traffic impact study. Uh, you know, some of the, there's been vocal opposition suggesting that we are underparked and creating uh, overcrowding and parking on the streets. It's, it's far from the truth. Uh, there's been a lot of attention given to this Save uh, the Lagoon. Uh, we love the title. We're 100% supportive of protecting the area again. It's a beautiful city park and an amenity for the residents of our project. Uh, our proposal will have no material impacts. Uh, our, our proposal won't have any um, material uh, impacts to the lagoon. The, the, the public currently has and will continue to have access through our property to this beautiful sanctuary. Uh, there's no limit to the number of people that can access the lagoon through our property. So the new 80 studio and one bedroom uh, apartment homes that we are proposing will not materially change the amount of car or foot traffic to the area. The Save the Lagoon piece is, is filled with misinformation. I, I know uh, it, it's, it's, it's got 200, 2,900 signatures or 800 signatures. I'm one of them, I, you know, under an alias, just wanted to see what, what's, uh, what's all the hoopla is about. Uh, you know, I understand the primary authors are from the adjacent community and understand they don't want to see uh, development next door and uh, more foot traffic coming from our property through the lagoon to their property. But again, the new 80 units doesn't have anything to do with that, doesn't govern that. It doesn't govern that. There is significant amount of people who go through our property. We provide the public access. There's a public right of way. That, that goes through basically public uh, an easement that goes through our property and around near the lagoon all the way to Blackburn Street, right behind the townhomes. They're very upset by this. They don't want to see this foot traffic behind their townhomes, and, and that's the whole impetus of all this. Uh, these things, you know, it's the the trees. We're not we're not destroying any trees along the lagoon. 
you know, where the trees go and the replacement trees of the trees that we are going to have to knock down um, will, will be remain to be seen. And, you know, that's not finalized, but we'll be replacing two to one. Every tree that we knock down is it is either there's nothing that's older than our existing project. The original developer planted those trees. To say that they're you know a couple hundred year old redwoods, that that's that's just not the truth. That that's not there. But regardless, you know we're we're proposing 20% affordable on site, and the only project that I'm aware of that's had any inclusionary, truly inclusionary housing. So when you fact, it, it, no reason this is able to be done is because we own the land. When you factor in all the costs to build. The land value is effectively zero. So this 20 percent affordable requirement is actually perpetuating. There are no projects that are proposing that, but ours. And right. just lastly, real quick, denying the project that truly has an inclusionary project or inclusionary element like this, with it, it included of the units that we're developing versus segregating 100 percent of market rate and 100 percent of uh, below market rate and 100 percent affordable projects. You know, it, it's basically segregating people by household income, and I don't think anyone wants to perpetuate that. But that in addition to not allowing the higher density or the existing density today is, I mean, Thank you. I apologize for going over my time. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Hello, Honorable City Council. Thank you for allowing me to speak again at this additional hearing. I was present at the August 25th meeting when Lee Butler stood before the council and all the public attending and said that the purpose of that meeting was to give the developer a sense of whether or not the city would amend their general plan and, and allow rezoning of the 101 Felix Street parcel to make a decision if they wanted to spend more money. Sandy Brown moved to ask that that vote, which was taken to deny a general plan amendment, be finalized, put into code, whatever it is you do to finalize it. So I say, let's save city staff time, energy, and money. Let's save the developer time, energy, and money, and let them know in no uncertain terms that the city council does not intend to amend their general plan. Let's finish that and set the resolution forward. I'm hearing circular things from city council and the planning department here about why this has to go back to the planning commission. I certainly am dis I would disadvise doing nothing. I think that message needs to be sent to the developer. Um, that the and what we're get, so this, I'm asking the city council to recommend to the planning commission to deny the, the project so that the planning commission can re recommend back to the city council to deny. So that is what I'm asking for. Um, I, I, I understand how desperately the city staff wish to see this project come forward, and I do not understand that. This delay seems to be designed to delay. Now, Brian got to talk more than his four minutes, I'm gonna, I'm, so I'm, I'm going to finish my thought. I'm at, we're um, running out of time, the and there's the only one. There's a new city council seated. I will say that while only the developer has only requested 80 units, currently rezoning that parcel would allow 265 additional units plus 35% more or 93 additional bonus density units, which brings it up to 307, which is now in high density. So you've effectively doubled the amount Thank of you. people who can live there. Thank you. Hey, Hi there, my name is... Oh, thank you, Mayor. My name is Alex Nearson. My partner and I are residents of uh, and homeowners in the Laurel Neary neighborhood just north of the project site. And I would urge you today to deny this motion and eventually dismiss permanently the proposed development at 101 Felix. My main concern about this project is that in an effort to shoehorn as many replacement trees onto their property as possible, developer, developers are resorting to unsafe locations above a gas transmission pipeline. 
Here's what I know. A PG&E gas line crosses 101 Felix along its northern boundary. It's buried underground in a 20-foot wide easement. And as a transmission pipeline, it's larger and operates at a higher pressure than common distribution lines, which enter our home. Property owners are responsible for keeping the area above transmission lines readily accessible so that PG&E can inspect, test, and patrol the lines. Nevertheless, developers want to plant 10 new trees within or right on the boundary of that pipeline easement. At maturity, even more of them, 15 trees are likely to have root zones that significantly encroach into the easement. And this is a problem because tree roots damage the protective coating of pipelines, which can lead to corrosion and leaks. Trees prevent crews from performing important maintenance work, and trees threaten safety because they block firefighters' access during emergencies. Now, PG&E already struggles to maintain safe gas pipelines without added obstacles from property owners. For example, PG&E was convicted of six felonies connected to the 2010 San Bruno pipeline explosion, which killed eight people. And then they continued to falsify pipeline records for years after that explosion. PG&E pipe inspectors have also been historically understaffed. KQED reported that in situ inspections of 1950s era transmission lines in Santa Cruz were only completed in 2015 and only as a direct response to the San Bruno disaster. Please, let's not make their job any harder. Protect Laurel Neary neighbors and dismiss this project. Thank you. Thank you. If there are any other members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item who have not spoken already, um, we have time for one more comment. So if you would please press star nine on your phone, um, you will have two minutes to speak. Hi, thank you for letting me speak. Um, I urge you to deny this project now. The vote that was made on August 25th should hold, and I believe that this, there's, there's found a loophole in this procedure that seems to be an opportunity to kick the can back and forth, back and forth, and to keep giving this developer a uh, hope that this project will, will happen. And it's wasting everyone's time um, since the procedure went out of order, the vote uh, on the city council should still stand as the vote to deny this project. And um, I don't really understand all this procedural stuff, but if it has to go to the planning commission to have it completely finished, then recommend denying it. And then let the vote that you've already had hold. We've already been through this. I've been to all the public hearings. I've been to the planning commission hearing. I'm, I'm ready for this to be complete. And you guys voted to deny this project. We should not have to go through another vote and keep rehashing this project. This, this area does not need more density. I don't care if you call it moving it to medium density. It is high density already. There are four or five people living in each of those apartments because they can't afford a single apartment by themselves and most of them have cars and i beg to differ about the parking situation there is never any parking when those apartments are full there is never any parking there is not a lot of walk foot traffic around here because they don't have complete sidewalks but i'm going to go back to what i really want you to do which is to deny this project today it has already been voted by the council to do so Please stop kicking this back and forth, back and forth because of a procedural loophole. I, as a public, feel uh, a little dismayed. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, hi. This is Judy Grunstra. I do not live in that area, but I have been following. And boy, it's just, uh, I'm just aghast at the incompetence that this is, reflects of the planning director or planning staff. It's unbelievable. These are highly paid uh, individuals, and to bungle something this badly, waste council's time, it's ridiculous. So please. 
members have spoken, everybody's spoken. You shouldn't have to waste your time on more deliberation on this. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. And with that, we're going to close public comment on this item and return back to council for action and deliberation. I have a, a couple questions, and then Councilmember Brown, I see your hands raised, so I'll acknowledge you. But I just had a couple questions for clarification for the city attorney. Um, I think that uh, a number of members of the public, a number of the comments we heard was that members of the public asked, will we dismiss? permanently and we permanently deny the application but my understanding is this even if this were to go back to the planning commission and they were to deny the application the applicants would then be able to reapply within a year is that correct or because my understanding um, is that there's no way that we can deny something like permanently uh well th th that is true um and the question is whether or not uh, it can be reapplied for within a year or whether or not it has to, um, a year has to pass by before a reapplication has occurred. And, and I'm going to ask the planning director to help me out, but I believe if it's denied without prejudice, then it, they can reapply, um, or if it's denied with prejudice, they still could reapply, but it, but it would have to wait a year. That was something that we talked through at the last meeting, um, and the denial with prejudice is applicable to the um, development applications themselves, not to the general plan amendment and rezoning. Um, so um, they could apply for, they could reapply, you know, if it's denied, they could reapply the next day. You know, that wouldn't necessarily be a smart move on their part because uh, they, they know the outcome, but um, there's nothing that would them from doing that great I just wanted to be clear for the members of the public that you know we don't have any control over permanently denying applications for uh, development in the city so I just wanted that to be clear um, and and I guess to follow up with that question it sounds like um, the application regardless of whether we denied with or without prejudice it still has to go before the planning it still has to go through the actual process and part of that it sounds like from earlier in CEQA, the, pl the application would have to go to the Planning Commission. They'd then have to make a recommendation. Then the application would come to the City Council, and then at that point, we could deny or approve the application. So. Yes, that's right. To be clear, um, we looked at the state law regarding general plan amendments, which, which appears to say that a Planning Commission hearing is required before you approve an amendment. And so that's what the... the uh, miscommunication at the last meeting was based upon, but our code clearly states that a public hearing shall be held by the Planning Commission on all proposed amendments. Um, at the last meeting in August, this, there was an opportunity for the public to weigh in and for the council to gauge public sentiment about the project. Um, but uh, in addition to hearing from members of the public, our processes have to be followed in a way that's fair to all parties concerned, and that's called due process. And, and that's why, while it would be tempting to, uh, to, to take final action based on the discussion at the last council meeting, we simply can't do that uh, in a manner that's consistent with our due process requirements. Okay. okay. Um. Although there might be some, um, I also have some language for a potential motion to make um, really just expressing our sentiment that we're not in favor of the project currently based on concerns regarding spot zoning, the integrity of the current general plan, and the importance of protecting quality of life in the surrounding neighborhoods as it's reflected in the previous council action on August 15th. I can't make a motion, but I'm happy to share that language if a council member would be willing to. Um, but. You know, before we continue on, I'll, I'll just um, call on Councilmember Brown, who has her hand raised. Yeah, I, I was, I have some comments, and then I, I was prepared to make a motion. If, if we want, you want us to work off of yours, Mayor Cummings, that's fine with me. Um, I did send it to Bonnie. Um, so, the motion that I'm hoping to make in just a moment is um, one that I wish I had made six weeks ago. I wish I had um, taken uh, the time to get some outside counsel on this about how to proceed. 
so that we didn't end up in this kind of situation. Um, but I kind of trusted that staff was giving me the um, you know information on the best way to go here. Um, and so as I understand it, once again, uh, the staff brought to us to give the developer a sense of whether it was worth their time and energy to pursue all of the steps necessary to um, get an a get a project approved this this particular project or one like it um, and that includes the general plan and zoning changes and we could quibble about whether or not this is spot zoning or not um, you know it, based on our different understandings, but regardless, it's a, it's a proposal to zone outside of a, an, a regular process for general plan amendments. So to me, that sig signals spot zoning um, or spot general plan amendments. Um, and so while I, I get it that we cannot deny uh, the project today, um, I believe we do continue to have the right to express our intentions. And, um, and I just want to, you know, I'm not going to go into the substantive reasons why. I, we talked about it last time. I think members of the public um, provided a lot of good points here that I would, um, I would echo, but I won't um, in, for the sake of time. So it really does feel like, um, you know, to me, as well as members of the public who have spoken, that it is before us again due a procedural loophole that's really intended to get a different outcome than the one uh, that that um, we voted on on August 25th. Um, and countless people have weighed in. I don't think it's appropriate to keep them hanging, to keep them in limbo. Um, if and again, with the understanding that we cannot make any uh, final decisions today. Um, I um, I do have a motion, and um, you know, Mayor Cummings. If, I don't know if you sent it to Bonnie or how you want to do this, but if you want to put it up, I'm I'm prepared to make a motion right now, and I will. I'd like it to be up so that we can be clear about what it is before uh, we have more, uh, just more discussion. Okay, so. Um, so this is pretty close to the motion that I had intended to make. Um, I also wanted to include, though, um, that we um, not send this to the Planning Commission, at the application to the Planning Commission at this time. Um, I So because, so if we could include, uh, mo so in the motion um, that the council not refer uh, the um, application CP19-0176 for the property at 101 Felix Street uh, to the Planning Commission at this time. And I guess, so in, in terms of the order, that's fine. I had that first, but... Um, that's fine. So my motion would be then to that the council express its sentiment uh, that it's not in favor of the projects based on concerns regarding, uh, uh, I guess I would say, since we may end up quibbling over the definition of spot zoning uh, regarding uh, general plan and zoning amendments outside of the regular planning, outside of the regular procedure procedure, regular procedures. And um, yeah, and they so the integrity of the general plan is implicit there, but it's, you know, I also works for me. And so the importance of projecting quality of life in the surrounding neighborhood as reflected in the previous action. Yeah. Um, so that's my motion. Hey, I'll second that. So are there any other comments from council members? Council Member Golder, you're muted also. I was trying to change it to the other view where I could raise my hand with the button. Um, 
So I just had a question, and maybe someone from planning can answer this. Regarding, we've been talking about um, spot zoning or rezoning outside the general plan amendment period. Um, is this something that happens often or not often? Like, how rare is this request that the developers bringing, just out of curiosity? If anyone can answer that. Sure. So thank you, Councilmember Golder. Um, you know, we get uh, requests um, less frequently, I would say, than other cities um, for general plan amendments um, and rezonings. However, it is a it is a normal process. Um, you know, if I've, in, in, with respect to the motion itself, um, I would, um, you know, I would wordsmith the first clause um, because, um, you know, the regular procedures, this, this is a regular procedure that um, can happen that is provided for in the uh, general plan, I'm sorry, in the zoning ordinance and as part of the general plan. Um, so, you know, we've, we've had, um, general plan amendments and rezonings approved by the council in, uh, or at least one that I can recall uh, in the time that I've been with the city for you know the past three years. Um, it is less frequent than what we see in other cities, and sometimes, you know, the the general plan looks at the city as a whole, and so you know sometimes the the general plan um, isn't necessarily looking at at individual properties, but um, uh, upon closer inspection, um, you know, a change one way or another um, may be deemed uh, acceptable by the council, and and there's a process to do that, and that's what we're uh, in the midst of right now is, is going through that process. So, does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. I just was curious. Is this something that's completely, you know, yeah? I appreciate it. That answers it. Councilmember Watkins and then Brown. Um, thank you, Mayor. And I know I had to leave early from the August 25th meeting and um, and heard some of the testimony before I left and also since then have had the opportunity to, um, to tour the location and to um, speak to the developer. And I still have concerns about this project, so I'm comfortable with not, with, with, um, not necessarily refer, I'm comfortable with the potential options. I just am trying to understand what this means as compared to referring it to um, the planning commission. So I don't know if, if Tony or Lee, you wanna kind of specify the specifics on what ultimately you know, is to ensue after we take this type of action this afternoon. Well, I, I can take a crack at that. Um, I think, uh, what this um, essentially does is it reflects the council's viewpoint on the project, but does not take, does not reflect any action that the count that the council is taking with respect to the application. So, I, I guess my only concern about it is is that it suggests. I mean, essentially, I guess my concern about it is that the the statement that the council not refer the application to the planning commission at this time is essentially tantamount to saying that the council take no action at this time. Um, and and so I, I, I guess I, I think that's a little bit confusing, but I, I don't think it has uh, any particular legal significance. And I would say as far as next steps um, with this motion, um, I think it would, if this motion moves forward, it would send a clear message to the developer, here's where the council stands, and they would have the option, do they want to, at their own risk, proceed with spending money on the additional sequence analyses that are necessary to, to move the project forward? And um, should they choose to do so, you know, they'd be doing so at their own risk. Thank you. Councilmember Brown. So I am sensitive to the, uh, you know, the questions around wording and um, Director Butler, you raised about the regular procedure. So I'm, um, I'm going to ask uh, 
uh, if we could, if my other second to the motion would consider um, taking out, so motion that the council express its sentiment that it's not in favor of this project based on its concerns um, regarding the integrity of the current general plan. So just take out that piece before the integrity. So yeah. So because I think that the integrity of the current general plan kind of gets at that point. So if that would work for you, Mayor Cummings, I would just propose that change before we vote. Yeah, I was actually going to ask for a similar change because I think that if there's, for example, a neighborhood that is low density that wants to increase its density and agrees that that's okay with that neighborhood, I don't see why that would be a problem outside of the whole general plan process. So that, I think that that reflects my sentiments as well, especially with the fact that the neighborhood has very much come out and spoken against the increase in density in what I believe to be a very dense neighborhood. So. And I, you know, personally, I'll also say I think this gets at our intention to, which is what I heard at the end of the city attorney's statements. It's that, you know, what we were asked to do at the last meeting was to provide, you know, here is where we stand as a council. It doesn't stop, I mean, doesn't stop the developer from moving forward, but it does say, it sends a message. And I think that that's where the confusion came in, and I think some of us are still confused, but it sounded like the intention was that we provide, you know, what is our sentiment at this time? Um, and then should the developer want to continue to go through, they can do that, but they have to go through CEQA analysis, the application, the planning commission, before it comes to council, and it seems like you know, it makes the most sense that they go through the same process that any other development would normally go through, rather than get approval from us with the application, then get approval from the planning commission or what have you, and then go through what other developers would go through. And I think what we risk is setting a, setting a precedent that um, before developers even go through the CEQA process, that they can come to council, get approval on on developments, and then you know, have an understanding that there's not a risk at that. So I think that we don't want to set a bad precedent with this. Um, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I just want to um, just thank, uh, well, just sort of chime in here. Um, I did do a tour with the neighborhood last weekend. It was very helpful. I'll be supporting the motion. Um, it, this has been an incredibly uh, confusing process. And so um, I do think that um, we have created um, quite a complex situation with people um, feeling like there was a decision made. Um, and, and, and just overall, I think, um, you know, having predictable development proposal um, actions and deliberations is something that our community is really, um, really uh, holds high. And I think we just have to recognize and hopefully gut, make, provide a little more guidance in terms of how we, we do this kind of these, you know, this kind of potential step um, if it ever comes up again. But um, I will be supporting the motion and uh, just wanted to thank the neighbors and the neighborhood for uh, providing the opportunity to visit with them last weekend. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any further comments by council members at this point in time? Okay, hearing none, um, we have a motion by council member Brown, seconded by Mayor Cummings. The council expressed its sentiments that it is not in favor of this project based on its concerns regarding the integrity of the current general plan and the importance of protecting the quality of life in the surrounding neighborhood as reflected in its previous action on August 25th and that the council not refer application CP19-0176-101 Felix Street to the Planning Commission at this time. If there's no further comment, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Byers? Aye. <clears throat> uh, Matthews is disqualified. Um, Brown? Aye. Holder? I'm going to say I, but I also just want to say that I, um, I, I don't think that, I mean, there's parts of this that I don't agree with. I don't know how I can, 
express that. But, aye. Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Um, okay, before we move on to our last um, item before we take a break, or well, before we take our dinner break, I'm just gonna ask that we take a five minute break. And so why don't we, for a little bit more than five minutes, so why don't we reconvene at 4.30. And the last item before we take our extended um, dinner break is the um, item 26, amendment to regulations of beekeeping on residential, non-residential properties. So while we're waiting for um, Councilmember Watkins to join us, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is a good time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff for uh, the public, uh, followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and return to the council for action and deliberation. And with that, I'd like to um, Move on to item number 26, amendment to the regulations of beekeeping on residential and non-residential property. The presenters this evening are one of our planning interns, Ethan Abelar, and senior planner, Sarah Noisy. And I'll just pass it over to you all. Hello again, council members and mayor, uh, members of the public. We're happy to be here this afternoon, early evening, to discuss the city's regulations for beekeeping and, uh, and our proposed amendments to those. So this is an item that was brought to our attention um, a little over a year ago by some beekeepers that the existing ordinance adopted some point in the 80s um, was really quite burdensome and, um, and problematic for beekeepers. And you know, understanding how important pollinators are in all parts of the environment, including the urban environment, um, planning staff really wanted to um, have the opportunity pardon me, had the wonderful opportunity to have a summer intern help us out with this work this summer. Um, as you can imagine, with some of the other staffing issues the city has going on, um, it's unlikely we would have been able to get to this particular amendment as much as we wanted to. So we're really grateful that Ethan um, was able to be here with us this summer and do a lot of the background research, work with the um, group of focus group of beekeepers that helped us with this process. Um, and we're so glad he's able to join us again to do the presentation from the East Coast. So um, a little bit of background, the current um, requirements for beekeeping require an administrative use permit, which has an associated fee um, in excess of $2,000. Also, um, hives are limited to no more than two, only allowed on single family properties, and they require a setback of 20 feet from any property line. As you can imagine, that might eliminate, that eliminates a lot of property from uh, potentially being eligible as um, for beekeeping. And then the administrative burden on beekeepers is um, significant. I mean, that's a large fee for essentially a hobby activity. So we had some goals for this amendment. We wanted to promote safe beekeeping practices. We wanted to reduce that financial burden on beekeepers. We wanna support healthy beehives. We know that that's really important, both for um, domestically kept beehives as well as their wild counterparts. And then we wanted this ordinance to really just establish some best practices for folks if they may be new to the hobby, if they may be um, neighbors not familiar with um, you know, what might be a best practice if their neighbors are starting to keep bees. We wanted um, the community to rest assured that the standards that are in the city code are really gonna protect all interests. And so with that, Ethan will take you through the highlight, the high points of the ordinance. Thank you, Sarah. And good evening, council members, Mayor coming. Um, so as Sarah had mentioned, in an uh, effort to lessen the financial burden for beekeepers, as well as for the city, uh, staff is recommending an elimination of the permit requirement uh, for beekeeping in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, in addition to that, staff is also recommending an expansion of beekeeping uses beyond a single family zone uh, to be accommodated by commercial, multifamily, um, and public use lots. With the addition that for beekeeping uses on these lots, uh, staff is recommending 
a new consent practice through which beekeepers are required to obtain the written consent uh, of the property owner uh, on which the bees are kept. And part of that process also involves supplying uh, explicitly written notice uh, to neighbors within a certain radius of uh, the hives. Uh, in addition, staff is recommending that on these lots, uh, the hive owners themselves stencil their names and contact information on the hive boxes. Um, in addition, staff has uh, recommended a series of best practices, the goals of which are to regulate hive placement in such a way to encourage bees to disperse uh, on the property uh, on which they're being kept before potentially encountering members of the public. Uh, and the first in the series of best practice recommendations uh, is that of a constant on-site source of water to increase the likelihood that bees will only seek out water on the properties that they're being kept and not neighboring properties. Um, next, uh, staff is recommending a 10 foot setback from pedestrian rights of ways as well as front property lines, uh, the goal of which is to create a volume of space through which bees can disperse before leaving their hives. Um, staff also believes that a six foot barrier can be a proper accommodation to substitute for this 10 foot setback, uh, with the understanding that a six foot barrier is not possible to construct uh, given Santa Cruz's building code on front property lines. Um, so, that six foot option is not an alternative for front property lines. However, for the rest of uh, the property, it is. Staff is also recommending for other mitigation strategies, that being elevating hives, a 10 foot setback from property lines, the aforementioned six foot barrier, or orienting hive entrances away from uh, neighboring properties and towards the property that, uh, itself. Um, because of geographical variation in the city, staff uh, feels it's only practical to recommend two out of four of these mitigation strategies, which we still believe to provide um, a safe barrier for uh, the bees to disperse. Uh, in addition, for community housing projects um, and equivalent properties, such as townhomes and condos, uh, there are additional setting requirements, which are essentially setbacks from uh, other owned properties. Uh, which brings us to front yard setbacks, uh, which is really the area that staff uh, it's the one area of this ordinance that staff is not able to reach a full consensus with um, with the beekeepers that we were so happy to consult with in the development of this ordinance. Um, and in addition, the Planning Commission um, recommended a three-foot setback um, for hives on front yards. Uh, however, in trying to accommodate this into the ordinance itself, staff was unable to, unable to find a way to um, conform this three-foot setback to what we consider to be best practices for uh, bee dispersion uh, before encountering members of the public. Uh, for example, a three-foot setback does not do enough uh, to prevent bees from being exposed to noise disturbances or physical disturbances on the street. Um, this can potentially agitate bees and increase the likelihood that they will encounter members of the public uh, in a more agitated uh, as opposed to a docile state. Um, as I mentioned before, a six-foot fence uh, is not allowed to be constructed on front property lines and therefore the volume of space that staff is recommending uh, elsewhere on the property cannot be met through a, uh, a shorter three-foot setback for front property lines. Um, and lastly, uh, in developing this ordinance, staff consulted with a beekeeping expert at uh, UC Davis who stressed to us the importance in successful urban beekeeping. Uh, to have positive relationships between beekeepers and neighbors. And while it is of staff's full uh, belief and expectation that almost every beekeeper in the city of Santa Cruz cares deeply about not only the health of their hives, but also the health and perceived safety of their neighbors, uh, staff still wants to take a somewhat cautious approach to establish a sort of minimum uh, setback from which if there was a more inexperienced beekeeper who was keeping bees closer to the front of their properties, um, that any potential fallout from that as far as uh, neighbors' perceived safety and neighbor relationships with beekeepers, that that could be avoided uh, with a longer setback, which is, as I mentioned before, a 10-foot setback from front yard. Um, so staff is formally recommending to the city council uh, to introduce for publication an ordinance amendment uh, to Santa, the Santa Cruz uh, Municipal Code Section 24.12.650 as recommended by staff. Um, thank you so much. And now we'd be happy to take any questions. 
Great, thank you for that presentation. Um, I'll turn it over to uh, Vice Mayor Myers, who has her hand raised. Questions, comments? Yeah, I just have a couple of questions. Um, so, with the th so the restriction or sort of the I guess um, it looked like the Planning Commission had offered the three foot setback. Sorry, my dog is going to bark, and I have a bee in my office, so that's pretty great. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I'm gonna, if I do this, it's because there's a bee in my office. Um, so I'm just trying to understand a little bit more about um, how we ended up with the 10 foot and it was, is it primarily because of other existing code on the books? Um, and, and I guess my other question is um, in speaking with some of the local beekeepers as well as others, other bee folks, um, so many times the hives are so dependent on the conditions on the property. So moisture, you know, wind exposures, you know, the warmth of a particular location. Um, it, I'm just curious how many of those sort of environmental factors maybe came into the discussion either with local beekeepers. Um, just trying to understand a little bit more how we got to the 10 feet rather than the three feet. I mean, I'm just looking for a little more clarification on that. Thank you. Sure, yeah, I'm happy to um, dive into that. So um, we, so 10 feet actually comes from a document that Ethan found from the University of Oregon, um, and it identifies 10 feet as the, as Ethan, Ethan was mentioning, sort of this volume of space that like as bees leave their, leave their hives from a point, they move out in all directions, right? And so when you get to a point of 10 feet distant from the hive entrance, um, the determination from the University of Oregon was that you sort of reach this point where the bees are dispersed to a level that's similar to what you would find almost anywhere. You know, you know, I walk through my garden, I see bees here and there. To my knowledge, I don't have a hive on my property, so I'm not seeing a big concentration of bees. And so that's kind of, that's where that 10 feet comes from, is that that's the metric that was identified um, in the, the one source we were able to find. Um, now, what happened with the Planning Commission recommendation and the beekeeper's recommendation? Two things. Number one, uh, staff made a little bit of a mistake, um, and I will just own that. Um, we were talking about this 10 foot setback, beekeepers had some concerns about that and wanted something smaller. And so we tried to come up with something sort of on the fly. We said maybe three feet, you wouldn't, no one would bump into that from the street. As we thought about it more after the fact, we ended up taking that, I'm sorry, we ended up taking that to the planning commission and sort of rec and rec you know, presenting it to them as an acceptable option. Um, as we were preparing the city council report, we were looking for more backup for that point of view to sort of support it because three feet is really quite a small setback. If you can imagine um, someone who might be less comfortable with bees, three feet might seem a little intimidating. So we were looking for sort of support for that. We were really unable to find it. And then sort of the last piece that really um, sort of solidified the recommendation for me was our conversation with um, Professor Nino from UC Davis. Um, she is a bee expert. She is one of the, you know, references that was provided to us by the beekeepers and that was um, included with the packet as at the end of the planning commission report, bees in the neighborhood. Um, and she really just has a more conservative approach and that is more protective of the public and of the hives. So it seems we want to come up with something that's reasonable. We do want to provide an accommodation for these beekeepers so that they can perform this hobby in the community, perform this environmental service. And we have to be considerate of all the users of our city streets. Um, you know, front setbacks get a lot more activity than side yard setbacks typically. You can't put a six foot barrier there to have these go up and over. Um, in terms of like, could we just consider every parcel like as a unique case? I mean, that's a, that's a permit process. Right, that's kind of what we had before. We didn't really have lots of criteria that we would consider, but anytime you wanna talk about considering something on a case-by-case -case basis, that's creating a permit process. And we're trying to really avoid that and just set standards, say like, here, meet these standards. You don't need a permit from the city. Your neighbors can feel safe and secure that you're doing the right thing. You can feel safe and secure that no one's gonna come and tell you to remove or move your hive. 
Um, so that was really, you know, a core piece of the goal is to move away from a case by case consideration. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Watkins. Um, no, thank you for that question and, and for the response. I uh, maybe have a question more for Tony. I don't know if, if for example, we have these parameters in place and somebody is highly allergic to bees in a multi-residential area or in close proximity to a neighbor who has, um, you know, is keeping bees. Is there a legal liability associated with this type of policy? I don't look at it as a, as a legal liability for the city because um, the city is only or is only liable for a dangerous condition of public property, but it might create a situation where there's liability uh, of the property owner or of the or of the person who's maintaining the hive. Um, the the fact that I mean these ordinances are are fairly typical or some cities don't regulate beekeeping at all. And, um, you know, the fact that a, a person who's sensitive to, um, uh, to, to bee sting might encounter a, a bee that's maintained up by a hive would not create liability for the city. I'm not sure if that gets at your question. Councilmember Watkins. Yeah, no, I, I, I think so. I, I guess it would just be then if, if there is beekeeping happening that isn't necessarily adhering to the parameters set within the ordinance, um, how will that be upheld or sort of how will there be compliance sort of checks or how or will it just be sort of, or, or maybe that, that doesn't matter if it's just so, so similar to other regulations that the council uh, adopts on a, on a large variety of projects, uh, a large variety of topics. If a circumstance came into came to the attention of city staff that there was a a beekeeping operation or an apiary that is is not uh, maintained in accordance with the requirements of the ordinance, then that would be a code enforcement process that would be initiated in order to rectify that. Initially, outreach and an attempt to gain um, voluntary compliance, and if that didn't work, then more formal uh, enforcement measures could be taken. Okay. Thank you. There's no. Are there any further questions from council members? Councilmember Matthews. Thank you. Um, I'm, I wanted to ask um, well, Tony or Lee, uh, sometimes ordinances have some statement of legislative intent in the beginning. Not all of them, but many do. And I wondered about just putting something, uh, just a statement here along those lines, which is kind of reflected in the staff report along the lines of the purpose of this ordinance is to encourage environmentally beneficial hobby of beekeeping, ensuring the use of best practices with a focus on the safety of neighbors, beekeepers, and healthy bee colonies, um, uh, intended to minimize conflicts between neighbors and bee colonies. I mean, something like that. Just what's the le legislative intent? What, any, any thoughts on that? We can do that. I think that, I think that sounds fine. Okay, and the reason I mention that is that um, there, there has been some discussion, which we'll get into, I think, when um, when people call in and we have our discussion about uh, which restrictions are, you know, make sense, are required, how many of those in combination do you need, um, that uh, basically no one cares more about the health of the bee colony than the beekeepers, <laughs> probably. <laughs> um, and. Um, want to allow some flexibility with the idea that, of course, the public would be protected as well. So I just ask that question. We can hear people's commentary and then come back to it. Um, 
Are there any other council members who had questions? Okay, seeing none, I'll just express that I've, I think some of the um, things I was interested in have come up because I'm a little, having been, been stung by it as a child and that lingering with me my entire life, I do have concerns around you know, people getting stung by bees and then um, allergic response. But um, do know that, you know, working around honeybees is, is pretty fine because they kind of want to do their thing just as much as you want to do yours. But, you know, again, ensuring that we're maintaining um, public safety around people getting stung by bees, I think, is an important piece with this. But um, if there's no other comments from council members at this time, I'd like to open it up for public comment. So if you're a member of the public who would like to comment on item number six, 26, uh, which is an amendment to regulations of beekeeping on residential and non-residential properties, now is the time to call in using the numbers on your screen. Once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone. Uh, you will be asked to unmute your device, at which point you'll have two minutes to address the council on this item. last four digits of your number are 7254. Um, you're being asked to unmute your phone. Hi, thank you. This is Donna Gardner, and I've been working closely with Sarah and Ethan. It's so nice to see you today. Um, uh, my husband and I were local beekeepers, and we're the ones who started getting this put into motion. And I want to first express so much appreciation to the council and the planning commission, Sarah, Ethan, everyone who's been so diligent and conscientious to update this outdated amend or, uh, policy that we've had. Um, I want to first quote directly from Dr. Uh, Alina El Nino's book or her publication, Bees in the Neighborhood, Best Practices for Urban Beekeepers. She does not specify an exact setback. She does say placement of hives is an important consideration for responsible beekeeping, especially in urban or suburban areas where people live in very close proximity. To avoid unnecessary colony disturbance, hives should be placed in a quiet area of the lot. Alternatively, hives can be placed eight feet above the ground on rooftops. Hives are best placed as far away from neighboring properties as possible, as well as from roads, sidewalks, trails, and other pedestrian right of way. Hive entrances should face in a direction so that bees leaving the hive fly across your property. If necessary, you may redirect flight paths up and away from neighboring properties by using barriers such as hedges, sh uh, shrubs, fabric, or fencing. She doesn't specify 10 feet for a reason, and it, and it was what has already been addressed, which is that uh, lots don't conform to this in our community, and it's really using best practices. I, I, was, I was also hoping to address the allergies to bees, to alleviate Unfortunately, um, we only have two minutes for public comment. I just want to be mindful. Um, but are there any other members of the public who'd like to address the council on this item? If so, please call in. And once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone, and you will be given two minutes to speak to us on this item. I'm not seeing uh, any other members of the public who wish to address us on this item. And so um, with that, I'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. <clears throat> so I'd like to bring it to council and see if there's any council members who have any questions or would like to make a motion on this item or further comments. Vice Mayor Myers. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I, um, I have to say I'm still not convinced about the 10 foot uh, setback from the, um, within, with regards to the front yard setback. Um, I, the front property line, um, I, 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 I do worry with some of the non-conforming lots we have in town, I, I just feel like this might be, I, I, it just seems like a, it, I'm just concerned about how this is interpreted um, and how it goes forward. Um, and I think I think to the extent that, that our local beekeepers um, have been up and doing um, the good work of providing pollinators in our neighborhoods, and really, um, really not really understanding and not really receiving really any complaints. Um, I think the, um, you know, the ability to encourage people and not intimidate them um, and, and most importantly provide the, the ability for um, the property owner to place the bees in the most um, successful area that they can for, for the bees. I, I feel like um, uh, item F is a little bit, um, repetitive found um, sort of the intent in G and H with regards to um, especially G where it's specific to a pedestrian right of way, including a sidewalk, public trail or street where no sidewalk has been constructed that there's very specific um, intent there to, to, to achieve that, that setback there um, from the pedestrian right of way. And that of course is, is the 10 foot there. So um, I have a motion I'd like to just make um, to see if we can potentially make make the intent of the ordinance a little bit less cumbersome from a pro for a property owner. Uh, and I believe Bonnie, I sent this to you a little while ago as I was looking through this. Um, so I'd like to make a motion to make the following cha changes to ordinance of the City Council of the City of Santa Cruz amending APRA regulations in Chapter 24.12 of the Municipal Code to strike item F from the ordinance and make the following change to item H, which will of course become the new item G if item F, F is struck. Uh, and that change would be that in the first line, all APRA shall be maintained in place in a manner that encourages bees to disperse rather than concentrate before potentially encountering neighbors and, or other members of the public. And that this requirement may be achieved. Uh, I'm gonna strike by any combination of two or more of the following strategies. And again, just try to, try to lessen the complexity. Um, I would make a change that, that that line would say this requirement may, may be achieved by any of the following strategies, recognizing best practices um, regarding with, with uh, the four listed there. Um, that is my motion. I'll make a second. Okay. We have a motion by Councilmember Blackman Meyer, seconded by Councilmember Goldberg. Can, can we leave the motion up? I just want to have it for reference so we can just read over it. And then uh, I would just like to recognize Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Watkins. And I've, um, let's see. Am I, you are alive, we can hear okay. you. <laughs> Just um, I would like to add a statement of legislative intent. The per and I'll email this to Bonnie. Um, the purpose of this ordinance is to encourage the environmentally beneficial practice of beekeeping in Santa Cruz by ensuring the use of best practices with a focus on the safety of neighbors, beekeepers, and honeybees. Uh, the ordinance includes guidance to minimize conflicts between neighbors and the general public while supporting healthy bee colonies. Uh, just straightforward legislative intent. And so is that the uh, make on the motion, second of the motion? What do you think? Yeah. I'm sorry, yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Renee, is that acceptable? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> May I ask a clarifying question? Sure. Um, just to be sure that we're all on the same page, um, these proposed amendments would mean that um, a beehive could be placed right on the property line and could face into the neighboring yard. I just wanna be sure we're taking that into consideration. This, this would be right along, could be along a sidewalk. Someone could bump into it. There's potential noise and safety impact, as I believe that that situation. Can you describe to me then with regards to how does, so I'm having trouble with the way that F and G work together. Um, so I, my understanding of what G is trying to accomplish is, is to, to provide that 10 foot setback from, from any pedestrian access. But that's not what, so I'm, I guess I'm confused I'm in, in the yeah. order. Um, sure. on the intent here. Yes, um, understandable. Um, I, Bonnie, if you could stop sharing, I could share my screen and could walk through it. Um, okay, so I'm sharing the strikeout version of the ordinance. So um, we're talking here, um, Vice Mayor Myers is referring to subsection F and subsection G. So um, perhaps like going back in time, we'll, make this a little more clear. We started off with subsection G and we said adjacent to a pedestrian right of way, we need some kind of a barrier or protection between pedestrians, unsuspecting, inattentive, texting pedestrians and beehives. Okay, so no one wraps their dog around it. You know, there's no, so no one crashes their bicycle, stuff like that. So that could be achieved by a step back, by a 10 foot step back, um, or it could be achieved by being behind a fence. This was something that the um, beekeepers pointed out to us. Initially, we were just proposing a setback and they were like, well, what if it's behind a fence? I mean, then the bees are gonna have to fly up and over before they encounter anybody and that would essentially achieve your, the same aim. That's absolutely a good point. They're absolutely correct. Um, typically, uh, the, you know, what we read in the literature about positioning hives is that if you really want them to like fly over a barrier, it has to be like actually kind of close to it. So that's, um, anyway, that's what, that's this struck out section actually is that we took that out. So forget I said that, but anyway, so you can either have next to a pedestrian right away, a six foot fence, you could have that on a side property line. So a side or rear property line that has a pedestrian access can have a six foot fence. A front property line cannot have a six foot fence. Our code prohibits it. Our code limits fences, walls, structures that are in that front yard set back to 42 inches in height. So there's no way to provide that same level of protection to pedestrians crossing in front of a front yard set back. So that's why there's two separate sections. Um, but wouldn't a front yard set back, Sarah, typically be, do we have front yards that are typically not bordering streets, sidewalks? or even areas where there are no sidewalks. I'm just trying to, I, I still believe that F is gonna dissuade people from potentially becoming interested in this because some people that may not be doable or you know, on smaller lots or substandard lots, there may, may, may not be that room. So I'm just trying to, I'm trying to rectify, I'm trying to imagine a lot that does not, um, where a lot that's face a front yard lot a front yard um, area that is not facing sort of that the pedestrian condition that we're trying to solve I guess that's what I'm trying to trying to understand sure um, so there are plenty of properties that don't have an existing pedestrian right of way they don't currently have a sidewalk right um, and so and still people park along streets so by definition a front property line faces the street. So people park along streets, they do walk along streets even where there's no sidewalk. Um, and that and that is different than being a pedestrian right of way. So a pedestrian right of way could pass any property line. A pedestrian right of way could be at a rear property line if you're adjacent to, um, for example, the trail along Brant Creek, that's a pedestrian right of way. 
um, because it's a rear property line, you could have a six foot fence between your hive and the and the trail, right? So um, because there are conditions where pedestrian rights of way could be on any property line, and we know pedestrians will always interact with a front property line, we felt the need to have two separate standards because you can't have a six foot fence as a mitigation on a front property line. So the only option is a 10 foot setback if you're gonna you know, just be choosing between those two um, placement conditions. I'll also just add uh, that the, the staff recommended amendments uh, do provide uh, a, a great deal more flexibility for high placement on a residential lot than, than most cities that we looked at for this language. And, it, and if there is a case where a property can't make a high placement work based on these conditions, we've still allowed for creative language in the amendment to allow for high placement on public property uh, with, with consent from the city, as well as uh, commercial properties as well. So there, there are options for peacekeepers that aren't able to place a hive on their lot, even with these very flexible uh, requirements. Okay, um, I'm still, I guess I'm still not convinced. I feel, um, I feel like we're uh, unnecessarily sort of making this complicated for folks. Um, I think I'm going to just keep my keep my motion live, um, and and let's see if if we we can if there's agreement with the council. If not, then at least we tried. <laughs> unless, there's, unless there's any other council members that have have thoughts on how to how to I I. I yeah, I'm just just worried that we're we're needlessly restricting kind of this these um, the ability for folks to try to try to do these things in their yards and um, so I'll stop there. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Watkins. Um, I appreciate that the interest to want to facilitate more of these types of opportunities. I do feel a little bit of a hesitation with not having the setback um, because one, I'm I'm personally really allergic to bees, and two, I also recognize rec recognize that there's constraints in terms of what could be, um, you know, in place. But I, I also don't really understand how many, um, like maybe just how many folks really fall into that category and if there is an exception to make it easy for them to um, to have a creative solution um, that we can possibly compromise to integrate that exception into the ordinance. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just not sure. Uh, is it 20? Is it 50? Or is it five? I, I just don't really, I don't really know that um, the level of people that really fall into that category where this wouldn't work personally. Um, maybe staff has more insights into that. But I, I fully understand and the interest in wanting to facilitate more of this happening and um, want to help do that as well without kind of putting any kind of um, loose regulations that could harm neighbors and pedestrians walking by potentially. I don't know if staff if you want to clarify that in terms of your suggestion in the ordinance as kind of a creative solution option for those that might not fit. This is sorry. Um, your question was about um, a solution about this front yard area. Yes. And specific to what um, Vice Mayor Myers was, suggest was suggesting um, changing in the ordinance, I don't know how many people would fall into the category where that would be an impediment for them to be able to move forward with beekeeping? And if right. so, could we identify in the ordinance a uh, uh, non-bureaucratic uh, way to get solutions, you know, established for those for those folks or neighbors? Or, I mean, is it a lot of people? I, I mean, maybe, maybe yeah, that would be helpful. I don't, you know, that's a great question. I don't know how many folks are in this Venn diagram intersection of being on like a highly constrained lot, being really interested in wanting to keep bees um, and 
you know, really not having any other alternative site in a side or rear yard. Um, my, my sense is it's probably not a ton of folks. Um, and there probably are a few, you know, out, out there, because we certainly do have some lots that are constrained and, um, you know, front yards would be the only one that might not be shaded by a building, right? Because the front yard is set back, a front yard property line, there's not going to be another building adjacent to it. Um, so, um, I think, I'm, I think where I'm coming from is it's, it's not just the setbacks, it's the actual climatic conditions on someone's lot, as well as, you know, exposure to wind. I mean, it's, bees don't, I mean, they, you know, I mean, how and where you place your hive, hopefully to be successful from what I understand is, um, you know, it's really kind of dependent on, uh, and I understand the concern certainly about um, protecting the public, but when you when you take the, t the 10 feet, plus you potentially look at the actual layout of your lot, exposure to wind, um, moisture, um, maybe a tree that you have, you know, it, it just continues to constrain, I think, the success of potentially a home bee beekeeper trying to have, you know, a couple of hives. And so um, just trying to kind of look at the big bigger picture around mm -hmm. successful kind of, you know, some some jurisdictions, as uh, as um, Mr. Kundati mentioned, they don't have any restrictions. You know, some cities really just sort of let people sort of sort of do this. I think that the people who are interested in bees are a, a, a group who really understand also um, the the potential dangers of bees. You know, and they you know they're trained to handle these animals. You know, they're trained to really understand how the bee. bee bees are behaving. Many of them do plan um, even vegetation and where they place them so that the bees are moving up. Um, you know, so I guess for me, it's really about, you know, how does someone properly do this in, in the sense that they have success on, on their lot? And I think when we start drawing lines to sort of kind of Try to, and I think, in, in my opinion, it seems like our intent, where we have some protections for pedestrians, um, as well as best practices around um, around how you should really cite something on your property. It feels pretty thorough to me between G and H, um, and that was really my interest in F. Was um, it may be a small amount of properties that are experiencing that, but when you do draw 10 feet. Um, and depending on how your lot works and your exposure and different climatic things, you know, it could it could prevent someone kind of someone someone could throw up their hands, you know. And it's just it's just trying to kind of look at the objective of, of again trying to provide success for folks who might want to get into this. Uh, Councilmember Matthews. Um, I'm prepared to support this on the first reading. I want a few things to point out. Um, we have a, a very old ordinance on the books that has actually never been used, but has been widely disregarded. <laughs> there are many, 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 many beekeepers in the city, and um, maybe one complaint that we know of over over time. Um, and I think that just speaks to the fact that they are locating the hive in a way that um, works for the bees and is not a public nuisance. Um, I'm aware of bee allergies. I took my next door neighbor kid to the ER when he went into shock <laughs> for the bee thing. He happened to get it riding his bike across town. <laughs> but, um, and my garden is full of bees all the time. So we live with bees and um, by and large, if people have bee allergies, they know that and they're prepared for it. But by and large, they're a really necessary part of our environment, as we know increasingly. So um, I think for the first reading, um, I'd, I'd like to give this a shot. Um, and I, again, I want to appreciate all the work that staff put into it, and Ethan and beekeepers. Um, I think it is true that uh, these many cities don't regulate it at all. And that was partly my interest in putting in the legislative intent is both that we protect community safety and encourage the practice of beekeeping. I changed the language from hobby to practice. <laughs> so that's, that's where I'm falling down. Uh, 
Allah Wa Alaikum Salam. No, I just wanted to say I appreciate the context of the um, the optimal space for it to thrive, as opposed to sort of the parameters around safety, because I think that that's kind of a different mindset to approach it. Um, but then I just wanted to see if Lee had anything to say. I saw that you kind of popped on here in terms of you know the ordinance language and what's the most appropriate kind of um, kind of shift or edit. Sure. Um, so thank you, Councilmember Watkins. And um, the, the thing that I was looking at that I was uh, trying to digest as I was seeing the revised motion is um, that relationship between F and G. Um, and you know what I'll do? I will go ahead and um, share my screen here quickly so we've all got the language in front of us. Um, so in F, they're saying uh, no hives shall be maintained less than 10 feet from the front property line. In G, it's specified, and that's the uh, section that Councilmember Myers was proposing to delete. And then in G, it was uh, specifying that there's a setback of a minimum of 10 feet from the pedestrian right of way. And that includes a street where no sidewalk has been constructed. And given that, uh, you know, this, I, see, I do see this as somewhat of a compromise, sort of a middle ground, because um, the property line oftentimes is set back from the sidewalk. And so that uh, creates a, a larger burden on a property owner. Um, if, you know, they're setting back from the curb, for example, the property line could be five feet or so uh, towards uh, the inside of that property. And um, really what we're trying to address is a separation between the pedestrian and the, um, the, the hive. Um, so I do think that you know, this uh, can meet that intent of providing that separation and it's not pegged to the property line that, that could you know, create if we just had this and there was a setback from the sidewalk or the street, you know, it, it could be 15 feet setback from you know, the curb. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to point that out um, as far as um, something that, that I realized as, as we were coming through this uh, conversation and, and it thought it may be helpful for the council to consider. from council members at this time. Okay, hearing none, uh, we have a motion by Vice Mayor Myers, seconded by council member Golder, um, to adopt the... To introduce. To introduce the ordinance for the city council of the city of Santa Cruz amending apiary regulations in chapter 24.12 of the municipal code. Um, deleting item F, um, and then deleting item two and H yeah. number two. Yeah, I'm sorry, Bonnie. That yeah, that strike through can can go away. Which one? Uh, in in H two. Sorry, I that was in the original language, but I I believe that that probably should stay in because now we've changed it to any of the following strategies. Okay. Great. Um, along with the friendly amendment by Councilman Matthews add a legislative intent to the order, which is accepted. And so um, I think given the information that we just received, I also feel like um, by striking F but maintaining G, that I think we'll probably get to the um, safeguards that we're hoping to have in place regarding the e hives being too close to sidewalks. So if there's no further um, questions or comments, I'll turn it over to the clerk to please call the roll. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously, and we've got about a 10 minute break until uh, <laughs> the full communications, unfortunately. But um, yep, we'll meet.
back here at around 5.30. Everyone be happy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so with that, uh, good evening and welcome to our 5.30 p.m. session of the October 13th, 2020 meeting of the City Council. I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers. Looks like she just stepped away. Oh, um, Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Boulder? Here. Watkins? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. Mayor Cumming? Here. And Councilmember Byers is back as well. Okay, so with that, we'll go ahead and start oral communications. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you'd like to call in to comment on some, an item that is not on the City Council agenda, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Oral communications is an, um, sorry. And if you're interested in addressing the council, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Um, once you have been acknowledged and asked to unmute your phone, you will be given two minutes. Okay, so first caller. Can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Hi, <coughs> sorry about the car accident. That's, I hope that <laughs> gets it's easy. Um, my name's Serge Cagno, uh, I'm stepping up Santa Cruz. I'm a consultant for homeless services, uh, helping with the county with design and policies of the new shelter. Uh, I'm also on the county's mental health advisory board. I've been heartened this year that through every new adversity, through the pandemic, through the fires, through the chaos of federal direction and misdirection, that we faced each new challenge with compassion, funding, and long hours. We've all worked harder than ever before to take care of each other except in one way. It disheartened me listening to the discussion of the grand jury report at the last city council meeting. There was no acceptance of responsibility in the city. It was all blamed on the county. The county's responsible for services, the county's responsible for homelessness, the county, the county. It disheartened me listening to speeches from Friday's homeless encampment tour. Again, it's the county and the other jurisdictions that should take our homeless, those who live here those whose families are here, those whose friends are here, those who get services here. Like there's something that is worth less than everybody else who lives in the city of Santa Cruz. The city of Santa Cruz should take responsibility for the lack of compassion with which we treat the homeless. The Santa Cruz police enforce ordinances at the direction of the city council, constantly forcing people to move whose crime is being so poor and living in such chaos that they cannot afford a home. When we admit that the way that the Santa Cruz Police Department, the Rangers and the city treat those without houses is why they do not wanna be a part of the system of the county services, then we can move forward to help them. We need to take responsibility that the debt that they rack up from the unpayable tickets of blocking a sidewalk or sleeping in a place where someone complains makes them unhousable. Housing navigators try to house, house people using section eight or people try to get jobs and get into a program that can help them with a deposit. But when the landlord checks, does a credit check and they owe $10,000, they're denied. And we continue having that person on our streets. It goes well, it never goes well to disenfranchise a part of our population, whether it's color, sexual identity or orientation, socioeconomic status, mental health diagnosis or substance use diagnosis. We should get on the right side of history, compassion to solve the problems, and we do have problems, can help us move forward. I'm sorry that it's only the, the, the activists yell and demand a judge. I'm sorry that others honk, throw things, judge, and demand that the homeless leave Santa Cruz. There is a middle ground, as there is with everything. The new shelters are low barrier, keeping rules for safety and being flexible to solve people's needs. I believe they are safer and have less calls for service because of that. Working together is more efficient. 
blaming and ticketing, throwing more and more ordinances and judgment does not work anywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next caller, you have two minutes. Yeah, hi, this is Garrett again. Uh, I would like to clarify that there is no free speech right that involves vandalizing, littering, proclaiming, or taking possession of the historic clock tower as a sacred altar to anybody. It contains historic artifacts and was dedicated already to the bicentennial, has many respectful uses as public property, and deserves that respect and protection from communist, SDA, or anarchist, or other inspired BLM sympathizer appropriation. If their goal is to provoke the police by inappropriately claiming possession, and vandalizing this public property, they should have perhaps that confrontation. If the city has a problem with protecting any property, we need new leadership. The defamation that police or the United States itself is systemically racist to essentially hunt black people or that there is no justice in the United States is a monstrous lie. Destroying America with violence and lies is not justice, but it is dysfunctional revolution and is the chaos of anarchy. It's time for the guilt brainwash to stop supporting the BLM by throwing the I'm virtuous two thirty dollars dollars BLM yard signs and clock tower propaganda in the trash. Then vote the progressives out in November or submit to anarchy. This election is not a referendum on Trump's personality, but a referendum on the longtime far leftist radicalization of the Democratic Party by decades of very un American lies told by media, press, educational systems, socialists, anarchists, and communists. If Biden wins, he will be steamrolled by the far left, and if he is even allowed to serve out his term, the Supreme Court will be packed and converted into another far left political branch and two grand Democratic states added to reclaim the Senate, permanently installing the far left into power, and the 240-year experiment in a free people will be over, and the United States will become an everyone is equally poor socialist has-been country. It will be big government, little people. I personally am voting no on all the propositions because raising taxes has always seemed to result in a bigger, more costly, no more effective government. Lastly, I'd mention the purpose of the city is to provide public services available to everyone, not leftist special interests. There's zero justification for partisan social justice justice warring on the city council and limiting your function to providing those services at value, respecting the trust accorded to you by the people in light of the fact it operates as a monopoly of force and function is appropriate. Thanks. Okay, are there any other members of the public who would like to address us during oral communications? If so, now is the time to call in on your phone. Once you've called in, please press star nine uh, to raise your hand and you will be given two minutes. Okay, seeing no other members of the public who would like to address us on this item, we're going to um, go ahead and break until 6 p.m. for our last item on our agenda, which is the Parks Master Plan 2030 Environmental Impact Report. waiting for council member Watkins, but um, maybe while we're waiting, I can just read a few, make a few announcements. So <clears throat> for members of the public who are joining us, uh, we're about to begin our final item of the evening, which is our Parks Master Plan 2030 in our environmental impact report. Uh, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you would like to comment on. Now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, um, followed by questions from council, and we will then take public comment and return to the council for action and deliberation on this item. The presenters this evening are gonna be Noah Downing, Parks Planner, Travis Beck, Parks Superintendent, and Tony Elliott, Director of Parks and Recreation. And with that, I think I'll go ahead and turn it over to our Parks Department for the presentation this evening. Okay, good evening, uh, Mayor Cummings, Vice Mayor Myers, members of the council. I am Travis Beck, Superintendent of Parks. 
Well, I think we can all agree that 2020 has been a trying year for all of us. For those of us in parks and recreation, it has also been an invigorating year because we have seen how much our community depends on the parks that we steward and on the services that we provide. Even during the strictest weeks of the lockdown, people flooded into our open spaces and beaches. Even when we closed our parks and amenities within them, people continued to use them. And this validates what we have always felt, which is that it is critical that we maintain our parks well and that we continue to invest in them. And that is why we are so energized to be before you this evening to discuss the Parks Master Plan 2030 and the Associated Environmental Impact Report. Now, many of you know very well that this process has taken a long time. And since the master plan was last before the council, we have an entirely new leadership team within the Parks and Recreation Department. But as we on this new team have gotten to know this document, which we to some degree inherited, we've really been uh, impressed with the quality of it, with the thoughtfulness behind it, and with the thoroughness of the public process that underlies it. And we feel very strongly that this document will give us the guidance that we need to continue to invest in our park system so that we can better serve our community through this pandemic and in the years beyond. So I'd like to turn it over next to our park planner, Noah Downing, who has been with this process from the very beginning to bring everyone up to speed on how we got to where we are today, some of the key content of the plan, and uh, what we're looking for as next steps. Noah? Thank you, Travis. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council members, members of the public. I'm very pleased to bring forth this item today. The city hasn't had a city-wide park master plan since its first one in 1973. There's been various efforts and initiatives throughout the years, but in terms of a citywide uh, master planning effort, it's, it's been quite a long time. Um, so it's part of this process. Right? Some of the goals of the project were, you know, one, to implement the general plan. Uh, there is an action to create a, a parks master plan to conduct a comprehensive outreach effort to identify needs and desires of community and park users to identify and assess existing assets, to create a feasible vision and goals to prioritize community needs, to generate policies and actions to support goals, and to create a resource document for the general public. There was uh, a lot of community outreach, but thought this was a great opportunity to, to check in. Um, we did both quantitative and qualitative um, outreach. There was a community survey um, done by Godby Research uh, which was statistically valid in 2015. And, and really that was just trying to get a baseline of, of user pre preferences. Later in, on in the process, we actually did a similar survey and um, on more specific topics and uh, specific park assets that kind of arose through the process. There was also qualitative outreach. We did community open house meetings. We passed out uh, questionnaires, uh, community events, community fil facilities, went out on the weekends, just trying to get an idea of, of who's using the parks and, and you know what, what they would like to see in them. Uh, we had an online present, presence with questionnaires and emailed comments. We posted signs in all of our parks for numerous months with links to that. There were joint study sessions with Parks and Rec Commission and City Council. Uh, there was a parks master plan subcommittee that was formed with numerous meetings that were held on specific uh, topics we held a parks and recreation department-wide staff meeting to collect feedback from uh, our staff that are in the in the field you know sometimes for you know i've been working here in decades and just hear day in day out from different park users and you know after spending so much time have ideas of their own so we really wanted to incorporate their feedback into the process we had city staff meetings with other departments on shared assets, uh, had specific stakeholder interviews, and then uh, really brought in feedback from other meetings on park-related projects just to make sure that uh, the planning effort was current. From all that, we created a, a master plan vision, and that is to create a quality park system that connects the surrounding green belt to the Pacific Ocean, preserves and protects our natural heritage, 
enhances cultural and recreational environments, and provides a diversity of experiences. We really brought in the outreach and the needs assessment and emerging trends, analyzed it, and really saw some overall themes that we're developing, and then created goals, policies, and actions uh, that were grouped within those themes. Um, in terms of the draft parks master plan, which released in February 2017, what went into it was public input and analysis of existing plans, guidance documents, demographic data, existing conditions, benchmarking of comparable communities. We evaluated specific site characteristics and limitations or opportunities. We had to identify our facilities and site furnishing conditions and, and evaluated you know, whether or not repairs were, were necessary, looked at statewide recreational trends, had discussions with supervisors who managed the assets, uh, really brought in direction received from other planning processes as well as feedback received from decision makers. And then in terms of the overall themes that emerged, good governance, design excellence, play community health and interaction, stewardship and sustainability, an accessible and connected community and, and just formulating part partnerships. And just some examples, um, there's, there's a goal and a policy to design, renovate, and maintain parks to be attractive and functional, increase longer-term use, optimize space, and enhance the unique identity for each park. Um, you know, just trying to, to look at parks over time, sometimes uh, parks are become outdated and are piecemeal and just trying to make sure that the end result is uh, creating a, a sense of identity um, for, the, for the neighborhoods or surrounding areas they serve. Uh, to renovate and maintain playgrounds to create more unique and interesting play experiences. We received ideas, uh, you know, universally designed playgrounds and members of all ages and abilities can uh, play on the same playgrounds together or using more natural features to create more interesting playgrounds. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of great ideas and examples that we currently don't have in our park system. There was one to protect, maintain, and enhance habitat features that are important to native wildlife and plant communities, ideas uh, that are incorporated in the plan, um, you know, to, to consider even our urban parks, uh, taking out unusable turf area and, and creating more of the pollinator parks and, and trying, trying to create more uh, wildlife uh, areas or habitat. So when the draft was released, we um, wanted to ensure that there were other opportunities to vet the ideas. There were, was a joint study session with the Parks and Recreation Commission and City Council. We held five additional meetings with the Parks and Recreation Commission to discuss specific recommendations of the plan. We formed a technical advisory group to improve the conservation and stewardship section. And then on uh, September 25th, 2017, the plan was unanimously accepted or recommended for acceptance from the Parks and Recreation Commission pending environmental review. And then back in October of 2017, the City Council unanimously accepts, accepted the draft pending environmental review. Uh, so we, we started the, the CEQA process. Um, there was an initial study mitigated negative decoration and circulated. We didn't uh, identify any significant impacts which couldn't be mitigated. We received some comments. We revised and recirculated that document. We received some additional comments. And city staff at that point in time determined that an EIR would be prepared for full public disclosure of potential impacts and mitigation measures, um, despite that there weren't any uh, impacts that, that we found that could not be mitigated to a less than significant level. We circulated a draft EIR, we received the comments, and the final EIR, which is part of this item, includes changes made to the draft EIR to address comments as well as responses to comments. It was prepared in accordance with CEQA as a program EIR, and then all elements of the master plan have been evaluated in the EIR. In terms of some of the potentially significant impacts which were identified, impacts, potential impacts in nesting birds, uh, soil and erosion impacts, and water quality impacts, the mitigations include conducting pre-nesting surveys, prohibiting uh, a drones course within sensitive habitat areas, uh, implementing site design and erosion control measures as part of projects, and limiting trail use or implementing trail closures during the rainy season to address impacts. As part of an EIR process, um, we evaluate uh, different alternatives. There was the no project alternative with us, the Parks and Rec Creation Department City moving forward with no master plan. We evaluated a reduced project alternative where there would be no exploration of a drone course, 
no like exploration of new trails and De La Viega Park and Pogonip open space beyond what is already specified in their respective existing master plans. And then there was a modified project alternative where the city would clarify, add a clarifying language to further ensure new development avoids impacting nesting birds, that any drone course would avoid sensitive habitat areas and wildlife, and a site design and erosion control measures to ensure new development avoids impacts and, uh, and erosion hazards and are located uh, just adjacent to wetlands or streams. So uh, in August, on August 3rd, uh, that we uh, brought an item to the Parks and Recreation Commission. There was a split vote. Um, at the meeting, the uh, commissioners discussed various ways to try to find a, a compromise to bring uh, the item forward. One idea was just to create an ordinance to ban all drone use. Another was to prioritize maintenance of trails instead of evaluating new trails when the trail study moves forward at a future point in time. And then another idea was to remove all policies and actions regarding off-leash dog use, a drones course, um, or trails. Uh, due to the split vote, the Parks and Recreation bylaws re require the item to be continued. It was uh, heard again on September 14th, um, and there was another split vote. Uh, it, the, the bylaws then, um, with another split vote, the item failed per the bylaws. In terms of the item tonight, as part of the CEQA process requirements, in adopting the parks master plan, the city also needs to certify the final EIR and then adopt the findings of fact and mitigation monitoring and reporting program. And I just wanted to kind of provide uh, an overview of some of the, the benefits of the plan. I mean, the first one is it implements the general plan as a specific action. It provides a guiding framework and is intended to be updated over time to remain relevant. It identifies community needs and provides goals, policies, and actions to meet them. It helps the city prioritize projects and allocate funding and staff time. It facilitates community engagement and transparency as projects move forward. And maintaining a plan is actually required to meet the professional standard from the Commission for Accreditation of Parks and Recreation Agencies. So presently, we're not meeting the minimum standard. And it helps the city pursue grant funding. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Director Tony Elliott. All right, thank you, Noah, and thanks to Travis. Thanks to uh, Mayor and City Council um, as well. I just wanted to touch on a few of those points in a little bit more detail, and I'll send it back to Noah here in just a moment to summarize our uh, staff recommendations for the City Council uh, this evening. But uh, to start, I just wanted to mention, uh, in the context of the city's budget crunch that we're going through uh, right now, the master plan really serves as our, as our North Star. So despite the challenges financially, uh, the, the modifications that we're having to make within the department or, or services and so forth as a result of, of tight budgets. This is really, this document is giving us that, that guidance, that overall um, sort of North Star for the department and in a way the North Star for, uh, for the community as well. So we've tried to be very transparent, very clear. Um, and this is a really high level document. It's not, uh, we don't have a lot of specifics at this point, but it's a very high level um, a sort of living document um, that can help guide us into the future, uh, especially during some uh, some tumultuous uh, financial times. Um, there are opportunities, uh, especially with the Parks Master Plan, Noah mentioned um, opportunities regarding grant funding. And at this moment in time, there are uh, likely more grant opportunities for parks and recreation than ever before. Uh, we have Prop 68 funds available through the state of California. Uh, the Land and Water Conservation Fund was passed um, by the Congress uh, earlier this year, and that is an appropriation of $900 million per year for Parks and Rec. Uh, so there are grant opportunities that are out there, but having the master plan in place, um, number one, primarily opens that door for us to apply for those grants. It puts us in a position uh, to be able to apply, uh, to be eligible, and to be as competitive as we can be uh, for these grant funds that we will uh, we will need moving into the future. Um, Noah also mentioned CAPRA accreditation, our national uh, trade organization, the National Recreation and Parks Association uh, accredits agencies, uh, parks and recreation agencies all over the country. And it's a best practice to have a parks and recreation master plan in place. Again, as a guiding document for who we are and what we do and how we develop and, and evolve the park system over time. Um, uh, and
then and then also um, you know as it relates to our operations and as we talk about fiscal sustainability the services that we provide uh, to some degree through uh, programming active recreation and passive recreation opportunities it helps guide us on all of that so through our national trade organization and um, in, in our pursuit of becoming a nationally accredited agency it is a best practice uh, to have a master plan uh, in place so i just wanted to add a little detail to those and finally um, as uh, superintendent beck mentioned at the beginning of the presentation uh, this has been a long process and so i just wanted to i wanted to thank uh, the mayor and city council and as well as previous um, mayors and city councils who've been a part of this um, i also wanted to thank the parks and recreation commission um, and the community as well. The feedback that we've received through the mitigated negative declaration process, through the EIR process, that helped uh, make this plan better to get that feedback from the community. So I wanted to appreciate that feedback. Um, and then here on the call uh, as well is uh, our consultant from DUDEC, uh, Stephanie Strilo, uh, City Attorney Tony Condotti, and Darcy Pruitt. Um, and just wanted to acknowledge their work and support on this as well. It's been a team effort over a number of years. So just wanted to appreciate uh, everybody's efforts that have gone into this. And uh, with that, I'll send it back over to Noah to summarize the staff recommendation that we have for the council this evening. Noah, you're muted. My apologies. With that, staff recommends the City Council adopt the following resolution, a resolution, re resolution certifying the final environmental impact report, a resolution including findings of fact and a mitigation monitoring and reporting program, and a resolution approving the Parks Master Plan 2030. Uh, staff's available uh, for questions. Okay, well, thank you for your presentation. And again, thank um, you all and the community for all the hard work that went into what is an extremely extensive document that I think is going to be, as our uh, parks director said, it's going to be a, a good document to help guide us as we're moving into the future. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to any council members to see if there's any questions for our staff. Uh, council member Byers. You're, you're muted as well. Thank you, Park staff, for the presentation. Uh, my question goes, and I think uh, one of the, it, it mentioned drones, whatever. It, can you go back to that one? Sure. I think it was a commission, was the title or something. Uh, yes, that, okay, that's it. Um, to ban, ban drones in the city, I understand that. Okay, prior to the maintenance of trails, instead of evaluating new trails when the trail study moves forward. Of course, when I'm asking the question because at one time there was a lot of buzz and a lot of up and down about uh, more mountain bike trails. So would you update me where the commission is or where the staff is on that? Yeah, so there's a, an action in the plan which um, discusses conducting a, a trails assessment and it would you know evaluate uh, existing trail conditions and maintenance needs as well as um, the potential to evaluate new opportunities. So that's the way of, the, so I interpret that your, your priority is to uh, provide maintenance on the existing trails. Uh, the, the, the study would um, be done in such a way where we would try to evaluate and the end product would hopefully have some better um, newer design standards associated with it, um, have an idea of where some of these use conflicts are occurring, look at some of the signage needs that need to be updated in there, and really just thinking of it as, as, a, as a comprehensive look at our trails. Because, you know, the, the major one on Pogonep, which doesn't allow bikes, and uh, consistently, uh, there's a bike or two on there. Okay, so uh, when when is that all happening? Looking at the trail plan, you called it. I'm not sure what you called it. Other uh, currently isn't uh, a date of of the study. You know, the, the one thing that um, you know I could I could throw out there um, just to kind of help facilitate uh, discussion is 
you know, when we move forward with these projects, uh, we're going to be, you know, working with the Parks and Rec Commission, um, sure. as well as the City Council to help identify, you know, what uh, the overall scope of these projects are. Okay. And it may or may not uh, trigger a EIR. It could. I, I think it really depends on, you know, there's a couple steps in the process. One is conducting the study, and then the mm -hmm. second is initiating a process if there's any improvements um, okay. that are moving forward at some unknown time. So you mentioned Poganip, so if at some future time there was an indication from the council and community to initiate a process, there is an existing master plan, there would have to be a public process, you would have to look at the environmental um, and you know make that determination um, based on on where it is and I guess the, the feedback that you're hearing hearing add if I may add one comment to that just big picture um, one of the items that we discussed with the Parks and Recreation Commission in quite a bit of detail is the difference between a program EIR and project level CEQA and so whether it's trails or whether it's new pickleball courts or any amenity I think that's a key difference here that this is a program level EIR again really high level broad themes right. uh, but once we get to um, even any thought of pursuing uh, the trail study or any specific project uh, that of course is subject to going to the commission and the city council for direction approval budget appropriation uh, direction uh, and then that project level CEQA for the project uh, in question thank you thank you uh, both of you have answered my question thanks okay. Okay. Um, we've got vice mayor Myers and then councilmember Brown yeah, Tony, you mentioned that um, we um, that you were wanting to have us, um, our city parks department, become accredited. Um, and can you just speak a little bit more about that process? How long it takes? What kinds of? I, I've been through an accreditation program for a land trust, and that was extensive and took almost two years. So I'm just curious a little bit more about what that looks like. Thank you. If you could just describe. Thanks. Sure. Uh, so you're right on. So uh, national accreditation for parks and recreation agencies is a two-year process. There are 151 different standards uh, across 10 different chapters. Uh, those include everything from the basics uh, in terms of uh, master plan, strategic plans, uh, mission statement, vision values, uh, budget, and so forth. Uh, but it gets into uh, public safety plans, <clears throat> excuse me, marketing and advertising um, plans, um, uh, recreation and leisure studies, um, revenue policies, uh, any number of, of details. I'd be happy to share that with the council or the community. Um, it's called, the acronym is CAPRA, C-A-P-R-A, um, and uh, a number of different standards that really cross uh, a variety of departments. It crosses into the police department, uh, in Santa Cruz, it would cross into marketing and promotions and communications that would largely uh, fall under the city manager's office. So it's really a collaborative effort across the city uh, in a number of different factors uh, that focus on just the, the top level of, of organization, uh, professionalism, um, and planning, especially as it relates to um, uh, uh, financial sustainability um, over time. Thank you, that's uh, helpful to hear and I'm uh, very excited. I think um, that is, uh, yeah, that's a great uh, a great outcome. I think our Parks Department has always been the unsung hero, so um, Parks, and, Parks and Recreation, so um, excited to hear more about that. So thank you for the more detail. All right, Council Member Brown. Well, first, I just want to say thank you um, to our Parks and Rec staff and the Parks and Rec Commission and everybody who's taken time to um, move us through this process. Um, I want to um, just ask a, one question because I'm, I'm still trying to understand uh, the concerns coming from the Parks and Rec Commission. And I, I think I, I just want to, or some members of the Parks and Rec Commission, um, 
so uh, and my so from my read and again i'm i'm my i'm interpreting to the best of my abilities based on my my background um is that the um <clears throat> The, so the programmatic EIR is high-level conceptual, uh, kind of covers the whole uh, the whole Magilla, but their project EIRs would occur in cases where there's work to you know specific work to be done that requires in that kind of environmental review. Um, so then that would be in tearing off of the programmatic EIR, as I understand it. So, but then what are the, the pathways forward from there and how does the, um, how does that work with, you know, so, so for, so I guess what I, the, the thing that I'm trying to understand specifically is if um, there, the project specific EIRs will study potential impact, um, and, but then we in the programmatic EIR are saying that, um, there's either no significant impact or less than significant impact with mitigations, then it's kind of like we know that <clears throat> we're saying we need to look at, uh, you know, we need to look at what is the potential environmental impact, but we're also saying we know it's not going to be significant enough to require um, anything, it, that it could be dealt with with mitigation. So I guess if somebody could just help me understand how that, how that squares, I'm, I'm just, again, I just want to make sure I know what, um, what's going on here. Stephanie, do you want to hop in here? Uh, sure. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. Stephanie Strela with DUDEC, um, prepared the EIR. And yeah, let me try to give you a, a quick overview. So the program EIR is, um, looks at the whole of the entire project. So it's looking at all the policies, all the various recommendations, there's various policies that um, suggest looking or considering new uses or expanded uses, not only trails, but off-leash um, dog areas, um, community gardens, athletic fields. And then it also provides specific recommendations for individual parks and facilities. Most of those are relatively minor. So the EIR on a program level looks at those and what kinds of impacts could occur from new trails or some of these new uses. And then it looks at um, the policies and actions that are in the plan that direct the city to not locate um, projects in sensitive habitat, um, control drainage so there's not uh, erosion problems. So on a program level, those measures serve to mitigate the kinds of impacts we're looking at in the absence of a specific project in a specific location. So further down the road, if there's a specific project in a specific location, then we would go and look at the master plan EIR and see what kind of mitigation measures or what measures are in there. But then more importantly, under CEQA, we'd have to look at a project level analysis based on the location and design of a project at that point in time. So it's a little bit more specific then. You can really, you know, um, you would still have to comply with the actions and measures that that are in the master plan that seek to avoid or minimize impacts, but you would be looking at it at a specific level, project level, when there's a known location and type of project. Does that make sense? Linda? <laughs> yeah, no, it does, and I'm just, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around it, but I, I think so, yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's just so complicated. Okay. Um, are there any other questions for staff from council members at this point in time? Okay, seeing none, <clears throat> I'd like to open it up to public comment. So if there are any members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, uh, which is item number 27, Parks Master Plan 2030, an environmental impact report, um, now is the time to call in. Once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And once you've been acknowledged, unless you've um, contacted the city earlier, you'll be given two minutes to speak. So again, once you've called in, if you'd like to comment on this item, please press star nine on your phone. You will be unmuted when it's your turn to speak and you'll have two minutes.
right, first speaker, you've been unmuted. Hi, good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. This is John Paholsky. I'm a board member of the Santa Cruz Pickleball Club. Um, our club is thankful for being allowed to participate in the park's master planning process. We feel our voices were heard, and the plan shows a lot of work by Tony, Travis, and Noah and the other parks and rec folks. They're always working hard. Our club is very excited to see the plan finalized and that pickleball is on the list of projects. We're very much looking forward to begin executing on the plan, working with Parks and Rec in the city to see our dream of permanent pickleball courts come true and bringing the drive pickleball to Santa Cruz. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. The last four digits are 0693, you're on the line. Hi, this is Rick Wright, I'm the president of the board of Santa Cruz Shakespeare, and I'm uh, very pleased to be addressing the council tonight, and I'm calling to express our support of both the Parks Master Plan and the EIR. Uh, I think that the, the public deserves uh, a master plan after many, many years. And SCS is certainly very pleased to be part of the new master plan, and it will help us to know that we have a place in the plan and part of the future vision and values and direction. And I'll just say that when we um, built our theater now um, five years ago, if such a plan had been in place, it would have really improved our ability to um, build infrastructure and support the city and our patrons and to um, to improve the use of uh, parks within the city. So I hope that this will move forward. I certainly encourage everyone to approve it. It's been a long time coming and I certainly support all those folks in Parks and Rec that have um, worked so hard diligently to pull this thing together. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next caller. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, good evening. Good evening, this is Jean Brocklebank. I have been working on this master plan for years, have great deal of respect for park staff, Noah Downing especially. There is controversy to this master plan. The park's master plan has been consistently challenged because it allows adding new mountain bike trails in Poconip especially. This is in conflict with the existing Poconip master plan. This should have been deleted from the park's master plan. It wasn't. This conflict has been identified for the past four plus years to parks which refuses to acknowledge that the Pogan <laughs> Master Plan is the rule of law right now. To overturn the Pogan Master Plan will most surely require an EIR, but City Park staff will no doubt find a way to say no EIR will be required. If I was a member of the City Council, I would vote no on approving this Master Plan for the reasons I've given. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Last four digits of Hello, you're on the line. All right, hey, sorry about that. Uh, Matt DeYoung here with Mountain Bikers of Santa Cruz. Uh, hello, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, we've been engaged with uh, this process since almost day one in terms of getting the community engaged uh, in the process. 
out to the meetings, taking the surveys and whatnot. And, uh, you know, it's it's been amazing the amount of work and public input that's gone into this plan. Staff has done an amazing job at, at, at driving this thing forward, despite some challenges and changes in staffing and COVID and, and threatened litigation. So it's been amazing to see it come to this, this far. And it's really encouraged uh, council to accept staff's recommendations um, I think we heard it from from uh, from Tony and Noah and Travis how, how much they really need this right now with the challenging budgetary climate that that this is really a path forward for them to seek some creative means of funding for different uh, parks and programs. So um, just on behalf of mountain bikers and stankers in the community, just uh, encourage you guys to accept staff recommendation and accept the plan. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. Okay, our next speaker, I had called in asking for additional time um, on behalf of Active Recreation Coalition. And so I'll, the next speaker. Mr. Cummings. This is Mr. Goldberg. Um, thank you for uh, granting me the extra time. I've been uh, working uh, with uh, Parks and Rec for more than 30 years to get sports fields to the city of Santa Cruz. I was on the Green Belt uh, Master Plan Feasibility Study, and we did an additional study, a sports fields uh, site evaluation and needs in 1994, and determined we need uh, a minimum of 20 acres of 10 multi fields. Uh, that was after a year-long study with, in which every independent sports league uh, participated, 100% participation, led by Woody Bookout. Um, and I've been doing records requests and um, speaking in front of council for 30 years to get a more sports field. And I find this uh, uh, Parks Master Plan to be deficient and, and fairly flawed in, in many ways, and, and uh, I'm going to just hit a few of the worst ones. Um, one is that there is, a, uh, when it talks about finding actions and programs to find new fields and, and new facilities, parks and zoning has no criteria and no divisions for, for what's appropriate in any particular area. And that's one of the reasons every time we try to do anything in any park, there's an endless debate, uh, an endless vicious debate, and it's very difficult to get anything accomplished. Um, Active Recreation Coalition, are, are, uh, we're all about places to play for adults and youth, safe places to play. You use the word ample in the number one goal uh, uh, for uh, uh, parks and recreation, ample recreational pursuit. I'd like to see a, a definition of ample. Um, we, our, our study, our year-long study, studied every single season, the overlapping season and, and the need for every month, and it was different for every month, and came up with an average of needing 10 new multi-purpose fields at 20 acres. Uh, the city wants to go out and buy new land. The, the price of land now in Santa Cruz is two to two and a half million dollars an acre for usable land. If you look at Riverside, uh, the Riverside or Riverview Park, that's what they pay for that little half acre park. Uh, that's, what, that's what the value of the industrial land is on the west side. If you want to see a proposal that I did that, that was covered by the Good Times, uh, the, the article to look up is uh, a West Side proposal, talking all about a proposal would not cost the city a dime, simply an ordinance giving credit, Quimby credit, uh, for any private developer who puts active recreation facilities on their land and make that credit uh, transferable. Um, I've worked, uh, I've raised three sons. I've been in every city park. I have a map, a Google map of every single possible field in, the, in every field in the city and their size and their condition. Um, I offered that to the city. They didn't take it back when uh, the, the previous uh, recreation supervisor, uh, uh, director Morrow was there. I applaud Noah's work. Noah agrees that there's some severe definitional problems. I addressed those in detail in an article uh, uh, I sent to the city, everybody in the city several times. It's called uh, uh, Parks versus No Open Space. What are we talking about? And talks about all the definitional problems in, in our zoning and in our parks. Uh, the city, if you look on the city's general plan use, general plan use map, and you'll see that the, the state parks and the city parks are the exact same shade of green. Uh, that's uh, the confusion in the, in the use 
and the mission of those two different parks, urban parks, have entirely different mission and use than the state parks. Uh, Lighthouse Field originally bought for over $13 million uh, uh, back in the 70s, uh, um, was offered to the city, was offered to the city, and they and didn't disclose the price, I found it out later, $1.4 million. That shows you how much they wanted. Okay, it would make a wonderful municipal park and there's room for a couple of ball fields, uh, but the city lost their lease because they brought in dog years. Uh, am I done here? Nope. All right. Thank you very much for your comments. Hey, can I address uh, just one one thing, one sentence to Susan Strelo? I'm sorry, I gotta. I'm gonna have to cut you off here, but um, you know, we gave you extra time, and I appreciate. You well, calling in. I'll <clears throat> okay. So again, if there are members of the public who would like to address us on uh, item number 27, if you called in and you haven't had a chance to speak, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will be given up to two minutes to speak. Okay, next speaker, um, you can unmute, you're on the line. Uh, is that me? Yes, it is, good evening. Oh, oh, thank you. Um, it's a bit complicated this way. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, I'm Gillian Greenside, and I am a commission member for the Parks and Recreation Commission. Um, but I'm calling in just to express my personal view, not representing the commission or any other commissioners. I did vote no on approving this um, EIR, the Parks Master Plan, and the reasons were pretty uh, straightforward. There are, there's much to really appreciate about this Parks Master Plan. All of the local parks and all of the, the uh, care for safety, you know, that's terrific. However, it includes a number of controversial issues. Um, the technical downhill trail for mountain bikes, um, off-leash dog parks, parking lots, a drone course. Now, what I voted was take all of that out, and I'm happy to support this. But it wasn't taken out. And each of those was determined on this program, EIR, to have less than significant impact. Well, you can't have it both ways. If you're going to defer studying these till later, then the best you could say is we don't know the impact at this time. But this Parks Master Plan says we do know the impacts and they're less than significant and we can mitigate them. So that was the basis on which I said I can't support this plan. You know, 90% yes, but that's not accurate nor scientific. So I just wanted to call in and say that was the reason that I couldn't support it. If that could have been taken out, those controversial issues could be studied later, that would be good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there any um, further members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item? If so, now is the time to call in and press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. If you haven't spoken already, and you will be given two minutes. Okay, uh, seeing no other members of the public who would like to speak to us on these items, I'm going to close public comment, and I'll bring it back to council uh, for action and deliberation. I did have um, a couple questions. I wanted wondering if, if maybe somebody. Um, from park staff could kind of speak to um, some of the comments that came up around um, the off-leash dog use, drone course, and some of the trail comments that were brought up. And I guess my specific, um, I guess one of my questions is if those, for example, if there was moving, you know, in the future, the proposal to create a 
an off-leash dog park somewhere or a drones course, would that then kick in additional environmental review process for the specific the specific areas under study of where they'd be proposed for? So that's how I am more or less interpret it, interpreting this. <clears throat> The answer is yes, we would evaluate CEQA. Um, the, depending on the location though, if it's a small off-leash, for example, if it's a small off-leash dog use area at an existing develop, let's say a community park, um, it, it, it may not raise uh, to a level where, you know, uh, an EIR is required. If there would be CEQA review, we would analyze that, but it may not necessitate a, a full uh, environmental impact report. That's, that's kind of how I was understanding this as well, so thanks for the clarification. Um, Council Member Byers and Vice Mayor Myers and Council Member Brown. Council Member Byers, you're muted. I'm not sure if you were trying to speak. I haven't yet, but um, it's an impressive document for sure. It uh, it's just a lot in it. But I, what I need is a speaker. I think uh, uh, the early speaker that talked about the Poganip and the uh, that the the management plan of the Poganip forbid mountain bike trails. And I might have been on the committee that designed that, but I didn't even think there were mountain bikes back then. So I wonder if um, the head of parks could speak to that or help me on that. Yeah, of course. Uh, Noah, do you want to go ahead and explain? I'm happy to jump in here as well. I guess if you if you could repeat the question, is it is it whether or not well, the question? A I I was surprised that there's something in the Pocanet plan which I forgot or didn't know. And if so, I know there's a mountain bike trail now on Poganet, which is extremely controversial. And uh, so I guess I'm asking, is that true? There is in the Poganet plan uh, language forbidding it. And if so, where are we on that? And of course, that will lead into uh, one of the place that silence in the rest of the document is addressing mountain bikes. Yeah, so, so there um was an amendment to the Poganet Master Plan to allow for the Emma McCreary Trail um, to, to be added. It is, you know, a, a real, a, you know, in, in parks and recreation's eyes, it is a very popular trail uh, for both hikers and mountain bikers. In terms of the Parks Master Plan, it's a guidance document. It does not override the Poganet Master Plan. There is an advisory recommendation, and that's on page 4.2-71. And it, it says exploring modifications to the existing master plan. And under that, it talks about conducting a, a trail assessment to evaluate existing trail conditions and use issues and identify ways to improve access, recreational enjoyment and connectivity. And the assessment will help inform the determination of whether or not future trail modifications or improvements are appropriate. And, and so, yeah, the idea behind the master plan is we did receive a, a lot of input uh, from you know uh, different um, interests, and a lot of mountain bikers did participate. And we didn't want to uh, rush forward and and propose a bunch of trails, but we did think it worthy to evaluate it and see if not just for mountain biking, but as well as, as hikers and and horseback riding, if there are additional opportunities. And during that process. We would want to, and it, and it further explains, um, evaluate how we could create clear maintenance standards, identify use conflicts and solutions, and develop a signage and educational program. And then there, there's some other things, but, and then it says evaluate potential environmental impacts and mitigations through the CEQA process. So that is something that at the end of the study, um, you know, we would need to receive uh, direction. There would be a, a public process of whether or not even to initiate uh, an amendment. The amendment, if initiated, uh, would be another public process with uh, additional opportunities. So it's, it's not anything that the Parks and Recreation Department is, um, I mean, it, it's it's unknown, but the, the one thing that, you know, we do think is valid is to, is to kind of conduct the study, hear from uh, different user groups and really spend the time 
in staff time and resources uh, and hear from the decision makers of, of how we should move forward. Just to final, when was the, the amendment to the Pogonet plan? Was that specific to the McCrary Trail or was it done before? That was the MM McCrary Trail. It was, okay. But it's just an amendment for that particular trail, not? Correct. Okay, good. Okay. Just for all those mountain bikers, I'm on the land trust board and we hope this spring to start Oh, as far as may have affected, but I hope this spring to start working on our San Vicente uh, open space in which we'll have 35 miles of mountain bike trail separated by the for the pedestrians. So hopefully we'll get started on building that. And that should have such a wonderful impact for mountain bikers. Uh, 38 miles of wonderful trail. So, uh, if FYI. I <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Uh, if I may just add one other comment on the, the page in the master plan that Noah referenced, mm -hmm. uh, page 4.2-71, the first recommendation that's in there, and this is just to Noah's point, the first recommendation is to continue to implement the Poganip, the existing Poganip master plan. So that's literally the first recommendation uh, in there. And then what Noah talked about was uh, additional exploration that could be done down the road. But uh, again, to Noah's point that the, the master plan doesn't uh, override the, the Pogata uh, master plan, but really it, it bolsters it up uh, in this context to say, uh, implement the existing Pogata master plan as a recommendation number one. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thanks, Tony. Um, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I guess I'm just reflecting um, uh, sort of on the, the, the length of time and the, um, yeah. the importance of, of really having the city complete this long journey to getting to a master plan. As it was mentioned, we haven't had a master plan for our parks programs, uh, park areas and um, for since the 70s. And, um, you know, the one thing that I think is really being shown in California is that, you know, our environment is becoming, you know, one of our largest drivers of our, you know, economy. And, you know, there's there's various park, regional park districts and various park districts around the state that have really, um, really gotten to the level that I think Director Elliott is, is looking to see our um, park, park, park and rec um, department get to, which is really impactful and meaningful um, uses and availability of our parks for um, not only just city residents, but for county residents and actually for many, many people from the Bay Area come over here too. So um, I'm really excited about um, getting the package through tonight. Um, and um, I think um, the programmatic EIR, um, while it does not assess each and every impact for every possible project, or action or policy in the plan, it does provide that framework. Um, and of course, for projects that are done, uh, project specific activities, um, there will be additional CEQA analysis. So I think that, you know, this programmatic EIR is, it is important because it does provide the city the ability to um, when applying for grants and things like that, it provides the ability to say, yes, we have a secret document that is that is adopted. Um, so I think it's an important policy, strategic policy um, decision that we have to make tonight to to really make our, our parks department competitive with other parks departments around, um, around California, frankly. So um, I realize and I recognize the concern from both the public and, uh, and my fellow council members about whether or not we really have the proper CEQA um, approach, but I, I do believe that this is a solid approach and um, I trust that our department um, will do the appropriate CEQA um, specific analysis uh, as projects get, uh, you know, proposed uh, according to the plan. So. Um, I guess I, I just feel like this is a really important decision and it's a critical time for our parks department um, 
there you, you, we've missed a lot of grants um, in, in, in during the time that this has been underway um, and um, we'll, we won't be competitive um, in grants moving ahead in the state of California without these these sets the set of, of uh, outcomes tonight that are part of the staff recommendation so um, I'm just want to thank the staff for all the time that you've put in uh, I was a member of the Parks Commission during part of this um, there was a lot of public outreach. Um, our parks department is just a stellar situation, a stellar uh, uh, piece of what we are as a city. And I, I do think that we have the right um, policy framework with to work with tonight to um, move this ahead. And um, I would be willing to make a motion, but I, I would like to hear from other, other um, folks as well. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll note that. Um, and when time for a motion to come back to you. So is there any other, are there any other council members who'd like to speak on this item? Council Member Brown. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, I, um, I guess I, so speaking to the controversy, I want to recognize that that's there and that, that kind of everybody on our side or from all perspectives um, it's coming from this love of and pride in our park system. It is an incredible, incredible park system we have. And, um, you know, and we struggle to maintain what we've got. And, um, you know, and I've talked with Director um, Elliot about this. Uh, the, I can't remember if he said the, the, it's like a 1980s Porsche or something, and it just, it needs some <laughs> an oil change and some other things. But, um, and so I do think that, um, you know, we have this amazing, amazing system. We ha it's, you know, a jewel, I, really, all of the parks. Um, and so, but, and the controversy is really because people care. It's also because I think there is, a, you know, a, a lack of trust among um, members of our community about the, um, you know, the potential for uh, this, this kind of programmatic uh, uh, document to be used as a way to, you know, override more in in uh, depth environmental review among projects. Um, so, but given, I, I just want to say that, and I say that to, um, you know, with the hope that uh, the that we will as a city really take this seriously and um, include the community in, you know, robust, meaningful ways, um, and, and the parks and rec commission uh, when we get to the point of of looking at any of these specific pieces of the, the master plan. I think it's critical to, to do this now because we do, um, you know, we do want to have access to those uh, funding opportunities. And um, and so I, I am going to support this, but I, I just want to, I want to call out that, you know, this controversy exists, it's not going to go away. And, um, and it's because we care and it's because, um, you know, we sometimes <laughs> Where it's going to go. So um, just with that, I'll um, I'll leave it there and uh, look forward to supporting the motion. Councilmember Matthews, Watkins, and then I have a, a couple comments. I want to um, profoundly thank everyone who had <laughs> had their hands on this thing over the last five plus years. Um, many many park commissioners, many council members, many staff members and a huge number of the public. And I think we all know when we look at this or we think about our parks and the facilities, what an incredible variety in terms of types of parks, types of um, uh, from little tiny pocket parks to great big open spaces, uh, serving such a variety. You know, ours is not a system with just a few ball fields. It's amazing. And that's uh, reflected here. So um, I have really nothing but appreciation. Obviously, there will be specific projects, specific issues that need to be ironed out. But this is a great um, master plan, which is exactly what we needed. I do want to say it, it was a topic of discussion last week. It's a topic of discussion often. Um, it's woven throughout this park and rec master plan that one of the things we need in order for our parks um, uh, particularly to be successful is that they be safe. And uh, obviously it's a real challenge for us um, in both reality and perception. Um, people do love their parks. And I think as, as we go into the um, tight budget years ahead, we're going to have to um, 
acknowledge the need and find ways to respond to that uh, for both environmental um, and, and safety issues so that we do get the full benefit of uh, our full range of parks. So um, parks are loved, parks make life better, <laughs> to coin a phrase. <laughs> um, so um, thank you to everyone who had a hand in this. Councilmember Watkins. I, um, thank you, Mayor, and I just too want to thank our staff and um, sort of taking us back down every lane, having served on the council at the time when there was a lot of very strong opinions on, on both sides of, of many issues as it related to the master plan. And to get to this place now with um, clearly uh, an incredible foundation for our community to move forward, also areas where we will uh, revisit and uh, refine over time. But um, having memories of uh, some of my first council meetings, uh, having this item before us uh, to, to tonight and seeing all the work and community engagement that's happened in between that time frame is, um, is, is noticeable and so appreciative. And I am really thankful that we'll have this document in place um, to seek outside resources to ensure that we're upholding such uh, valued treasures in our community. And um, so when the time comes for a motion, I'm happy to second that. And um, also just want to extend my gratitude to our Parks and Rec Commission for their work and thought into this as well. Uh, Council Member Golder. I also want to extend my appreciation to the um, people who came before us to bring this document forward. Um, I think I echo what another person said in that the um, controversy, controversy comes from everybody loving the parks. And I also realize that without this document in place, then we're ineligible for much needed grant funding. And with this grant funding, um, I am super sad still and sick about uh, last meeting's vote to eliminate the Rangers program and I would love to see, um, I know we voted to have five CSOs remain with the police department, but I would love to see some funding if, um, if possible. You know, I don't wanna I put towards the idea of like, um, Council Matthew safe. And I think that having, um, the Rangers may be back with parks if money came out of the grants that allowed that where they could take more of an interpretive role and um, keep people informed and safe. And I, I'm not quite sure how to articulate it, but I just um, know that we all really care deeply about the parks and the open spaces. And in order for us to enjoy them for generations to come, we have to protect, we have to preserve them, and we have to keep them safe and clean. So. Yeah, I guess I'll just, you know, kind of echo my final thoughts, which is that, you know, I think when you think about Santa Cruz, it's probably one of the most environmentally conscious cities, I would say, uh, I've ever visited in the States, if not, you know, one of the most environmentally conscious cities in the world. And I'm always blown away when um, our Parks and Rec director mentions, and I think it's, you know, we're one of the, we have per capita some of the most parks for a city. I think it's in the entire country or something to that extent, but I'm always blown away by how many parks we have in our city. And just given you know, how difficult it is to even build an ADU, I know that we are a community that really takes our parks seriously um, and that wants to do our best to protect our parks. And you know, I just want to, again, express uh, my gratitude for all the people who, for all the years have helped us maintain our parks and keep our parks and also who've done so much work on this parks master plan. And for it to come down to just a couple things where there are um, concerns, I think that as we move forward, you know, there will be opportunities for more community engagement and for more input. And I think that's gonna be the appropriate time. But you know, given that this could help us get more funding to protect our parks, I think that especially given all the cuts that we're taking right now, uh, I think it's really important that we try to take a document that has been, you know, over half a decade in the making, um, bring it forward, and then we can try to work through some of the minor issues as they come up. And so, again, I just want to express um, 
my gratitude for all the hard work that's gone into this. And um, Vice Mayor Myers, if you are prepared to make a motion, I think that uh, unless there's any further comment or discussion, maybe we can move forward with that um, at this time. Oh, and you're muted, by the way. Uh, Noah, would you, maybe you could put the slide up just with the with the uh, motion. I've got it in the staff report, just maybe so for the public. Um, yeah, and I, want, I, I just want to echo um, the mayor's comments. Um, you know, it's, this is, this is something we should be celebrating. It's, um, we all hold our parks dear. We all, we all um, want, want to see what's best. And um, I think um, our staff has, have really navigated through um, just a really comprehensive planning process. You know, thousands of people have, have been involved in this through the surveys. Um, there's been a, a lot of input at meetings. And um, so, yeah, I, I again, just wanna thank our, our staff um, Noah has been th through this through the beginning and, and Tony's kind of bringing it over the finish line. Um, but uh, again, just a great job and, and, and also to all the um, parks commissioners and to past city council who identified funding to, to take this step and to modernize and, and give our parks, um, parks and recreation department a master plan that um, can really guide the future for how our our community can uh, use our parks into the future. So um, I'll go ahead and uh, make a motion uh, uh, recognizing the staff recommendation that the city council adopt the following resolutions. A resolution certifying the final environmental impact report, a resolution including fact, findings of fact and a mitigation monitoring and reporting program, and a resolution approving the parks master plan 2030. So a motion by council member, or Vice Mayor Myers. I think council member Watkins mentioned wanting to second that motion. I'll second the motion. Okay. So we have a motion made by Vice Mayor Myers, second by council member Watkins to adopt the staff recommendations. Uh, if there's no further discussion, I'll go ahead and turn it over to our city clerk to call the roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Council member Byers. Uh, with a wonderful yes, I'm so proud of our Parks and Rec Department all these years, and yes, my vote is yes. Matthew? Absolutely. Brown? Uh, enthusiastic, yes. Boulder? Aye. <laughs> Watkins? Also an enthusiastic yes. <laughs> Vice Mayor Myers? Uh, aye, yes, absolutely. And Mayor Cummings? Well, that passes unanimously, because I'm definitely in. So <laughs> thank you all for your hard work on this. This is incredible. And um, I want to thank, yeah, so I don't know, Parks and Rec Director, if you want to say anything or. Just thank you. Thank you guys. We'll get on some grant applications tomorrow morning. Bring <laughs> <laughs> home the bacon. <laughs> all right well with that i want to thank members of the community for joining us i want to thank all of our staff for joining us this evening council members and with that um we just continue to enthusiastically encourage everyone to go out and vote um we still Sean have a few weeks to go um but it's one I'll of the most Sean important Jones so. wear a mask <laughs> <laughs> wear a mask yes. <laughs> All right, Seth, thank you all. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks. Goodbye.